Welcome to Tech Support TV. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubu Man. Today's video is all about tickets. We're going to use a Jira ticketing system to learn help desk. I will teach you from the beginning on to how to navigate and use this system. And also we will use this system to work many, many different issues, meaning tickets that come through the system. We're going to work them and there's going to be a lot that I'm going to teach you. Watching this video, you can pretty much say that you're ready to work help desk. This session is going to be six hours long. And after that, it's going to repeat itself for people that might miss some of the things. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat box to the right or leave a comment below. Also, if you can join the channel, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me stay awake. It's only $1.99. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubo Man. In today's video, we will learn how to use a ticketing system. This video is designed for new people to help desk tier one or tier two. What we will learn in this video is how to create a ticket and how to work a ticket in a ticketing system. Here's an example of a ticketing system. This is called Jira. I got a recommendation for this from a fellow YouTuber named Kev Tech, if you want to check him out as well. And uh, keep in mind, there are many, many different ticketing systems out there available. And uh, a lot of them are proprietary, meaning the company that you work for will have their own ticketing system. But lately, or uh, most recently, they've all been web-based, just like this third-party ticketing system that I'm about to show you. And when it comes to navigation, working the tickets and this and that, it should be very, uh, very much the same as you would do when you work for somebody else. So this is going to be very educational for people who are about to start working on a help desk or just tech support where they use a ticketing system. By the way, guys, if you got a second to like this video, I'd really appreciate it. For this, I'm not going to play an ad for you, so I'm gonna bother you with that. But if you can take a moment just to click that like button, I'd really appreciate it, it means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get back to the first thing we need to do. We're going to create a ticket in this ticketing system but we have to familiarize yourself keep in mind you are new at the company and you've never experienced this before chances are you don't know what to do you don't know what to uh, look for well this is typically what it looks like you have a system that's open like this uh, typically web-based and then on the left hand side you got a few different tabs that you can select first one is the main queue what you're looking at here and when i click on all open and what shows in the middle is all tickets that are open currently these are tickets that come through and then next one is assigned to me and if we click on you can see that you haven't been assigned any tickets whatsoever and then if we click on unassigned issues you can also see there however if you keep if you go back to the all open that means they are all there that means that there haven't been worked yet even if it's been assigned so and then of course we have incidents down here and it's going to be based off a type of ticket and then we got service requests changes and problems so these are all different categories for these tickets that are there now not to confuse you or to lose you let's go ahead and create a ticket because this will show you what the ticketing system is about so let's say uh, this reporter here, which is Kobuman1, he is the user that reported all three of these issues. These are all issues that he has. So let's see how he did that. So he went to a system, and he's got a probably similar system uh, that, he, that we see here, and then he clicked on create a ticket or submit a new ticket. And the first thing that they're going to do is select an issue type, which is right here. Don't ignore this part that where it says project this is just because i'm an admin to this so ignore this what they're going to look at first is issue type this is what's going to ask you and they're going to either have a drop down here or they're going to be able to type in the type of issue that they have so they can just type in report an incident and if they select that for example that's what what's going to be selected so whatever it is that they have chances are there's either a an article on how to fix it themselves if it's like some kind of a minor software issue but they in general they will have a way to search for their problem and once they do they will come across their problem they would select it so for example if they would just type in get see help it's going to show up and then they can select that at the same time if they type in like for example name of the website or a program 
it's going to find that as well and then they can select that and that way it's going to be routed to the support team for that specific application website system or software you see that it's very self-explanatory so and the next thing once they figure out what the problem is and select the correct issue type here they can type in the title of it and it's kind of confusing here that where it says summary but it's actually just uh, a title so let's go ahead and pretend that this is a test ticket and we're just going to type in test so that way we have uh, a good so we can track it so we can see how it shows up in the system and then we're going to type in test again because we're just learning how to create a ticket right here and it's going to be very simple if we scroll down there will be other uh, things you can put in there for example a user can attach a screenshot and if they click here they can just add it you know browse it this and that typical they would upload a screenshot of the error if they have and then they can select the component and then if they're savvy enough they'll be able to figure out okay well what is the issue about and they would select that so let's say they you know some kind of actor directory issue they can just select that and then assignment here you can see that it's automatic we can leave that this is some of those one of those admin uh, issues and this is not uh, what uh, a user would see and then you can also uh, create a ticket on behalf of somebody else so I'm going to create a ticket on behalf of Koboman1 which is the same person that reported the previous issues that way um, if uh, if a user is not able to create a ticket for themselves you can do it on their behalf as well another reason to create a ticket is to also keep track of internal things that you do and you need a record of it so you know doing tickets just as an internal part of uh, what you do is a good way to uh, uh, just have a record of uh, some kind of change that you've done on a computer or PC or whatever and then next thing we have is priority um, uh, well actually we do have approvers but this is related to whether somebody needs to be approved for example to have an access to a specific server uh, whether they're approved to have email or instant messenger or even if they're approved to uh, get new software or if they're approved to get new hardware right so and then we have priority here and priority is kind of self-explanatory if a big website is down chances are they're going to select the highest priority or you know it's if, if it's affecting a lot of people they can just select highest priority but if it's nothing big they can just select lowest priority or whatever you know and then of course urgency is uh also kind of similar to that which would I don't know why they have it twice but you know if it's a website down it's going to be of course critical and then it's going to impact a lot of people impact very uh, important if it's a lot of uh, people it's critical and it's the highest priority it's going to be expensive widespread if it's just one user requesting something it's going to be minor so and then pending reason this is um, if you're working on a ticket and then you need a pending reason why it needs to be approved this and that like for example somebody's requesting something um, uh, that they would deal with that product categorization and this and that this is usually automatically populated by uh, the system itself users wouldn't typically deal with any of this they would just put in a basic you know ticket and then you would have to figure this out if it needs to be uh, you know if it needs to be um, uh, dealt with or categorized uh, there is a category here optional categorization we can just select connectivity in case we are working with you know a big system downage and then of course there are labels and you can create your own labels you know okay and then we're going to click create ticket now we can see on the right side that there's a notification that came up that's typical in a ticketing system if you're working the system if you have it open you would get a notification that the ticket came through so if we refresh this if I click on all open it's going to refresh it it may take a second here but it's going to populate with the new ticket we just uh, submitted it depends on how fast the cloud is or the storage uh, where the, uh, the ticketing system is at it may take a moment to come up uh, let me let me hit the refresh button here and uh, there it is there's our test email and at the same time you and your group including the user as well will get an email notification that I think it came through and uh, and that would look some that would look something uh, like this here's our three other tickets that are already in the system the other one just came through as you saw so you can see 
that there is a new ticket that came so you get a uh, desktop notification and then you get email notification all right now we learned how to create a ticket that's very simple now let's go ahead and uh, work a ticket Here's a really good one we can uh, pick. So once you're in the main uh, queue, is what they call here, uh, you can just pick any of the tickets and assign it to yourself if you're allowed to do so. Typically, that's what happens. You can pick up tickets, work them, or sometimes a manager assigns a ticket to you. But this time, we have the permission to assign tickets to ourselves, so we're going ahead and do that. We're going to select this middle one. And then we're going to assign it to ourselves. This is going to be slightly different, uh, you know, depending on the type of software you use. But typically, what you want to look for is something like this, where it says assignee. I want to click on that, and then I'm going to assign it to me. I'm going to click on that. And sometimes there's a save button or this and that. This particular system doesn't, and it's just going to assign it automatically. So let's go ahead and go back to our queue, which is click on all open here. And we can see now that it's assigned to me. And uh, I'm going to go back to it, and then we're going to now work it. So how would you do this? There are a few ways of, of working a ticket. Uh, this is going to depend on a uh, preferred contact method that the user has. If we look at this ticket, uh, it's not very detailed, right? And if we click on here, view request in portal, uh, you know, a lot of times you would open it up and there will be more information here, but it kind of looks the same as the other one. So we're just going to go back here. The thing is, though, a lot of systems would specify what type of preferred contact method they would have. For example, I prefer to be contacted with email or uh, there would be their email address there or something like that. I prefer to be contacted with IM or, or do I prefer to be contacted by the phone. So user would typically specify that and, you know, there would be more stuff uh, detailed information about them. This system, unfortunately, doesn't have that information. The only thing we have is ability to reply to customer directly here. So this is what we're going to do. It says here, the issue is I have two monitors, both have the same picture. So that means that it's a configuration issue and we can help them deal with that. Uh, if, if they are outside of your company, let's say you're doing tech support, you know, for somebody else in a different state, you're not on site, you're not there to help them. You can simply say, if you've never worked with this uh, person before, you can say, hello, my name is Irvin with tech support, tech support at STL. Missouri. So, you know, you want to tell them, hey, my name is Irvin. Uh, I'm with tech support or whatever your name may be. And I am at this location. So that way they know that you are, uh, you know, that person. It's, it's an introduction. It's a simple introduction. And then you can say, I have your ticket about a monitor. Right? And it's simple. You tell them who you are, where you at, and that you have their ticket about a monitor. This is what you typically do if you're contacting them first time through email or through, like, for example, instant messenger, or even if you call them. This is something you, you have to let them know who you are and why you're calling them, or why you're contacting them. Since this is a message through the system, through the ticketing system, you don't necessarily have to introduce yourself because they know that the system that they submitted a ticket through, uh, somebody is reaching out to them because of that, right? And then, you know, if you can help, I mean, this is a remote type of thing. If you can take control of their uh, PC and resolve this issue for them, that would be ideal. But if you don't, well, I mean, what can you do? Um, well, you can just at least suggest, uh, have you tried, you know, what is it, expanding? your desktop onto second monitor. That's usually the problem when it comes to this, right? And this is one of those things that you can ask the customer. If you can take control of their computer, that would be ideal. However, if you happen to be on site, if you happen to be on site, that would be even better. So um, you can say, may I stop by to take take a look when would be good for you 
So that way you can do go there directly and just resolve the issue. And then now we're gonna just click save. This should send an email to the customer and uh, you know that should reach out to the customer in some way, whether it's they having to have the system up and they get a notification or they would get an email uh, from the system saying, hey, uh, this tech guy, Kobo Man, is trying to reach out to you. This guy named Irvin, actually, is trying to reach out to you or both. So usually it would be both. So they would get a communication from you. So the next thing you would do is add an internal note. means uh, that's a, a note for you and the people that work for you or the, not the work for you or with you if they want to know what's going on with that ticket. They can look up your ticket and see that you have reached out to user and awaiting feedback right so you can be more detailed about this this is just the basic navigation and notage of a ticket so what we have done here is reached out to the customer. We have created an internal note so that everybody can see that what you've worked on and what kind of work you've done when it comes to this ticket. So let's say your manager is like, hey, uh, what's going on with this ticket? They can look it up and see what you've done. You know, And um, if it's, if it's uh, something you can resolve on site, you can say uh, configured dual monitor. And then click save and now since you've resolved the issue we have configured the dual monitor at this point it's resolved now we can close the ticket right we can go ahead and close it and in this case we have to go over here on the right hand side where it says waiting for support if we click on that it gives you a bunch of different options for the status of the ticket you know you can see that whether you escalated a ticket uh, you know, waiting for support, canceled or completed. We're going to set it to completed. Sometimes it would say resolved or this and that. And now the ticket is completed and closed. And by the way, notice this little eyeball here. That's a watch option. That means how many people are actually viewing and watching this ticket. We can see that both of these guys are watching this ticket. So that means how many people are viewing it and working on it, which is kind of useful actually. So that way you can be like, hey, you know, ping them or, you know, send them a message. Hey, are you working on this too? You know, this and that. And uh, all right, let's move on to uh, another ticket that we can look at. And then if we click on all open tickets here, it's going to bring us back to the, the queue. We can see now that the other ticket is gone. It's, it's simply gone. It's closed and you'll no longer see it in the queue. Uh, but we do have other tickets we can work on. So let's do one more, which is a bit different. And this is a website down um, ticket. So this is kind of important. Our website is down. We can't access our main website. And then we can see that the urgency is critical. So of course, we're going to have to prioritize these critical tickets. Now, let me see, does this system actually say in the queue anywhere that it's a critical? It doesn't. So the only indicator you have here is on the left hand side. It's kind of these icons. And, you know, this is kind of unfortunate uh, that I couldn't show you that, that you know, um, there, there might be some other indicator that it's a critical issue. All you got to do is, all, the only thing you can do is go by whatever the summary is or whatever the title of the ticket is. So you kind of have to use your own judgment. In our case, I wouldn't have worked the first ticket first at all. I would have worked this one first. So you got to prioritize that. It's very important. But once we click on it now, we can see that it's critical. So, of course, we're going to um, contact them again. But before we do that, since this is a critical, we may want to um, do something else real quick. And this is going to depend on, on your business, whether you're the only one working there or whether you actually want other people involved. So there are options for that as well. And if you look on the right-hand side here, we can add participants. If we click here and add participants, if your manager, for example, is Joe, uh, Joe Joe Schmo <laughs> Schmo did I spell that Joe Schmo let's do that Joe Schmo we're going to add him and then he can watch or even if we have Bob it's a boy uh, you know as a co-worker and he's working with you as well we can add them as participants so they can follow what's going on right so that's pretty cool here as well and then we can have 
Um, let's go ahead and work this ticket real quick. I'm going to reply. And again, there are no other way to contact them. So I have to contact them through the system. Otherwise, I would have called them, uh, messaged them, and this and that. And then what I would do here in this case, and this is just an example so we can work the ticket, but there are many things that you might want to ask when it's a big issue like this. Uh, the first thing usually I would say is uh, how many, I would say people are impacted. You don't want to say users. Usually that's something that IT would use within itself. You would want to say how many people are impacted. And then uh, when was the last time it worked? Are you using the correct link? You know, stuff like that that would help you resolve this a big of an issue, right? And then later on, uh, you know, if you do realize that it really is a big issue like this uh, support team um, for this specific website that they may be uh, talking about uh, may need more information. For example, host names, IP addresses, this and that. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, typically, you would want more, but you would have to know what the website is and this and that. And this is just going to be depending on the work environment that you're at. Here we are learning how to use the system, not necessarily resolve issues uh, because we don't have enough information, right? So we're here learning how to use a ticketing system and that's that. And then of course you add internal note right away and says contacted user with uh, requesting, I'm sorry, requesting more information. Now, this is an internal note, and this means that only you and the people that work the system can only see it. So you can say user this time because we are talking to IT people who might read this. This is for your own note, work note, uh, internal note, and for the people that are IT, user cannot see this at all. So it's okay to say user. Okay, now that we're waiting on that, of course, is a priority. This is something you would actively work on, but we're just going to leave it like it is for now. Now, let's see. Uh, the, the, there are different issues. There are different options here for the, this ticket right now, and that's because the issue is literally selected as a problem. Now we have different things, and this is going to you know depend on the type of work environment that you're working at, and then. Uh, you can see that now we have an option just just to close it, but that's only if it's resolved and then there's cancel and then there's under review. I'm not sure why it would be under review. That's kind of a weird option to have in a ticketing system, but I guess it could be related to some kind of an access request uh, for something. But the fact that it's just reported as a problem is kind of confusing. Anyways, now we know how to create tickets how to work tickets and how to assign them, which by the way, we haven't done here. So we haven't assigned it to ourselves. Maybe that's why the option there was a bit different. Well, maybe not. Anyways, again, there are many, many different uh, ticketing systems, many third party systems, and you just have to kind of adjust to them accordingly. So let's go back and see what else is open. We can see that this one here is assigned to me that I'm uh, working on it. Let's see on the next tab assigned to me, it says zero now, but now it shows up as one because it took a little bit to refresh. And then we got other tabs that you can get into, but these are the basics. These are the basics of working and working a ticketing system that you must know before going to work for a help desk of any sort. And of course, you can look at your own statistics here and that option is not here, but I think if I click here, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys, cues. Back to projects. Usually managers can only see reports, but then maybe we can view some reports here. Reports, workload. And yeah, so if you're a manager or, or sometimes even as just a tier one help desk, you may be able to see your own uh, progress. And here it is. You can see that I have one issue uh, that I've resolved. Any more detailed? So yeah, that, that just allows you to you know look up other people's tickets. Uh, satisfactions. These are all statistics that managers only look at. Of course, you want to SLA is also you know those metrics of how fast you resolve issues, this and that. But what I taught you so far are the basics you need to 
work the system as an IT help desk tier one. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is about help desk tickets, most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what help desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to help desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. First topic is going to be about PDF file not working. It's an interesting one. Pay attention on how I deal with this and also how I deal with the customer when it comes to communicating this issue with them. Very important. First ticket we have here, it's called PDF files don't open course make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it the title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open and in the description it says for some reason PDF files do not work so what do you guys think the issue is here I'm gonna allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer but I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time, but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this. While you guys do that, I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello, my name is Irvin with, why I can't spell today, with help desk support I have your ticket about PDF files not working can you please send me your computer name or IP address so when I reply to this customer and I click save here it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about and the reason for that is because in this situation we're gonna to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it but it's preferable if possible for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it if you have to that's fine of course, this is going to depend on the company that you work for. You know, it depends on the, what the requirements are. But chances are, if you're help desk, you're going to take control of their computer, take a look at the problem, and resolve it as quickly as possible. So for that to happen, for us to use remote desktop, we're going to need their computer name or IP address. Both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely. So in this case, PDF files do not work. So number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed so so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files a lot of times that's the main thing or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files but chances are this is what's happening second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing you may have Adobe installed on the computer but if if it's still not, or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens, that means we need to change the uh, file association. We're going to change that right now. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers, follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted. In this case, all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email however they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via um, via you know via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message uh, some you know most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply whatever their preferences are 
make sure you fo make sure you follow that to the T. Very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with. In this case, we send them an email, and once we get a reply, and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer, uh, let's say we do get a reply, and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them. Maybe the customer said that the PC name is C O B U M A N one. So what I'm going to do in that case, I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file. So I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman one. So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman 1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a File Association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down, and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension so if we scroll down it should be here here we go O and then we're coming uh, we're approaching P so should be here shortly PDF there it is PDF we can now see that PDF in this case is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge we simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go. Problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too. You just ask them what they want. All right. All right. That ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note. Changed file association. Sorry, guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly. But good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right-click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or, you know, somebody has to refer to it, to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So, yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has a lots of written material you can check out. And especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job so interview questions and answers i have a lot of that stuff all right thanks again please share a like and leave a comment thank you so much hey what's up guys my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. let's keep it moving if you watched my previous videos you know that i've been on a roll with these help desk uh, tutorials we're going to keep it moving with third-party software
you have to be allowed to install third-party software meaning the biggest issue here is obviously having a license you got to have a license to install third-party software the second thing is whether it's allowed by the policy in relation to the company on how they deal with security when it comes to type of software because some software maybe you have risk to the company and we don't want to install that and you don't want to lose your job so it's incredibly important that you uh, are very careful especially as help desk but what you take from this video is that you got to be careful when it comes to somebody requesting software there is a procedure for that and that, that procedure has to be followed as simple as that so let's have a look at how that goes i need to have oracle db oracle database installed on my computer i'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it we're going to keep it going guys we're just going to keep it going all right it says i need to have oracle db installed on my computer and same thing repeated in the description and it's this guy named mike moser all right mike so you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software and this guy is in this case oracle database is a third-party software no matter how you look at it we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them so what we're actually going to do and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone this is how i prefer it you can do it any way you like you can send an email a reply to them you can send them an instant message and see uh, see if you can get more information but what would you guys do how would you guys handle this you got to be very very careful because we can't we can't just install oracle database on their computer without permission so here's here are a couple of different things that could be happening here mike here Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello you guessed it my name is Irvin you're going to be doing this a lot except you're going to be using your own name of course <laughs> with PC support I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's just do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before I install this software I have to check to see if it's on approved software list so if you send a message to him like this it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say hey i already have it i already have it i just need it installed meaning that i already have it approved of course you have to check that real quick and then sometimes you may have to install it manually but also he mike might actually already have it installed might might, might even have it installed already on his computer in which case he may need help with configuration which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier one would be able to do but if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk you should be able to configure software in this case oracle database 
uh, you may need like things like a database driver installed or something like that and I'll show you that as soon as I uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I you know kind of talk about this part of it but when it comes to help desk tier one you have to make sure number one that it's approved and number two that you install it for them in whatever that might be you may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers and you may help them you may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name and remember we use Kobelman 1 as a computer name a lot that it has that computer Kobelman 1 subscribe to Oracle DB so what in, in, in that case it should automatically install itself but it also what he might mean is actually configuration so I have to check that but if when it comes to just simple installation you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one now let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database I'm just gonna it's, it's a little bit slightly off topic but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself and it's done here under one of these so let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver it would be somewhere in here and what happens is is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here you know for example in here you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there and then you configure it whatever the system that you want so you would just click add and then you would select which one you want to use and then you go in through the configuration set up the ports IP addresses uh, server names or whatever it needs to be so if you're not comfortable with that that's fine you don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it it just depends on the level and the requirements for the company again this is possibly help desk tier 2 definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this okay I'm gonna go back to that system all right but in this case we're gonna assume that he just wanted it installed so we went ahead and installed it I'm gonna add internal note install well let's do this let's do this subscribed PC to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then I'm going to do this installed software as requested okay and now we're going to close the ticket as complete all right easy peasy and there you have it guys just make sure you follow these basic rules when it comes to dealing with this and it's not going to be a problem for you in the future thank you guys so much for watching please don't forget to like share and leave comments i'm sorry if i missed any of your comments during the premiere and uh yeah i'm not trying to ignore anybody at any point but if i if just in case if i do i apologize you can always leave a comment below and i'll gladly answer any of your questions or if you just want to say hi hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobelman today we have a combination of videos so that way you don't have to go through and look for these topics this way you can just sit down and watch the whole thing at once because it's very useful especially for help desk the first part of the video is about practical help desk troubleshooting uh, it's very good one uh, because in this example you're not allowed to use RDP whatsoever the second part it talks about Windows updates and how they are important to understand if you're in help desk or even desktop support and the last part of it, if you're new to help desk or want to get into IT, this last video shows you how to create a resume. This resume is based off my own resume and based off its own success. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment to like. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, let's get into it. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Daimware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. 
So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name? So that way we can try to help you out. But of course, be more professional. Like you would call him and say, hey, this is, for example, for example, this is Irvin. I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working. I can help you, but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is? So we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it. However, first thing first thing first, we got to assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me what your PC name is? So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here's just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Cobbleman1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Cobbleman1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. The way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace or backslash backslash type in Cobbleman one and then another backslash. And then we're going to access his C share drive, which is should be enabled by default for your business. It may not be, but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment. It should let you in. You may get a pop-up asking you to log in, and that's fine too. Just use your credentials, and if you have access, that's great. So once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. We can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Cobbleman1, and we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program, and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him, which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have a remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile. Because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him what is your local profile name? 
and then he's going to tell you what his local profile name which is going to be the same thing as his login so we're going to pretend that the, his login is buco we're going to go inside of that and typically typically configuration data for any type of program that's run there on that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder so we're going to click on app data and then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming so let's have let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay and uh, because once he launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times uh, you know I, I pick this randomly but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that but since it's at the local profile level it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, as, as in program that it needs to function it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile and the same thing happens with anything else for example this google here you know if you go inside a google here folder uh, and if you go you can see that it's a chrome and if you go inside of that you can see there's user data again this is what i talked about and if you for example go to default you can see that there is a cache data inside of it and of course you can find things like uh, i don't know their uh, favorites and stuff like that which is by the way missing on this one uh, but that's okay so let's stay on track here since we messed with adobe i'm going to tell them go ahead and Ado uh, try to open adobe again so let's go back to the user's computer all right so we're back at the user's computer we don't need this window anymore actually i'm just going to yeah let's close it we're going to close it and then we're going to you know I'm, I'm, so in this at this point i'm telling them okay go ahead and open adobe so he's going to type in adobe and then we're going to click adobe reader we can see that adobe reader works fine and let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view we are now back at you know our point of view as a technician and we can see that the new folder was created for adobe and like i stated so that created new and you can see that here that the date is 6 10 2020 at 1 p.m and if you look at the time here it's 101 p.m so that means it created just like i said it would and what that does it basically resets that program and a lot of times it actually resolves the issue all right now just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings that's a not, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop as long as you have the proper credentials to do so so on your computer on your own computer that you're using your work computer you're going to open up a registry editor and you have to run it as administrator so remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman one here and let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function some kind of key to make it work we can do that remotely as well so we're going to take Kobelman one which is the name of his computer and we're going to connect to it over the network registry so we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network we're going to click network we're going to put in Kobelman one we're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network and it usually takes a little bit it depends you know on, on the setup but you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group but a lot of times it would just be a domain name it says new server zero that's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home but it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain it will be the main name first followed by the computer name so that means it found it when it's underlined like that it means it found it we can click okay and we are now directly connected into his registry so let's go ahead and kind of navigate see if we can find that adobe we're going to expand h key local machine you know it's a local machine on his computer we we are now connected to it we're going to expand h key local machine and guess next thing we're going to do 
we're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software. But you can see right away that Adobe shows up here. So if you expand that, you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects. So that's not what we're actually worked on. We actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC. So if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for adobe here and expand that and we can now see that there is adobe reader there right there and then if we expand that there's dc and inside of that we can you know whatever we need to make changes to we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did, in which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it, and then we're going to mark it resolved, completed, and that's that. That ticket, oops. That ticket should be now gone out of our system. And we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called, I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know, it was with deleted or it's just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it and then, but you can find a copy of, you can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play. And then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves. And then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you Thanks you. <laughs> Thanks, Irvin. Okay. So now user has been asked or you can call them. You can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user. And, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Cobbleman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC. Let's do this. Users. PC name is Cobbleman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that uh, actually let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say 
hey, can you please check to see if the internet shortcut is back? And sure enough, there it is. But what if, for some reason, just using a PC name doesn't work? Some, there might be an issue with DNS. So just typing in Kobolman1 and, you know, going inside of that, you know, shared drive or shared network connection, I should say, what if that doesn't work? Then we're going to have to get an IP address and see how that goes. So you can ask them too, hey, what is your IP address? And if they're like, uh, I don't know, uh, you can just ask them, okay, well, can you go command line this and that? But that's too complicated. So let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the IP address without any confusion. But but let's see what else we can do, you know. Before we do that, let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user. Because we don't we don't want to do that. We just want to find that out on our own. All right, let's go back to our own computer. All right, so let's say this this wasn't successful, and this didn't work, and for some reason we can't access it using you know Kobolman one, like so. Let's say that doesn't work. Let's say we're not able, we get an error, or it just doesn't, you know, it just says not found. Then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works. So, of course, the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping. We're going to do a quick pingage. We're going to type in ping Kobolman1. And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, what I call backdooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdooring into a computer. You can just type in and usually instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version four of this IP version six uh, IP address. So this is IP version six that we're looking at here, but we want to know what the standard is, what the standard IP version four is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then the first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And it didn't work, but luckily we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here, and that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192, and you can see that I accessed it before. So 192.168.1.102, and then C dollar sign enter and there it is same thing uh, that we can do with uh, what you call it same thing we can do with the registry we can connect to using the IP address but let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick we're going to go and copy the internet shortcuts folder back into their desktop and now that we are back at users computer now we can see that internet shortcut has appeared now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing reg edit and then we're going to use that connect network registry let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way 192.168.1.102 okay and again it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on and now it's actually asking me for login id so i'm going to use typically you can use your domain login but since i'm not on a domain i'm just going to use a local admin uh, a local admin id and password and there it is 
we're back at the same thing except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home. So they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish our my ticket here, you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right guys if you got one second please click the like button it really means a lot to me that way i know you guys like my stuff and i'll keep making more videos because of that thank you so much and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Windows updates. What do we need to know about Windows updates? Let's have a look on Windows updates, how they look like on your computer. I'm sure you already know this, but this is how you get to them. If you click on the start button and then click settings, and then if you click update and security, and that's just one way of getting to Windows updates. So this is what you see nowadays. This is, has changed a lot from Windows 7, and it kind of looks like this now, where it gives you a little bit more options. Right now, I have paused Windows updates, and for the right reasons, because I wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating, in case you're not aware. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen this happen on your computer, but a lot of times it just happens in the background, and it just kind of does its thing. So here's an example of security intelligence update here for Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So what that was actually was an update for your built-in Windows antivirus software. And we, could, we saw the, what they called a KB, which is a knowledge base article about that. Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general. So it's kind of vague. Right now, all it tells us it's update from Windows 10 version 1909. And down here, you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart. So there's a pop-up here that says restart. And of course, we have a you know big old restart button here. So let's kind of dig into this. Version 1909. Why does it say version 1909? Well, let's see what our Windows version is. So if you go to search button and just type in W-I-N-V-R, V-E-R, I'm sorry. So if you hit enter, it gives you the Windows version. So here it is. It's our version 1909, Microsoft version 1909. And again, it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific OS build. So it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what, let's just open Edge, see if it works. I've actually seen Edge work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just crashes out of the blue, but that's okay. We're going to just open it up and we're going to go to Googleage and search for our knowledge article is what I call them. Um, don't know exactly what they would call it. Hey, there is no connectivity, which is really, really surprising because I know I do have connectivity. Huh, cannot connect securely to this page. Oh, there it is. That was really bizarre, guys. I'm not sure. It could be my internet that is causing this issue. Although I did get a new modem just literally last week. Maybe it's my router. Maybe I need to change some 
uh, router setting. So here, here's our uh, KB here, and it's 4497165. Let's see if it refers to that. 4497165. We have double checked that, and here is a knowledge article from Microsoft. Here it is. It's a Intel microcode updates, and now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom so you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it and it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903 all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903 all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909 and then all editions and then there is more so basically it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909. Okay, and in the summary it says, it, you know, basically it's a description of it, and it's an upgrade. It's an update to Intel Microcode for the following products of, of CPUs. Basically, is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel. CPUs and that's what the updates is for. So it's we got Demerton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U, and then there's these other ones. We got Haswell's, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing, the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. And basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have, like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay. You know, these are all just you know just a microcode update for you know CPUs and they obviously they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update but this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well so that's a, a one important thing this example just happened to be this microcode update and it's a good example because you don't want to like you know you don't want to break all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to Apps and Features. So I'm going to right-click our little Start button here. We're going to click Apps and Features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, add remove software or program that you have probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed and I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font, it's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We were looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above Turn On Windows Features On and Off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out.
Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column and there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have the actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed. And it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2565063. Is that what it was? That's right. 2565063. 2565063 and here it is the first update for Microsoft Windows and it's very vague we don't know what this is so this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is so it's KB4556799 all right let's see 455 see my short term memory it's really early in the morning so I can't Exactly, sometimes 6799, 6799. I had my coffee, but my short memory is not that great. So let's see here. Again, March March 12th, that's when it was created. And if it's 4556799, we're going to click on that. I'm going to move it up here and see what that is. All right, so here is here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again. And uh, you can certainly read that as well. And you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry. It was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password so these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system and you can see how it goes on improve security when using Microsoft Xbox Windows uh, improve security and Windows perform basic operations so these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer and that's what this update is about it's very vague it's not a like critical update or anything like that it's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system so here's a security update that i wanted to show you and it's kb4552152152 let me see if i can remember that 21552 nope i need more coffee guys 45521 2152. Okay, there it is. All right, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, 4552152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the promise to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. 
All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is, of this whole video, is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. <laughs> There's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that. And when it comes down to it, it's up to, it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information. And it, again, this is kind of disappointing, but it is very, very vague, very vague. Um, when you do desktop support, you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that which is a great thing otherwise I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this now when it comes to these type of updates Microsoft is 100% in control and, and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they're safe and you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them and that can take sometimes up to a month or even more depending what the update is but you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff and yes I know most of these things you can just literally you know just install and test it if it's a minor update or it's just update you know this and that you still don't want to like install it and say hey it works fine on this computer now you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week I want to say with some computers being used actively used to see if everything is okay just to make sure that that is cool hey guys here we go again my name is Irvin also known as Kobuman we're continuing where we left off our previous video was about Outlook issue today it's going to be about a printer I'm going to work the printer take it I'm going to show you how to install a printer for a user and how you can also communicate that with the user in a proper way so it's not confusing because there are multiple things you actually have to get from the user in order to do this properly it's a really good video for a help desk that being said it's based or it comes from my large video that I made that's about two hour long training specifically for help desk if you want to check that out it's right there and that being said please take one second to like the video I know I say this every video but thank you so much guys you're awesome. All right, let's get into it. By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says, I need help installing a printer. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight through almost almost done here I'm trying to install a printer but it's not working we're going to reply to the customer I say hello my name is Irvin with help desk what kind of printer are you trying to add local printer or network printer now this can be confusing to to the user to the customer because what I'm actually trying to figure out it's actually are they at home are they working from home are they trying to add, add a local printer or are they trying to add a network printer which is actually in an, in an office but to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know, you know, but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say also, can you please send me your PC name with, and you know what? let's 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 hold off on this part of it because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial so if they first reply and say and usually I, I like to be more proactive but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault is this is just how human mind works 
they can't multitask. If I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are, but chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a there there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues so we got to be careful about this we got to find this out um, if possible i would call them and talk to them uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you... Please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add. Let's do this. I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them. And we're going to do this. So let's kind of go over it again. Okay, I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control control remotely. And can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? So off your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name. And I didn't want to say, can you send me your PC name or IP address? Because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer. And I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part. I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer. IP address of the printer trying to add. You see what I'm saying? Keep it as simple as possible, but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner. Once we get this information, we're going to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again. Uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson. And the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed, we're going to go to the search bar. And you can, you can get to this through the control panel as well. But I'm going to say devices and printers. Here we go printers and scanners, devices and printers. We want to get to here, guys. This is this is where you can see devices. And I'll show you a different version of it, which is, was the typical one. But this is the what I call Mickey Mouse version of Windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already. And they would all be here. All right? And then if it's not here, which we don't see one, we can simply click Add a New One. So now it's looking for, what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network. And if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer I uh, here I'm looking for, the, the printer that I want isn't listed. 
other way of going to this here is control panel devices and printers here and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before this is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here it's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers so every device you know whether it's a USB or or whatnot or monitor or you know the headset that we talked about earlier and of course if there are any printers they will be listed here but of course there is a button guess where we need to go we're going to click on the add printer and this is the same thing we looked at earlier but this is just how it looks like that's how it used to look like before before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff you know and uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing which doesn't make sense to me why not just keep it the way it is where it's just one place for one thing you know anyways that's a different video okay so it's not gonna find anything what I'm gonna do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed so same thing we did earlier and then here you can add the printer multiple ways where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer blah 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 select anything that you want but in this case we're going to select an network printer which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer and here we're just going to type it in for example 168.2.1 whatever it's whatever the static IP address is for that printer it's gonna have to be a static IP address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we gotta have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're gonna leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use what that does it pings the printer and says hey I'm trying to add you but do you have a driver and then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer it's gonna have that driver it's gonna automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it you know same thing when you're adding a local printer you may have to download the driver install the driver but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer you know once you click next it may if it doesn't find if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to uh, nothing's going to happen here so i can't really show you this at this time but what happens it's it's going to say okay i found this ip address i know it's a printer there but which one is it and then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model like for example Xerox blah 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is that, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect so if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically you're gonna have to ask the user can you tell me the name and model of that printer so that way you can get those drivers and install them properly once you do that it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default kind of like this so if you see one like that just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants he or she wants and then make sure it's set as default see it have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle okay and now we're going to add a external or internal note I should say added printer as requested ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining me in today's session today's session is going to be help desk tier 1 tier 2 and desktop support based I have received feedback from the community when I asked for ideas for the next help desk video simply because I am running out of ideas so if you guys want me to talk about specific things please let me know in discord there is a link in the description of this video so again if you want me to talk about something specific uh, please let me know in discord and the reason I'm doing it like this is because I simply ran out of things to talk about I really appreciate people that did respond to me in my last inquiry asking for assistance when it comes to topic ideas please keep them help desk tier 1 tier 2 or desktop support related however if you do have ideas about more advanced stuff also let me know as I can make separate videos for those thank you so much
So first ticket is based off my feedback that I got from Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an idea for this ticket. So let's have a look. And the first ticket here says, I can't log in to my computer and the error is domain not available. So the reporter name is Mike Moser and Mike here says, please help me. I only get an error domain not available when attempting to log in. So I'll log into his computer, right? I am able to log in using my phone app to contact help desk, so I don't think it's my password. So here's what's going on. Uh, this user, whenever they try to log into their computer, they simply just get this message. It says domain not available. And there are a couple of different reasons for this to happen. And the first one is the computer simply needs to be joined the, the, the domain that it belongs to. So that way it doesn't get this error. And the second uh, reason for it is that computer is simply not connected to the network of any sort, you know, physically. Um, if it's a computer that is like work from home type of computer where it simply needs a network or internet connection, chances are this would not happen, although it may. I've seen that happen as well. But generally speaking, when it's work from home, uh, this would not necessarily happen. Uh, but the, the reason you would, the second reason you would get this is when you're not physically connected to the network that the computer belongs to uh, when it comes to the domain itself. Okay, now I digress. Let me tell you what domain is. There are a couple of different domains, right? There is a first domain that you can think of, right? Here's, for example, cosmicnova.com. That's one example of a domain. Cosmicnova.com is literally name of the domain. It's also known as the website, right? So that's that. However, it's different from a business environment. Business environment has its own domain, which all the computers on that network are joined to specifically. And that is found under computer properties. So this is just one way of getting to it. It doesn't matter which way you get to it as long as you get to it. But if you right click this PC, for example, or just go to system settings, you can just type in system settings or something like that. And it will get to this point. And the the part where you want to look at is here where it says computer name, domain, and work group settings. This computer is on a local home network and it's joined this work group here where it says new server zero. When in a business environment, it would literally say domain here instead of work group and it would give you the name of the domain, which looks like this here. This computer here, so this computer here, if we look at the same settings, you can see that it literally says here domain instead of work group, and it gives you the name of the domain. You, have, you see how it says here tech support dot coboman dot com. It's kind of similar to what we saw as a website, for, for example, cosmicnova.com that I showed you, but it's different. This is just for the business. That's the name of the business. And that's what is going on with this ticket. Again, let me show you here comparison real quick. This is what my local computer looks like. You see it says work group instead of domain. But then this one here, here it says domain. So if the issue here is, I'm just gonna minimize this here. If the issue here is that this user's computer needs to be added to the domain, this is how you would do it. You would go back to the system and you would go to advanced system settings. And then under computer name here, the very first tab, you will get an option to change computer name. And then if you look down here where it says to rename this computer or change its domain or work group, click change. And then you would select literally change, select domain, and then type in, what was it? Tech support.coboman.com. Is that what we had here? I know we did. I just want to show you that it is in that tech support dot .com. Minimize this real quick. And then we're going to click OK. And after that, you have to reboot the computer. See, it's not going to do it now because this is a local computer and the other one is just a virtual machine. But you would get a notification that says, do you want to join this computer to this domain? If you do, something like that. It's been a while since I actually manually had to do this. It's super rare. But I digress. It would say, it, you would have to reboot afterwards and then it would be added and it would here would say it would say domain instead of work group and it would be tech support.coboman.com
Now there is a there are other reasons why this might happen. It could be just an error in the in the system itself, the operating system. But another reason also could be is that this computer is not physically connected to the network where the domain is located. So if it's like a business environment, let's say it's a large building and the computer gets this error, um, you know, it's either what I said before is that either it's not added to the domain or it doesn't exist on the domain or it's not physically connected. So you might want to check the cable. Just adding a quick note while editing this video. This can also happen whenever user receives a new computer and they don't log into it before taking it home, meaning that you have to be connected to the domain for your first login so we can create a domain-based login or local profile for that user. This is why this error happens. Otherwise at home, they can just use their password and log in locally, even though it's not connected to the network or domain of any sort. Uh, th these are the only things I can think of right now when it comes to this error, and that is how I would deal with this specific issue. So if this user is at an office, I would physically go there and um, you know make sure that the computer is you know plugged in if 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 it's, if it's a guy that's literally within the same building i know some people do tech support or you know desktop support or whatever in a building where there's like i don't know 100 users 200 500 doesn't matter they can physically go to their computer and check all these settings make sure they are added i can't think of any other way to do this instead of having physical access because you can't log in. So you can't really take uh, control remotely if this is somebody who's working from home, for example. And this really shouldn't be happening when somebody's working from home. And the reason I'm uh, mentioning working from home is because obviously a lot of people are going to working from home, especially in the current situation. But I've seen it happen a couple of times and for each one of those times, user had to bring the computer back uh, to the office or you know location where you can actually make these changes the reason being is so you can physically connect it to the network so that way you can re-add it in there um, using a local admin so by the way in order to make those changes wherever that i showed you in there when you go to advanced settings to add the computer uh, in this case you might have to do it using local administrator privileges and uh, it, depending on the business setup, business environment, you may be able to, because here's what happened. In order to, for you to do it remotely, to add the computer back to the domain, which still may not work properly because they're working from home, but let's say you are somehow doing it, you would have to get local admin uh, login so that you can actually log into the computer to begin with and then make the changes here, right? You'd go in and make the changes. Otherwise, you have no other way of doing it and you would have to literally have the user type in all the information and you would literally have to guide them to do it. And, you know, whether your company allows this type of thing, realistically, it's best to just have them bring it to the tech guy at their office and just have him deal with it. But hey, Every company has different rules. Maybe you are allowed to do this. Maybe you are allowed to share this information. Uh, local admin uh, password uh, with, with, the, <laughs> with the user. I don't know. Uh, but this is how you would go about resolving this. Okay. So I'm just going to reply to him and say, uh, well, first of all, I would talk to him. I would talk to him on the phone and uh, make sure that this indeed is the error and that he can't log in any other way. And uh, I'm just going to say in this case, just to be safe, okay, uh, can you please bring back the computer to the office so we can fix it? And you can provide details typically on a ticket when you're adding um, internal notes or any notes you want to be specific. Uh, in this case, I don't necessarily want to be specific if I'm just talking to them. But since I'm talking to them on the phone, I highly suggest that you do talk to them on the phone. Uh, if you can't, you know, if it's again, if it's not at the local office, make sure that 
uh, they're already aware why you want men, why you want them to bring it back. At, at least give them that. Doesn't matter whether I understand it or not. Uh, this just tell them this is what you have to do, and this is how we can fix it. You know, and then I'm just gonna say computer needs to be added to domain. And again, this is all with the assumption that I'm talking to the customer. I already talked to them and ensured them uh, that this is going to get fixed and how I'm going to go about it. So I'm just putting down basic information and instead of just, you know, this is just a formality at this point. Okay. So we're going to wait for the customer to um, come back. By the way, I forgot to assign this ticket to myself. I've really got into it. It's been a while since I uh, made some of these help desk ticket based videos. So yeah, make sure you assign the, you know, ticket to yourself and uh, we're going to get back to it and possibly route it to the local IT tech support people, depending on how your computer or, or how your tech support is set up. You may have to route this ticket to them, but in this case, he's just going to bring it to me and I'm going to just resolve it. All right. Next ticket, it's thanks to uh, feedback from this gentleman on Discord. Uh, let me show you here. Well, first of all, let's uh, let's read the ticket. It's the ticket that I created based off of uh, his feedback and idea. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is I forgot to change my password and now I can't log in. And it's kind of specific here in description. It says, "Hi, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expired. I can't log in to change." So it's kind of specific to the way why he can't log in. It says, I forgot to change my password last Friday and over the weekend my password expired and I can't log in to change it. Usually, usually customers or users would get notifications on when the password is about to expire. And I've also seen where, you know, user either forgets or just kind of ignores it because sometimes you just get one notification. I've seen that too. It's only one notification like 14 days before it expires or something like that. Uh, and uh, and that will be pretty much it and then they forget about it. But the reason I made this specific ticket is in a scenario that this gentleman on Discord described to me. Again, I appreciate your help. And here it is what he says, Mr. RTM, thank you. And it says, if I catch a help desk call and user wanting to reset their password, uh, I'm sorry, if I catch a help desk call and a user wanting to reset their password uh, to easily guess passwords such as password or password one, two, three, I advise them that their desired password is not very secure to coach them and how to make the password more without driving them crazy or resort to writing it down somewhere. So he's giving an example of how he's handling um, password resets whenever he uh, works basically a help desk uh, call. Or I'm assuming, at, from what I gathered, he works at a location where he probably takes turn, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, he probably takes turn on basically on answering a help desk call that probably comes through their central line for the tech support guys at, at uh, locally probably there. And then he says, offsite users do not get system notifications of when their password will expire. You see, this is something I kind of touched on. I've seen it. Usually, Windows will just say your password and you get a pop-up notification. And it kind of goes away to the side and a lot of people don't see it. But in this case, they don't get any notifications, which is something wrong with the system. To help with this, I let them know when the new password will expire expire and we built expiration date into the new password uh, so he has to let them know uh, but see i'm not sure if he means that he set the system to do this but i don't, I don't think so because uh, from when i talked to him l l further down it didn't, didn't seem to be the case and then it says here for example if the new password expire on 12 16 we might use something like this password without quotation marks. So he's given me a really good example of a short but a secure password. This is a really good uh, password. It has a combination of with the asterisk as a symbol and then combination of uh, numbers. And then it says, I tell them with, I tell them about one of the passwords checking, checking sites and on one of the sites, the password check results are that that would be take computer 23 years 
Okay, so he's basically giving him an example of, hey, this is a secure password. It's really simple to remember. But if you want to test your password on how long it would take to crack, you know, he's basically uh, saying that uh, to the user that the password is very secure. They don't necessarily have to worry about it. And uh, it says our password lasts 90 days, which is normal before the account gets disabled. So the new password is strong enough and it's not... Uh, so complex that they would struggle with it. The password also checks all the requirements for the password complexity. So, yeah, this is a really good password. Um, the, what I find interesting about this is that he is given him permanent passwords. Typically, in a business environment, uh, what you want to do is give him a temporary password. It, it, again, it, this, this highly depends on the environment on what business prefers uh, but when it comes to security you you realistically you realistically want to give him a temporary password in active directory so if we go to active directory here again and uh again i'm sorry well again well yeah again because i made a lot more videos about active directory and uh <laughs> so yeah it's again and uh, it's just kind of finicky here i had to send them send it to alt control delete so i can get to the login part of it anyway so when you typically go in and let's find mike moser here mike moser and you know somebody says my password is expired you would just basically change their password and give them a temporary password Meaning that whatever I type in here for the new password, I confirm password, and then leave this checked, which is checked by default. It says user must change password and next logon. It's a temporary password. So whenever they log in, they will create their own, hopefully in a perfect world, a secure password like this gentleman suggested. But since in his uh, situation, in his business, the notifications for the password expiration have been expired and probably for some other reasons too, uh, probably because they can't log in. Uh, he has to give them a permanent. This is, I'm assuming these are remote. Well, he, it is, say, off-site users. These are all remote users. So they can't uh, type in the new temporary password in at all uh, because their current computer will only take their old password. So chances are they can log into the computer, but they can't change their password at all so the computer wouldn't even register because it's not connected to the vpn all, vpn at all and it's not connected to the domain it doesn't have access to the to, to the business network i'm sorry one more note man this goes to show that there are so many things that can go wrong that to think about when it comes to resolving these type of issues but another reason person cannot log into vpn to change their password is because when your password expire, your account is locked. So your VPN will not allow you to log in at all. This is why he is giving them permanent passwords, which enables their account once more. So he doesn't realize that the password has been reset or changed at all. So he has to give him a permanent password, which is something I've done and still do occasionally because this is the only way. And then later on, I offered him uh, an option to actually change their password again uh, but once they're connected to the vpn then they can set it to whatever they want so this is the setup that they have over there and which is fine this is how his business runs things you know however technically speaking it's a security risk to for him um, also to know the password for all the users you know and again i mean this is technically speaking you know what i mean if the user is fine with that um you know that's fine this is a very secure password and if the business uh, gives 100 percent trust to the tech support guys there that's perfectly fine too who am i to judge but technically speaking uh, it's more secure to uh, give them for them to have their own password i, I mean you can argue this back and forth uh, i can see uh, I, I can argue for both sides either way as you can tell but you know in this case this is what's uh, this is the situation for this gentleman, and then it says here users. And then I asked him uh, because I wanted to clarify: uh, Does this user not get password notification on VPN? And then 
and then I realized that they were off site. So chances are they wouldn't even get it. Uh, but because the, the the notifications are not working to begin with for some reason. So even before it expired, they didn't get it. But of course, if they're not on VPN at all, it's not going to, you know what I mean? It's what is there to send if there is no connection? What is there to send a notification if there is no connection? Just like you get notifications for YouTube or any other website, you have to have network connection. In, in that case, would be outside internet. So and it says here, users... Uh, used to get notifications at the login prompt, but that quit a few years ago and our company uh, our company went to a password page uh, page off of our internet site. So I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here, but I suspect it's some kind of website where you can just use a single sign on. There are some websites that are set up to be reached uh, just over the internet company website and you can use your domain login. And uh, like that, you can uh, access basically, you know, company resources without actually having a sump company's resources, not necessarily the network itself, but through the website, which is kind of a proxy in this sense here, a proxy way of getting to something on the, uh, for the, on, on the company. Um, there is usually a website that's set up that you can access just using your credentials. A lot of times they're just SSO credentials, meaning single sign-on. The other issue we found was that the users get got confused in the Windows login and it was prompting for a change. So we pretty much advised them if they get a notification to get to go to the internet site for now. So yeah, it looks like they have some kind of a website set up for that to help them deal with these password issues. And to check, probably to check, let them check uh, when their password is going to expire. We are implementing a ping SSO system that should complete later this year. Um, and uh, But the awareness training of a secure password doesn't drive you crazy like sticks with them. And, and crazy sticks with them. Um, so, yeah, so he basically goes around and trains. And he mentions this uh, users that... You can have a secure password without actually having it be too complicated. And it says, I actually teach this in a security awareness training in the new employee orientations. So he's a really good guy. He's going above and beyond when it comes to teaching passwords, pass security, basically. I also plan on taking a laptop um, on a rolling cart throughout the hospital and spend a few hours just letting users come up and check their complexity of their current passwords. So... He also plans uh, to go around. He, you know, th this is really cool, actually. I work, uh, right now I'm working from home because of the whole situation, but I also work in a building. It's kind of a campus type of building with three built buildings connect together. And that's pretty cool when you can actually, you know, grab a cart, put your laptop on and just go around and just help people. You know, that's really cool and fun. And then he's going to do that. He's going to go around and have people check the complexity. And I have a feeling that what he's talking about here is that he has a password uh, testing website that he they can go in and type in their password and it will take their it will test the complexity or security of their password, which is pretty cool. And um, and then he says, if it's not very complex, I show them how to improve and still be easy to remember. Yeah, this is really cool. I. I really like his feedback and just different way on how he's dealing with things uh, when it comes to tech support. It's very interesting and a bit different from the things uh, that are done, the way things are done uh, in, in, a, in my particular business environment, but nonetheless still valid in my opinion. And then he goes to talk about we have outside clinics that are not part of a hospital or have remote access to our patient records and have stress disorder. Uh, have stress password security for with everyone and I stress password security with everyone that's cool I like that and then their help desk um, is aware of this uh, probably practices the same type of thing and that was pretty much it I kind of uh, tried to get more understanding of what's going on but then and and then why the basically issue wasn't addressed to begin with which in this case is the fact that they're not getting notifications for the password resets in his environment but it's something that he can't help a lot of times we are limited even if we want to help we are limited in a company that um, 
that doesn't necessarily want you to mess with things that are above your pay grade or don't give you the tools to do it, you know. So the way I would deal with this issue is the same way I would actually uh, call them and talk to them, especially if they're a remote user and set up this password just like he did it. I would give him a permanent password. I, I made actually a video about this in which I dealt it with the same way. Um, it was a, I think the video is called VPN password or something like that. I highly suggest to, uh, for you to actually watch this if you're interested in this specifically as I expand on that um, in that video as well and how you would uh, deal with that. But yeah, if you know if the password has expired and they can't change it, I would do the same thing as this gentleman. I would give him a, a permanent password and uh, offer them to uh, basically reset their password again so that they can get a prompt to change it again. You know, give them a temporary password. But this is after they log into the computer with the permanent password that I've given them, just like that gentleman explained. And then, assuming that I'm talking to them on the phone, I'm just going to call this, uh, I'm going to give it an internal note for my boss. I've reset user's password. And just call it that. I'm not going to leave anything else there because it's it's uh, redundant. Um, that's all I've done. That's all there is to it. If management is completely aware in these type of situations that uh, if you, somebody's on a VPN and they can't change their password, this is how you would do it. You know, there's no other way unless there's some kind of weird system set up. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's all there is to it for this particular ticket and of course I would close it if you want to know more about how to use ticketing systems I have a lot more videos that I've already made on how to literally use specific uh, ticketing system in this case Jira service desk very popular so uh, yeah you, in this case you can just go in and just mark it as completed and so on and uh, yeah I have uh, lots of videos like this that are um, they, they work a lot a lot of these different type of tickets and issues if you have more recommendations guys please let me know i am there are so many things i can think of uh, i can't always come up with new ideas so i really could use your help on this i will gladly talk about anything that you have um that, that you have issues with matter of fact the gentleman that uh, gave me an idea uh, for this last ticket he also um offered his help and whatever you know and there are other people who are who are there for that as well so um, if you you know if you have time and and let's say you're working help desk and you come across something interesting let me know and uh you know i'll create a video on how to solve it or some you know something like that if it's more advanced i'll create a separate video hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobuman today's video is all about tickets 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 Help desk tickets. We're going to work on some of the most common ones that come through the system. So if you're into help desk, by the end of this video, you will know how to work help desk pretty much. I mean, there are going to be some of the most common things that will come across. I promise you that. So it's going to be a longer video. This is why it's going to be a premiere video. So if you want to interact with me on the right side where the chat is, you can too. But if not, well, sorry to have missed you. But if you have comments or questions, feel free to leave them below as well. I'll gladly help you out with whatever you need. One thing to keep in mind, the way I teach IT is very particular, very proactive, and very easy to follow. This is what kind of separates me from other people, which is perfectly fine. People have different ways of teaching things, but the way I do it is in a very proactive way. Not only do I talk about on how to fix a computer problem, but also how to deal with the customer at the same time while you're doing so. So I hope you like that type of style. All right, that being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, and let's get into this uh, awesome video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that there is a lot to do here. We have what looks to be 12 tickets that we're going to work in this entire session. So keep in mind, if you're watching this while it's premiering, while this video is premiering, 
I am in the chat box as well. So if you want to interact with me, ask me any questions while we are watching this video together, feel free to do so. I am available to answer any of the questions that you might have or if you just want to say hi. That's perfectly fine too. I more than welcome that. I love to hear from you guys. Okay, so we have a lot of tickets, guys, and now we have to prioritize. Of course, we have to use common sense here, and we're going to go for the tickets that came in first. The way we can tell is by looking at the date and time, but we can also look at the uh, ticket number. So that being said, we're going to select this one, which is ISD 15. We're going to work that one first. Of course, if you see a ticket that says big system outage, Make sure you prioritize that because it's affecting more people. It's more. It's going to impact more people. So you make sure you prioritize that. Otherwise, you just work tickets in the uh, order received. All right. First ticket we have here. It's called PDF files don't open. Of course, make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it, so you can get credit for it. The title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open. And in the description, it says, for some reason, PDF files do not work. So what do you guys think the issue is here? I'm going to allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer. But I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time, but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this. While you guys do that, I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello. My name is Irvin with why well, I can't spell today. With help desk support. I have your ticket about PDF files not working. Can you please send me your computer name or IP address? When I reply to this customer and I click save here, it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about. And the reason for that is because in this situation, we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue. Uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it, but it's preferable, if possible, for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it. If you have to, that's fine. Of course, this is going to depend on the company that you work for. You know, it depends on the, what the requirements are, but chances are if you're help desk, you're going to take control of their computer, take a look at the problem and resolve it as quickly as possible. So for that to happen, for us to use remote desktop, we're going to need their computer name or IP address. Both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely. So in this case, PDF files do not work. So number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed. So so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files. A lot of times that's the main thing. Or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files, but chances are this is what's happening. Second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing. You may have Adobe installed on the computer, but if if it's still not or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens, that means we need to change the uh, file association. We're going to change that right now. Now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers, follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted. In this case, all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email. However, they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via, you know, via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message. Uh, some, you know, most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply. Whatever their preferences are, 
make sure you follow make sure you follow that to the T very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with in this case we send them an email and once we get a reply and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer uh, let's say we do get a reply and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them maybe the customer said that the PC name is C O B U M A N one. So what I'm going to do in that case, I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file. So I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman one. So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman one PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a File Association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension so if we scroll down it should be here here we go O and then we're coming uh, we're approaching P so should be here shortly PDF there it is PDF we can now see that PDF in this case is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge we simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go. Problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too. You just ask them what they want. All right. All right. That ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note. Changed file association. Sorry, guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly. But good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right-click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or, you know, somebody has to refer to it, to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So, yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Stay very professional when you're working tickets uh, for any company and always be polite. All right, moving on. So we're going to work on this number 16. We worked 15, so we're going to work this one. It says website is super slow. And then in the description, it says every website I open is super slow. So what could that be, guys? Tell me if you're watching this in a... Uh, when it, if you're watching this while it's premiering. See, most of the time, when we think of websites running slow, we think of internet, right? We think of internet. And yeah, that's, that's one of the most logical things we can, you know, consider as causing the problem, which would be slow internet, right? But Internet may not necessarily be slow. Maybe there's something going on on the computer that could be causing this. Again, this is one of those things we can uh, resolve. In my opinion, the best way to resolve it is to actually take a look at the system again. So we're going to go in here again and say, Hello, my name is 
Irvin, we're contacting the customer again with tech support. I can help you with slow website issue. Can you please provide PC name or IP address so that I can take a look? We're going to do it like this, guys. So, as I said, the main thing to kind of consider as a website running slow, and in this case, every website is running slow. It's not just a specific website. So it's not an issue with just one website. It's all websites. Yes, internet could be running slow, and that could be the main reason. But there could be also something in the background that's taking up this uh, this uh, bandwidth for the internet, or not just necessarily in internet, because in this case, user or customer might be considering internet as in every website that they access, while a lot of websites might be internal. So, even even if it's just um, even if they say that every website is is running slow, that may not necessarily be the case. So that's one thing that to that you might want to consider checking is that you could be just internal websites. So let's say they have five different websites that are only for them, for that business. So that's the first thing I would check and ask as well uh, when I'm as, as a follow up after I get their PSA name. Is it all websites really? Or is it just the internal ones that you use most of the time? Because sometimes users don't know the difference between internet and intranet. While the uh, intranet is uh, being, you know, the internal websites. Anyways, there are other things that could be causing it. So if it's just a local network that's causing the issue, that's something to consider. So let's again pretend that we got a same PC name, Cobbleman1 is user's PC name. We got an internal note. And the way you put these notes in, it's going to be up to you. As long as you make sure that everything you do is listed in there uh, professionally and, and in, in, a, in, in a descriptive manner so that when somebody looks at it, they can tell exactly what you did. I know I keep repeating myself on these things, but it's very important, guys. So, we're going to pretend that that's the that's the PC name uh, simply because I I don't want to show everything on this main PC because this is your main PC that you're working with. So in this case, we're role playing. Okay, here we are at user's computer. Again, the same PC name that we're going to use. So I I made videos on this too before, but yeah, make sure that. You know, check and, and you know double check to see which websites are slow if it's an internal network um, if, if it's internal websites then there's an issue with your network you may have to contact the network team that's another issue but a lot of times it's just the updates that are coming down for some reason and it could be related to the fact that maybe user hasn't uh, turned hasn't uh, left the computer on or didn't or turned the computer off when it's not being in use. So whenever they turn it on, it tries to install all these updates. And as you can see, there is an update here waiting to happen. And then of course, you can also open up their task manager and just look at their performance, see if there's anything taking up bandwidth. And here we are, just kind of looks like by default, we have selected ethernet um, adapter. And then we can see what kind of activity we have going on right now. Right now it looks to be, you know, just normal usage because I'm using RDP, remote desktop, so you will expect to see this type of usage, but nothing crazy. We know that this is not even one megabit per second speed. So, you know, this seems normal. And then you can test the websites, see what's going on, and to kind of go about it in that way, look at the processes, see if there's anything working in the background that's taking up a lot of CPU power. They can also make it seem like the websites are running slow. If the CPU utilization is really high, that could be the problem. If you see that, look at what is causing the, what is using the CPU bandwidth or CPU power in that case, and then um, resolve that issue in, in that manner. But, you know, again, 
internet is running slow check their bandwidth speed you can do a bandwidth test to see what's going on I don't want to do it right now because it will re reveal my current IP address but you can go to Google and just type in bandwidth test you can do a bandwidth test if that looks sketchy you can look into that there are many other things uh, that, that can cause this but the ones I've mentioned here are the main reason for this to happen so just kind of look at these things see if there is anything actually on the computer causing the problem if everything looks fine on the on the computer itself like this this is perfectly normal that could mean that there is some kind of a network issue in which case I would possibly uh, I would possibly route this ticket to tier 2 so that way they can reach out to the network people so network team they would reach out to the network team and say eh, you know there's something going on but the chances are you would have multiple users reporting the same issue that's you know but you can also look if you have a setup in the in, in the in the system for your company there might be a place or just like a web page that keeps track of critical issues that are happening right now you can check that page to see if there are any network issues this and that this is a really good start to get you going in the right direction to make sure that there's nothing going on with the computer first because that's your job your help desk tier one and maybe tier two but this is your job to make sure there's nothing going on on the PC that could be causing the problem and move on from there alright in this case we're going to role play and just assume that there are no issues there are no issues at the moment this also happens uh, you know a lot of times where somebody reports slowdowns with the websites but then if it if it was some kind of a background process like updates or you know something in the background that required extra bandwidth or even CPU bandwidth and uh, it may seem like you know website issue but it could by the time you get to it it might be just fine so yeah again I can't stress this enough check all these things first before you put a note down like this at the moment um, and then depending on your environment what I do which I'm allowed to do at my current employer I can say I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours to monitor so I'm allowed to do this um, at my level uh, some help desk places they don't want you to keep the tickets open at all in which case you may have to close the ticket right away so I'm going to leave this ticket open for the time being I'm going to change its status to waiting for support waiting for support well that's us we can't do that so I'm trying to think here you know what since I don't want to see a appropriate status here I'm just going to leave it in waiting for support uh, the, the ticketing system I use at my work has something a lot more specific things that you can actually select but since we're limited with this current ticketing system for demonstration I'm going to leave it waiting for support and just kind of keep track of it it's assigned to me I'm going to keep track of it that's what matters so we're going to move on from this ticket here okay let's see here the next one is ISD 17 it says my documents are missing all right let's have a look and again we're going to make sure that it's assigned to us very important and uh, it says here my documents are missing I found that my documents are missing very simple so this person or this reporter is saying that their documents are missing we're gonna have to figure out which documents are they talking about so I'm going to reply to the customer again follow the instructions given to you by the customer on how they prefer to be contacted I'm gonna say hello this is Erwin with PC support I have your ticket about missing files can you please provide your PC name so I actually done a video on this already and for that 
I'm going to actually cut into that so you guys can, it, it, it's the same deal as this. I just want to kind of use it because this is going to be a very long video as you guys already know. So I'm going to use my previously made video that's literally dealing with this same issue. So I'm going to just kind of plug it in there and then we're going to continue after that. But for now, I'm just going to leave it at this and I'm going to close the ticket. But yeah, again, I'm going to show you the video of of something that I've done exactly like this so you guys can know how to deal with that so I'm going to close it completed and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket alright let's click on this ticket this ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop so in this case there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know, it was with deleted or just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it, and then but you can find a copy of. You can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play, and then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves, and then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you Thanks you. <laughs> Thanks, Erwin. Okay. So now user has been asked or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user and you know, we're going to get that PC name and in this case we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kobuman, so we're going to keep doing that. The PC Let's do this. Users PC name is Kobolman1. All right. So, kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So, let's pretend that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called Inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is i uh these are just the typical ones that i go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever i'm working tickets whenever you know i work as a business system analyst but i do work on tickets especially nowadays now that we're working from home so they need more assistance so this is what i do mostly nowadays uh, simply because different times you know different times guys so now i'm just gonna finish my ticket here you know made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete okay now that we're done with that type of ticket let's move on to this 18 here it says I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself. 
and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right. It says, I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer. And same thing repeated in the description. And it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike. So you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software, and this guy is, in this case, Oracle Database, is a third-party software no matter how you look at it we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them so what we're actually going to do and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone this is how i prefer it you can do it any way you like you can send an email a reply to them you can send them an instant message and see uh see if you can get more information but what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install Oracle database on their computer without permission. So here's, here are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Mike here, Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over, requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it. And he already has all of this, all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello. You guessed it. My name is Irvin. You're going to be doing this a lot, except you're going to be using your own name, of course. <laughs> with PC support I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's let's do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before I install this software I have to check to see if it's on approved software list. So if you send a message to him like this, it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say, hey, I already have it. I already have it. I just need it installed meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer. In which case, he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as Help Desk uh, Tier 1 would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like a uh, database driver installed or something like that. And I'll show you that as soon as I, uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I, you know, kind of talk about this part of it. But when it comes to help desk tier one, you have to make sure number one, that it's approved and number two, that you install it for them, whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers, and you may help them. You may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name, and remember we use Kobelman 1 as a computer name a lot, that it has that computer, Kobelman 1, subscribed to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So 
I have to check that, but if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just going to, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration, this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself. And it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver. It would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. You know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there. And then you configure it, whatever the system that you want. So you would just click add, and then you would select which one you want to use. And then you go in through the configuration, set up the ports, IP addresses, uh, server names, or whatever it needs to be. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it. It just depends on the level and the requirements for the company. Again, this is possibly a help desk tier two. Definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this. Okay, I'm going to go back to that system. All right, but in this case, we're going to assume that he just wanted it installed. So we went ahead and installed it. I'm going to add internal node install well let's do this let's do this subscribed pc to oracle db means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then i'm going to do this installed software as requested Okay, and now we're going to close the ticket as complete. All right, easy peasy. Moving on to numero number 19. My computer is freezing twice a day. Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay. And my computer is freezing twice a day. So this kind of related to our to our uh, websites are kind of running slow. Websites are running slow, excuse me. Uh, take it in the sense that chances are that this is just Windows updates causing the problem. So I believe I have a video on this. I will show you uh, kind of a clip from that on how to check for issues like this where the computer is causing problems. So I'm just gonna plug that in in here. Uh, and uh, because it talks about the exact same thing, what well, you should uh, check in order to see why a computer is running slow and why it's happening in this case twice a day. So I'm going to cut the clip into that. Then we're going to continue with our ticket number 20. In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and close this ticket. But then again, don't worry, I'll show you how to do this and how to check on this ticket and how to resolve it. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we take a look at a call handling for help desk tier one, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it this way. I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the back end in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling help desk tier one support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something you can help me with this? For some reason it's just so slow today that I can't do anything. No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday. And then today, for some reason, it's just very, very sluggish. I can't do anything. I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job. All right. No problem. I can have a look uh, to see what's going on. Can you give me your PC name? My PC name? Uh... Yeah, it should be if it should be under your PC information or even there might be a, a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that that it, it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters. If you can give me that please, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I think I see it here. 
um, it says TM C35658 all right thank you very much for that uh, sir do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you sure go ahead all right let's pause the phone call just for a second here so the user is talking about a slow computer so it's a slow computer situation so what is the major reason for a slow computer in a business environment most of the time when the computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used but chances are if the computer was turned off shut down asleep or any of those reasons it probably couldn't install these updates so now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that. That, that's not usually what happens in a business. That's something that home computers may have issues with. For a business type of computer, they're going to be up to spec, and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates. Of course, there is another reason, you know, being a virus, but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely, it's unbelievable. So, updates, main thing. Let's get back to the customer and tell them about that. All right, sir. So, what I found is that... Uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish uh, Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once we reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens and uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, if that doesn't work then uh, we can help you further see if that works all right I'll give it a shot um, all right I'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens all right great thank you so much for doing that I appreciate that Okay, looks like I'm uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and, and log in, and we'll see how it goes. Now, keep in mind, we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning, but it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards, it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right, let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right, I'm checking. All right, so far so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. Uh, I don't. Okay. Yeah, it, it it seems to be fine now. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and uh, a couple other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing. No problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay. Okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It it's uh 
I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever computers shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh, is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off. Because sometimes the computer wouldn't even update properly, even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer. And uh, that, you know, that should... Uh, kind of a, be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right, will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, guys. That's how you handle this type of call. I hope you find this very useful. This is a real-world example, guys, so I hope you really do find this useful because this is exactly what's going to happen whenever you do start doing your help desk tier one tech support. All right, guys, so let's take a, a, a brief break. This is a good opportunity uh, for us to take a, um, I suppose, couple of minute break if you guys uh, want to, you know, run somewhere real quick and come back. Uh, if you're watching this as a premiere along with me. And uh, I hope you guys are liking this stuff so far. I believe it's very valuable because I'm showing you real life stuff that actually happens. I, uh, I've said this before and I know you guys that, that are watching me uh, on a regular know that I normally work as a business systems analyst. And, but right now, in this current situation we're in, working from home, I'm mostly doing tier, tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 or whatever <laughs> help desk tech support in general for whoever might need issues. So this is a real world experience. And um, if you like it, please click the like button and, and share this video with your friends if you have time. If you don't have time, for me, if you just click the like button is also very, very, uh, uh, very helpful. And I really appreciate that so much. What do you guys think so far? If, you, if you're watching this in a premiere, uh, during the premiere of the video, please uh, say, you know, please, you don't have to, but if, if you want to say something in the chat, I more than welcome it. Otherwise, feel free to leave me a comment uh, in the comment sections um, below. And uh, if you check out my channel, there's going to be a lot more stuff, not just how to teach you, not just teaching you the help desk uh, job, but also how to get these type of jobs. They could be help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, uh, project management. Uh, I, I, there's so much. I think I have almost like 400 videos and they're all longer format, similar to this. I do have hardware videos if you're into computer hardware and stuff like that. I do have those, um, they're pretty popular as well. Okay, that's it for our break. Let's go ahead and continue and uh, just kind of power through these tickets, guys. We got to make sure we work these tickets. All right, moving on to uh, ISD20. And this one says here, I close my documents without saving. Oh, boy. You love to see these type of tickets because there is... There is not a whole lot you can do with this. The problem is, you guys know this. If you haven't saved something, it chances are it's gone. There are a few exceptions. Some programs automatically create a save file and it creates a copy of it. In which case, you would go through and 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 um, see if you can recover it like that. Another thing is. And these are things we have to think about before we even before we even reach out to Mike, you know, before we even reach out to this user. We have to think like this, proactively think, very proactively, because we're gonna have to try to see if we can recover any of its any of this stuff. The biggest issue here is that we're gonna have to confirm this, is that they close the document without saving. And if there is no automatic save feature in that program, there's nothing we can do. However, sometimes 
people will actually do the opposite. They would save the document and overwrite what's in there already. So I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe there is a backup of that same file somewhere that they can look at and compare and see which one is more valuable to them. Because this is a really awkward situation. you got to be very careful with this. So we're going to reply to customer because in reality, there's really not a whole lot we can do to help this customer, unfortunately. Hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. Let's do tier one like this. And you guys can do um, whatever you like, you know, as long as it's appropriate. I have your ticket about closing a document comment without saving it did you happen to save it somewhere else or or did you just close the window see this is you you can't i'm going to put a smiley face there because chances are we're going to have to tell him here that, that we can't help him so sometimes it's okay to use these emoticons to kind of let prepare prepare the user that once you give them the bad news is that it's not your fault per se. So I'm going to send this. It would be different if they just delete an entire document, which, you know, we, we touched on previously. And that there will be places where you can, you know, restore it, whether it's just from Windows Restore Point. Because what happens is when you create a re Windows restore point on your computer, it also creates copies. And if you set it up to do it regularly, it'll create copies and backups of every file that you've uh, created and edited at some point. So you can go back and pick an older one and, you know, this and that. But in this case, they literally just close the window as far as we can tell. So when they come back and say, yes, I closed it without saving my work that I typed in all day then we, we may have to say unfortunately we don't sorry about that guys unfortunately we don't have a way to recover that file once you close the window like that it is gone forever not smiley face so and to make them feel better, you can say, however, I can take a look at your PC to see if I can find a time-based backup. Saved backup. But... I am not 100% sure there is something there. So you got to give him something. You can word it any way you want. Just make sure you're very understanding and polite about this because chances are, again, that, that there's nothing you can do about this. So do all you can to help them out. See if you can find it. And if not, then you know it's just tough luck you know what can you say? don't don't tell this to the customer just be polite but do the best you can and 
to to you know to help them out that's all you can do in this ticket and then once once you do it you just close it i mean this is one of those situations you will come across that that happen that simply happen you know part of working help desk is to actually be in these awkward situations occasionally not all the time but occasionally all right guys let's move on number 21 here is the number 21 computer shuts down multiple times a day now i'm gonna have to refer this one to uh being related to either well okay l let me ask you guys what do you guys think this might be to give you a little moment to or you know to give some people a chance to actually answer this if you're watching this as a premiere video uh, while you guys give me a reply I'm going to assign it to myself and I'm going to reply to customer and I'm going to ask them hello well I'm gonna say who I am first with PC support when your computer shuts down does it give you any error or does screen simply go dark or 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 nothing happens you know what let's leave this this is way more descriptive and it's to a point so all right um going to have to refer you to uh, my video here or part of the video where i talked about updates because this can happen when if it's just a regular update you get update and it wants to reboot multiple times this happens usually when computer's been turned off overnight and now it's getting updates that's number one reason number two reason bad hardware if they come back and say it it just goes dark you know screen goes black nothing happens it's just it shuts down multiple times then chances are that this is hardware issue in this case we would have to say this um, it sounds like it could be a hardware issue uh, we will need to perform a let's, let's be very descriptive hardware diagnostic on this computer so we're gonna have to say this and we're gonna have to run hardware diagnostic there are different ways of doing this on for example some computers I want to say HP's, maybe some Dell's. When you reboot the computer, and when you hear the boop, the boop, <laughs> the beep, when it's posting, you can press, for example, I don't know, F8, F9, F11. I forget exactly which key it is, but it gives you to kind of a boot menu, but it also gives you an ability to perform hardware diagnostic. In this case, if the computer just shuts down like this randomly, no warning, nothing. It just goes dark. It's a hardware issue. To me, there's no doubt about that. There's nothing else that it could be. But it could be overheating. So the computer could be just dust. Dusty inside, dirty. Maybe uh, what's his face needs to be uh, changed, like the, the uh, heat sink and um, the fan. Maybe they need to be taken off, cleaned out. The thermal paste that connects to the CPU needs to be changed. And uh, yeah, stuff like that when it comes to heat. The second thing is that happens mostly and causes this shutdown is hard drive. Hard drive simply starts going bad and it just shuts, randomly shuts down. So it's either either one of those things at random. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you have to do some kind of a hardware diagnostic. And then that's going to depend on what kind of tools you have available to you as help desk. There might be something else you have to do when it comes to resolving this issue. 
these this user may have to actually take their computer to a designated office or place where they would physically bring their laptop to if this is a person that is working from home for example if they're not if they're working in an office environment their local IT support um, their local IP support I, 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 IT not IP uh, information technology support or tech support will have to do a diagnostic and figure out what is going on with their hardware every office will have one of these guys maybe not there but maybe a guy that travels between locations that will deal with this chances are if it's hardware if, it, if their computer is under warranty maybe even a technician from for example HP or Dell would uh, check on this and see what's going on when it comes to possible hardware issues so that's how I would go about it. There's really nothing for me to show you here uh, because you would literally just do a diagnostic. For example, you open up a menu and you select test hardware. If it's one of those type of diagnostic software or if it's pre-boot software or you can specifically tell it test hard drive, test RAM, test motherboard. It's as simple as that and it will tell you if there are issues with that. And you can also look at device manager and look at um, at there this is what you could also do I'm sorry I'll have to actually tell you what to do I'm gonna go to the computer and um, and let's let's do this here let's do this here because I don't want to leave this one just without actually showing you something and not just you know I don't want to just explain it I'm gonna say this users PC name is Cobbleman one All right, let's go to it. All right, here we are at Cobbleman One. We're going to go to the device manager. I'm sorry, we're going to go to event viewer. Uh, we can also do this in the event viewer. What we're actually looking for is Windows logs, Windows system logs, and we're going to look for errors that come up. And these are typical errors that show up when there's a hard drive going bad so we're going to just i'm going to find something here that kind of looks similar to it i forget i forget the exact um when uh, the event id but it will be blatantly obvious to you when it comes up see this computer doesn't have any errors as far as i can tell. see it will be related to something like this you see it says ntfs file system is healthy no action is needed when there is something wrong there would be a red icon here that tells you that there are some issues going on here you can also go to a reliability monitor I talked about that in my previous video see here are some warnings here something like this but it will be red there it is errors here we go there are always errors guys see these are all talking about different things uh, some most of these are actually a normal but what you're looking for is a source as in and then look at the source here and then look at the file system anyways this is stuff you would be looking for specifically when it comes to file issues see this one doesn't have that um, obviously there's nothing wrong with this PC when it comes to NTFS file system but when it comes to source this is what you would kind of look for and see if there are any errors coming up like that and they'll be very descriptive just like the, the one I showed you earlier here where it talks about NTFS file system it would say there is an issue with you know some kind of NTFS uh, file system issue so it's very it's going to be very apparent and then in the description you can see just like every time you click on something here you can see the description of what's going on here so this is what you're going to have to look for and there will be a lot of them if trust me if there are if there's an issue with hard drive there's going to be a lot of them here and then you can just go to a reliability monitor reliability monitor ah, it's being stupid control panel reliability monitor is inside of where is our I think it's security maintenance and where is it security 
network man I recently did I'm getting tired guys this video is getting long <laughs> I'm getting tired I think it's probably been an hour maintenance it's here somewhere reliability monitor here we go security and maintenance view of reliability history there it is reliability monitor so I was in the right place I just didn't see this reliability mon uh, button and you may have seen like stuff like this. You see this hardware error right here, actually. You see that? There's a red X, and that's how it's going to look in the uh, event viewer as well. Hardware error. Let's see what this one talks about. See? There's an error, and it's going to be something similar to this. Anyways, guys, I don't want to beat the dead horse, as they say, on this, on this issue. So what we're going to do is simply... Um, run the diagnostic or have somebody else at local level to actually do the hardware diagnostic. So I'm going to add internal note here and I'm going to say a routed issue to local PC support to trouble shoot hardware issues. <clears throat> save and I would route it from here but I don't see that option in this system unfortunately anyways I would route the ticket to, to the other uh, support people to troubleshoot it so in this case I'm just gonna close it as completed so it so it leaves the system but yeah make sure you route it to the proper people all right so what's next ISD 22 I believe is the next one and it says USB drive not working. Let's have a look. <clears throat> okay. We're going to assign it to ourselves, of course. It says USB drive not working. And it says nothing happens with the USB stick inserted. And... Um, the way we're going to handle this is going to be based off whether uh, the business that uh, customers is working for allows for external media to be plugged in, uh, whether it's headsets or USB drives or any type of external storage. So that's going to be a factor here, um, most likely. So what do you guys think the issue is here? It says nothing happens when USB stick is when USB stick is inserted. So what do you think might be the case? I mean, maybe the USB drive is not working, but there might be something else. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's another one that we may have to handle in a particular way. And depending on the situation that we're actually dealing with, we know that it's a USB drive and that they're trying to insert it into the computer and nothing happens. So here's what's going on. Either the USB drive is not working, simply it's broken, or USB drive needs a driver, which is kind of unlikely because most of the USB drives uh, that I've encountered, it's simple plug and play. You guys seen this. You plug it in, computer says, wait while we configure your drive. And then it configures it and then it asks you, what do you want to do now with this drive? How do you want it to open? And then you can tell it, okay, just open it up as a folder or something like that. Or a third thing where the company uh, or company that this user works for simply does not allow any external media to be plugged into USBs, meaning that the USB port is disabled. So it could be one of those things. And uh, if that's the case, there is nothing we can do about it. We can inform the customer that their company doesn't allow for USB sticks to be used. But the way I would say it, first, I would... Uh, if if it's a case, this is this is assuming that this is the case that it's not allowed for this company, uh, for for company. Um, or if it's not allowed by the company to use USB uh, ports, this is what I would say. Hello, 
my name is Irvin with tech support unfortunately our company has USB ports disabled as part of company company security policy which is perfectly fine we can say that uh, but you know I have to assume that there are situations in which it is allowed let's say this is somebody high somebody high up for example this is some kind of manager or director level and for some reason it's okay for them to uh, have or to have access to USB ports and use anything that they want then that will be different you know but in most large companies it's set up to detect whether it's a USB port or uh, I should say whether it's not USB port but whether it's a USB drive versus a USB headset or something like that and in, in which case it would know you plug in a headset and it would just work but still once you plug in a USB drive it would not work so that's certainly possible but sometimes you would also get a warning once you plug in a USB drive it says hey just so you know we you can use a USB drive but we're going to scan everything that's on it and once you plug it in it starts to scan that's everything that's on it which is which is fair you know you're using a company's computer and then you plug it in a USB drive so that's simply that's what's going to happen but in this case we're going to say this to um, our user and we're going to say if you need further assistance please let me know which I don't necessarily like to leave it open-ended like this because I'm going to close the ticket but if we're trying to be nice about it and kind of trying to let it let them down easy because it's not our fault we already told them we you know it port is disabled as part of security policy I wouldn't necessarily leave this open-ended like this because that implies that you possibly could help them if they say well can you enable it for me uh, but we're going to say this but when it comes to USB ports this is something controlled by security team we want to put it on them because they're, they're the ones um, that, that are uh, placing these restrictions on the USB ports we can assume again that they're okay and then we can go inside of their computer you know the typical thing we've been doing so far you know ask them what their computer name is and then we go inside of their computer like so you can go to this PC and see what's what's inside of it what's plugged in and what's not so and then if, if there is no USB drive visually that comes up we can go to our device manager let's see right click the desktop uh, the uh, Windows icon go to device manager then we're gonna we can check for USB storage we can see there is a unknown USB device there so and this could be what you know customer is talking about this is could this could be what user is talking about nothing happens when they plug it in and we can see that when it comes to visually seeing uh, what's going on we can see that there is indeed nothing happens but inside of the system inside of the system we can see that there is an issue Windows has stopped this device because it has reported uh, a problem and it's a code 43 now I know exactly what the problem is here and we can certainly fix it As a matter of fact I'm going to fix it as I am talking to you right now um, this is actually on my next computer so what I'm going to do is actually a plug in and I want you to pay attention 
to what happens here i'm going to plug in because the usb thing stick that's actually plugged in over there is one of those that allows you to use different kinds of uh, storage uh, sd cards or s storage devices so you can put in like a sd card of certain size like a micro sd or whatnot so i'm going to take one of those and plug it in over here as i am talking and i hope you guys can hear me and i'm going to plug it in hopefully and i should something should be happening right now and there it is you see how it switched over i actually plugged in a storage device into this USB stick and um, now it came up as you can see here as a USB drive right there so yeah I mean you basically go through the troubleshooting and if I had to yeah I could have just gone in and just like updated this you know the uh, whatever it needs to be updated the the uh, device um, uh, driver if needed be and you know just go basic to the basic troubleshooting of fixing the usb but chances are really high that it's simply disabled by the computer by the computer's uh, local security policy by the company's policy so keep that in mind all right so as you can see guys i am actually trying my best to uh, recreate the problem as much as i can it's not easy uh, because i have to literally recreate the problem for each thing that we talk about here but it's my pleasure this is i i really want to make sure that you guys can learn as much as possible when it comes to dealing with these actual issues that happen all right so i'm going to add internal note and i'm going to say notified i'm going to say notified user of company security policy in regards in regards to usb ports they are disabled by default we're going to say that it's not by default on the computer but by default when it comes to security policy for this company and i'm going to close it like that and of course if you just ended up fixing the usb drive then that's what you're going to have to do whether it's fixing it to show up like that or whether you need to go inside of the disk management and create a partition on it format it to fat 32 this and that you guys know how to do this that's one of those things that uh, uh, should be self-explanatory but the biggest issue here is whether it's allowed uh, to use a usb external storage because when you think about it guys imagine if you worked for some company and there's some sensitive data on the computer and you take your own personal usb stick you plug it in and you just copy everything over of course it's going to be um, a big no-no okay moving on <clears throat> we got four more to work remember this one in the middle here is something that we're waiting on uh, when it comes to uh to see what's going on and the next one is isd 23 i'm going to click on this here it says i can't hear people on my headset and it says here specifically people can hear me in meetings but i can't hear them so this is issue not with the microphone but with their speaker on their headset specifically so again typical thing that we're that we kept doing that we are doing so far this is Irvin with help desk I can help you with headset issue may I take control of your computer to fix it or to resolve the issue or whatever you want to um, however you want to say it if so please send me your PC name or IP address 
Now, something, something that I haven't mentioned before, customer may need help with finding what their PC name is or IP address. Uh, I'm going to mention that real quickly here as I go and uh, as we go into the computer, into user's computer and check the settings for their headset. But we're going to do this, user's PC name is Kobuman1. We're going to stick to that. Okay, so here we are inside of the user's computer. We know that he can't hear them. They can hear him. So it's not a mic issue. It's just a speaker issue. So it's very simple. You go in here and if you click on the icon here of the audio icon next to the clock, you can simply make sure that it, that it is selected. In this case, we can see that speakers is selected Plantronics 610, which is good. If we right click it, we can go to sound settings. Inside of sound settings, we have to make sure that the output is selected as speakers Plantronics 610, uh, six, in this case, uh, C610, I'm sorry, and then that the input is indeed selected for the same headset. We can definitely double check that with the user to see if that's the correct one because they may have multiple things. What I like to do is go to actual sound control panel, which is right here, open it here, make sure there's nothing else installed. The way I check that is by right clicking in the blank space and click show disabled devices. There are no other devices on this computer enabled, so that's good. If there are, uh, consider right clicking and disabling it like this, so that way it doesn't conflict with the other one. But of course, make sure that the headset is enabled like this. Make sure that the microphone is enabled. You see how there is another thing here. We can ignore that because it's disabled. Check the microphone levels just to be sure if that's if everything else checks out here and you obviously saw that something else was selected as the output, which is the speakers, then you switch it to the headset and then it should work fine. If still not working, you may have to go inside of the app that they're using for uh, for their uh, for uh, for their meetings. So whether it's Zoom meeting, WebEx meeting, Google meeting, or Skype or whatever it is, go inside of that and check to make sure that the proper audio equipment is selected. In this case, Plantronics C160. So whatever their headset is, we're going to make sure that that's selected for input and output, microphone and speakers. Very, very self-explanatory. If you want to see a more detailed with an example, with a different example of actual software going inside a software and changing it, recently I made one about Zoom and I have one about WebEx as well. If you want to check that out, I do have that on my channel, but I don't want to go into that too much in this part of it because we are just working on the ticketing systems. So what we're going to do here, we're going to add internal note and say, I have configured the headset and tested. Make sure it's tested before you let the customer go. That's it. This is a very simple one, but very common one. We're going to close the ticket. Okay. Very simple one. Oldie but goodie. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't know why I said that. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, ISD24. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Uh-oh. We all know what that means. We all know what that means. Let me know if you know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> so, here we go. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Computer stops working randomly and shows me a blue screen with a smiley face. Blue screen with a smiley face. Let's see what that is, guys. Blue screen with smiley face. I'm just stalling here to give you guys <laughs> uh, with with sad, smiley face, sad face, I guess. 
<laughs> I'm stalling to give you guys a chance to tell me in the comments if you're watching this as a premiere of the, what the issue is. So, all right, I'm just going to play. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. This is a blue screen of death. Blue screen of death. So we're going to go back and we're just going to make sure uh, we're going to talk to the customer. What I would do is actually try to reach out to them um, kind of more uh, more personally in the sense that I would, well, would either probably call them and, and uh, talk to them and to make sure that it is indeed a blue screen of death. And I'm going to add internal note. I'm going to say talked to user and to confirm that the issue is blue screen of death. And then I'm going to recommend to user to recall mended to user sorry guys i'm getting tired <laughs> so i'm misspelling quite a bit to user to take computer for hardware diagnostic um to her local PC support. So, again, similar to what we had earlier, where computer just shuts down randomly, nothing happens, and where we talked about sending user to local PC support that will check on their, on their hardware. They're going to do hardware diagnostic because that's what it is. A blue screen of death, I found that 90% of the time is hardware related. And a lot of times it's RAM or hard drive. It, it can be other things as well, but it, nonetheless, it's hardware. We're going to want to test the hardware. As help desk, we really can't do a really good job when it comes to you know handling this type of stuff because help desk is just like, go, 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 go. Let's resolve these issues you know as quickly as possible. If we can't resolve it, um, quickly and in this case we don't we can't necessarily test your hardware properly unless we have specific tools given to us uh, there's nothing else we can do but to tell them that uh, somebody at their local office will have to take it their her local PC support is going to have to handle it or if the computer is under warranty uh, their technician HP technician Dell technician Lenovo technician will have to test it she may have to take it to their store or whatever it is. It depends on how it is set up for the business that you're working for. It's it's, it's as simple as that. And then I'm going to say routed ticket to local PC support. May not be the case. Maybe, it, you know, if, if, if we referred her to the vendor, then we, we want to specify that. Whatever the case is. My, whatever the case might be, it's definitely a um, hardware issue and we need to do a hardware diagnostic on it. Okay, moving on. I'm going to close this ticket. <clears throat> and go back. We got a couple of more to do. Next one is my email is not working by Mr. Mike Moser again. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. You will get this quite a bit. And um, if you guys want to guess, I'll pause briefly by talking about it. And you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets. But but first, uh, email's not working. I gotta assign it. assign it to myself so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid. When my boss look at, looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is, my email is not working. And then it says, Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you, why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in 
my premiere video. Why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be, I'm trying to open it here in a bigger, there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PCA Support. And by, you know, chances are uh, the Mike, Mike Moser here uh, already knows us and knows who we are. So maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case. But, you know, if you don't know them, keep doing it. It's part of the job. I have your... Sorry, guys. Ticket about email not working. Did you, by chance, change your password recently? So, guys, this is exactly what I'm suspecting here is that either his ex his password Mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the Windows some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can be for which you can change the password on just a website. Like one of the websites will use that single sign-on. That single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login. So when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on, also known as SSO, it's going to ask for your domain login. If your domain login's password expired that day, it's going to ask you to change that password. When you change your password on the website, your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away. What do I mean by that? Your computer that you're logged in, you're still logged in with your old password. So what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs. If you don't, you get this pop-up. This is what happens. And maybe also, maybe he locked himself out out of the computer. So we're going to concentrate on that. And with the reply, I suspect it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue. What we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password. Because maybe they forgot the password, typed it in 10 times, and then now they're locked out. And their Outlook doesn't have their current password, you know. But this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't, again, replicated on their local computer. The websites that use the password are fine, but the system itself hasn't received the new password. And that's the issue here, most likely. So we're going to go inside of Active Directory. And this is my virtual server here. And I'm just going to log in real quick here. I'm going to open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing Help Desk may have a web, just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as I'm doing right now. It may not give you direct access to Active Directory at all, which is normal, which is unfortunate, but it's normal. So you may have different means, but you are basically doing exactly what I'm doing, and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case. So what I like to do is, you see the uh, users folder on the right hand? So instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users. We don't know. So what I'm going to do is right-click the folder. I'm going to click Find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. 
And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right click him. Right click him. And then we're going to click reset password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you. Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he is locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your computer like this. Lock your computer, Mike. And then do Control-Alt-Delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop-up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system. It will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. What I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way it's going to ensure that everything in the background running, whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office, if you keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell them, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add external node here and say, resolve issue by password reset. I'm going to keep it simple like this. And this will resolve this issue. I guarantee it. Going to close the ticket as completed. All right, excellent. <clears throat> By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says I need help installing a print. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight through. We're almost, almost done here. I'm trying to install a printer, but it's not working. We're going to reply to the customer. I say, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. What kind of printer are you trying to add local printer or network printer now this can be confusing to to the user to the customer because what i'm actually trying to figure out 
it's actually are they at home are they working from home are they trying to add, add a local printer or are they trying to add a network printer which is actually in an, an office but to them network printer could also be a local printer sometimes they don't know you know but that's okay we're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on but we can also say also can you please send me your PC name with and you know what let's 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 hold off on this part of it because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial so if they first reply and say and usually I, I like to be more proactive but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault necessarily. this is just how human mind works they can't multitask if I'm asking you too many things at once it may be confusing so I'm gonna wait for them to reply to this and they may say well it's my local printer at home or it's printer at the office scenario number one local printer question number two are you allowed to install a printer local printer for somebody that works from home this is another security issue this has to be approved and allowed by your company you should know this or if you don't ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed whether you are allowed to install local printer for them and I'll show you how you can do that if it's a network printer then that should be no problem you know they some people are not allowed to print either depending who they are but chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office you know there's a, a there there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues so we got to be careful about this we got to find this out um, if possible I would call them and talk to them uh, if not I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we we need to find out but in this case let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply say okay in that case can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add let's do this I can add the printer for you however I need your PC name to take control remotely so you gotta word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're gonna do this so let's kind of go over it again. Okay, I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control of, control remotely. And can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? So of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name. And I didn't want to say, can you send me your PC name or IP address? Because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer and I don't want there to be any confusion on the customers part I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer IP address of the printer as possible but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a you understand manner once we get this information we're gonna to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson and the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed we're gonna go to the search bar and you can get to this 
through the control panel as well but I'm going to say devices and printers here we go printers and scanners devices and printers we want to get to here guys this is this is where you can see device number and I'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what I call Mickey Mouse version of Windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one we can simply click here the printer I uh, here I'm looking for the pl the printer that I want isn't listed other way of going to this here is control panel devices and printers here and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before this is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here it's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers so every device you know whether it's a USB or or whatnot or monitor or you know the headset that we talked about earlier and of course if there are any printers they will be listed here but of course there is a button guess where we need to go we're going to click on the add printer and this is the same thing we looked at earlier but this is just how it looks like that's how it used to look like before before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff you know and uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing which doesn't make sense to me why not just keep it the way it is where it's just one place for one thing you know anyways that's a different video okay so it's not gonna find anything what I'm gonna do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed so same thing we did earlier and then here you can add the printer multiple ways where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer blah 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 select anything that you want but in this case we're going to select an network printer which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer and here we're just going to type it in for example 168.2.1 whatever it's whatever the static IP address is for that printer it's gonna to have to be a static IP address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we got to have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're gonna leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use what that does it pings the printer and says hey I'm trying to add you but do you have a driver and then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer it's gonna have that driver it's gonna automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it you know same thing when you're adding a local printer you may have to download the driver install the driver but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer you know once you click next it may if it doesn't find if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to uh, nothing's going to happen here so I can't really show you this at this time but what happens it's it's going to say okay I found this IP address I know it's a printer there but which one is it and then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model like for example Xerox blah 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is that, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect so if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically you're gonna have to ask the user can you tell me the name and model of that printer so that way you can get those drivers and install them properly once you do that it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default kind of like this so if you see one like that just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants he or she wants and then make sure it's set as default see it have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle okay and now we're going to add a external or internal note I should say added printer as requested Irvin and I'm going to close the ticket and the last one we have there 
remember is the one that we're waiting to see if anything else is going on with that so remember this is the one we worked on earlier about and there were there are no issues at the moment and I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours um, in case it goes down again guys thank you so much for watching um, I don't know how long this is gonna be I'm suspecting about two hours I appreciate you stopping by watching and I appreciate your nice comments I appreciate your uh, support clicking the like button sharing the video telling your friends about me and all that I, I, I can't express how much I appreciate that and how much I enjoy making these videos hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobo man in today's video it's all about help desk we're going to learn how to use an example ticketing system and I'm going to also show you four different examples of a phone call that you might get as a help desk employee these phone calls will show you how to handle the calls and also how to troubleshoot the call it's very good video for those trying to get into help desk as a starting point in their IT career guys Please take a one second to click the like button. This way I'm not going to play ad at this point at all. But you clicking the like button really makes a difference for my video. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Let's get into it. This video is designed for new people to help desk tier 1 or tier 2. What we will learn in this video is how to create a ticket and how to work a ticket in a ticketing system keep in mind there are many many different ticketing systems out there available and uh, a lot of them are proprietary meaning the company that you work for will have their own ticketing system but lately or uh, most recently they've all been web-based just like this third-party ticketing system that I'm about to show you and when it comes to navigation working the tickets and this and that it should be very uh, very much the same as you would do when you work for somebody else so this is going to be very educational for people who are about to start working on a help desk or just tech support where they use a ticketing system so let's get back to the first thing we need to do we're going to create a ticket in this ticketing system but we have to familiarize ourselves keep in mind you are new at the company and you've never experienced this before chances are you don't know what to do you don't know what to uh, look for well this is typically what it looks like you have a system that's open like this uh, typically web-based and then on the left hand side you got few different tabs that you can select first one is the main queue what you're looking at here and when i click on all open and what shows in the middle is all tickets that are open currently these are tickets that come through and then next one is assigned to me and if we click on you can see that you haven't been assigned any tickets whatsoever and then if we click on unassigned issues you can also see there however if you keep if you go back to the all open that means they are all there that means that there haven't been worked yet even if it's been assigned so and then of course we have incidents down here and it's going to be based off a type of ticket and then we got service requests changes and problems so these are all different categories for these tickets that are there now not to confuse you or to lose you let's go ahead and create a ticket because this will show you what the ticketing system is about so let's say uh, this reporter here, which is Kobuman1, he is the user that reported all three of these issues. These are all issues that he has. So let's see how he did that. So he went to a system, and he's got a probably similar system uh, that, he, that we see here, and then he clicked on create a ticket or submit a new ticket. And the first thing that they're going to do is select an issue type, which is right here. Don't ignore this part where it says project this is just because i'm an admin to this so ignore this what they're going to look at first is issue type this is what's going to ask you and they're going to either have a drop down here or they're going to be able to type in the type of issue that they have so they can just type in report an incident and if they select that for example that's what was going to be selected so whatever it is that they have chances are there's either a an article on how to fix it themselves if it's like some kind of a minor software issue but they in general they will have a way to search for their problem and once they do they will come across that problem they would select it so for example 
if they would just type in get see help it's going to show up and then they can select that at the same time if they type in like for example name of the website or a program it's going to find that as well and then they can select that and that way it's going to be routed to the support team for that specific application website system or software you see that it's very self-explanatory so and the next thing once they figure out what the problem is and select the correct issue type here they can type in the title of it and it's kind of confusing here that where it says summary but it's actually just uh, a title so let's go ahead and pretend that this is a test ticket and we're just going to type in test so that way we have uh, a good so we can track it so we can see how it shows up in the system and then we're going to type in test again because we're just learning how to create a ticket right here and it's going to be very simple if we scroll down there will be other uh, things you can put in there for example a user can attach a, a screenshot and if they click here they can just add it you know browse it this and that typical they would upload a screenshot of the error if they have and then they can select the component and then if they're savvy enough they'll be able to figure out okay well what is the issue about and they would select that so let's say they you know some kind of actor directory issue they can just select that and then assignment here you can see that it's automatic we can leave that this is some of those one of those admin uh, issues and this is not uh, what uh, a user would see and then you can also uh, create a ticket on behalf of somebody else so I'm going to create a ticket on behalf of Koboman one which is the same person that reported the previous issues that way um, if uh, if a user is not able to create a ticket for themselves, you can do it on their behalf as well. Another reason to create a ticket is to also keep track of internal things that you do and you need a record of it. So, you know, doing tickets just as an internal part of uh, what you do is a good way to uh, uh, just have a record of uh, some kind of change that you've done on a computer or PC or whatever. And then next thing we have is priority. Um, uh, well, actually, we do have approvers, but this is related to whether somebody needs to be approved, for example, to have an access to a specific server, uh, whether they're approved to have email or instant messenger, or even if they're approved to uh, get new software or if they're approved to get new hardware, right? So, and then we have priority here. And priority is kind of self-explanatory. If a big website is down, chances are they're going to select the highest priority or you know it's if it's affecting a lot of people they can just select highest priority but if it's nothing big they can just select lowest priority or whatever you know and then of course urgency is uh, also kind of similar to that which would I don't know why they have it twice but you know if it's a website down it's going to be of course critical and then it's going to impact a lot of people impact very uh, important if it's a lot of uh, people it's critical and it's the highest priority it's going to be expensive widespread if it's just one user requesting something it's going to be minor so and then pending reason this is um, if you're working on a ticket and then you need a pending reason why it needs to be approved this and that like for example somebody's requesting something um, uh, that they would deal with that product categorization and this and that this is usually automatically populated by uh, the system itself users wouldn't typically deal with any of this they would just put in a basics you know ticket and then you would have to figure this out if it needs to be uh, you know if it needs to be um, uh, dealt with or categorized uh, there is a category here optional categorization we can just select connectivity in case we are working with you know a big system downage and then of course there are labels and you can create your own labels you know okay and then we're going to click create ticket now we can see on the right side that there's a notification that came up that's typical in a ticketing system. If you're working the system, if you have it open, you would get a notification that the ticket came through. So if we refresh this, if I click on all open, it's going to refresh it. It may take a second here, but it's going to populate with the new ticket we just uh, submitted. It depends on how fast the cloud is or the storage. Uh, where the uh, the ticketing system is at, it may take a moment to come up. Uh, let me let me hit the refresh button here, and uh, there it is. There is our test email, and at the same time, you and your group, including the user as well, will get an email notification that a ticket came through, and uh, 
and that would look some that would look something uh, like this. Here's our three other tickets that are already in the system. The other one just came through as you saw. So you can see that there is a new ticket that came. So you get a uh, desktop notification, and then you get email notification. All right. Now we learned how to create a ticket. That's very simple. Now let's go ahead and uh, work a ticket. Here's a really good one we can uh, pick. So once you're in the main uh, queue, is what they call here, uh, you can just pick any of the tickets and assign it to yourself if you're allowed to do so. Typically, that's what happens. You can pick up tickets, work them, or sometimes a manager assigns a ticket to you. But this time, we have the permission to assign tickets to ourselves, so we're going ahead and do that. We're going to select this middle one, and then we're going to assign it to ourselves. This is going to be slightly different, uh, you know, depending on the type of software you use. But typically, what you want to look for is something like this, where it says assignee. I want to click on that, and then I'm going to assign it to me. I'm going to click on that. And sometimes there's a save button or this and that. This particular system doesn't, and it's just going to assign it automatically. So let's go ahead and go back to our queue, which is click on all open here. And we can see now that it's assigned to me. And uh, I'm going to go back to it, and then we're going to now work it. So how would you do this? There are a few ways of, of working a ticket. Uh, this is going to depend on a preferred contact method that the user has. If we look at this ticket, uh, it's not very detailed, right? And if we click on here, view request in portal, uh, you know, a lot of times it would open it up and there will be more information here, but it kind of looks the same as the other one. So we're just going to go back here. The thing is, though, a lot of systems would specify what type of preferred contact method they would have. For example, I prefer to be contacted with email or uh, there would be their email address there or something like that. I prefer to be contacted with IM or, or do I prefer to be contacted by the phone. So user would typically specify that and, you know, there would be more stuff uh, detailed information about them. This system, unfortunately, doesn't have that information. The only thing we have is ability to reply to customer directly here. So this is what we're going to do. It says here, the issue is I have two monitors, both have the same picture. So that means that it's a configuration issue and we can help them deal with that. Uh, if, if they are outside of your company, let's say you're doing tech support, you know, for somebody else in a different state, you're not on site, you're not there to help them. You can simply say, if you've never worked with this uh, person before, you can say, hello, my name is Irvin at, with tech support, tech support at STL. Missouri. So, you know, you want to tell them, hey, my name is Irvin. Uh, I'm with tech support or whatever your name may be. And I am at this location. So that way they know that you are, uh, you know, that person. It's an introduction. It's a simple introduction. And then you can say, I have your ticket about a monitor. Right? And it's simple. You tell them who you are, where you at, and that you have their ticket about a monitor. This is what you typically do if you're contacting them first time through email or through, like, for example, instant messenger, or even if you call them. This is something you, you have to let them know who you are and why you're calling them, or why you're contacting them. Since this is a message through the system, through the ticketing system, you don't necessarily have to introduce yourself because they know that the system that they submitted a ticket through, uh, somebody is reaching out to them because of that, right? And then, you know, if you can help, I mean, this is a remote type of thing. If you can take control of their uh, PC and resolve this issue for them, that would be ideal. But if you don't, well, I mean, what can you do? Um, well, you can just at least suggest, uh, have you tried, you know, what is it, expanding? your desktop onto second monitor. That's usually the problem when it comes to this, right? And this is one of those things that you can ask the customer. If you can take control of their computer, that would be ideal. However, if you happen to be on site, if you happen to be on site, that would be even better. So um, you can say, may I 
stop by to take take a look when would be good for you so that way you can do go there directly and just resolve the issue and then now we're going to just click save this should send an email to the customer and uh you know that should reach out to the customer in some way, whether it's they having to have the system up and they get a notification or they would get an email uh, from the system saying, hey, uh, this tech guy, Kobo Man, is trying to reach out to you. This guy named Irvin actually is trying to reach out to you or both. Usually it would be both. So they would get a communication from you. So the next thing you would do is add an internal note, means uh, that's a, a note for you and the people that work for you or the, not the work for you or with you if they want to know what's going on with that ticket they can look up your ticket and see that you have reached out to user and awaiting feedback All right so you can be more detailed about this this is just a basic navigation and notage of a ticket. So what we have done here is reached out to the customer. We have created an internal note so that everybody can see that what you've worked on and what kind of work you've done when it comes to this ticket. So let's say your manager is like, hey, uh, what's going on with this ticket? They can look it up and see what you've done, you know? And um, if it's, if it's uh, something you can resolve on site, you can say uh, configured dual monitor and then click save and now since you've resolved the issue we have configured the dual monitor at this point it's resolved now we can close the ticket right we can go ahead and close it and in this case we have to go over here on the right hand side where it says waiting for support if we click on that it gives you a bunch of different options for the status of the ticket you know you can see that whether you escalated a ticket uh, you know, waiting for support, canceled or completed. We're going to set it to completed. Sometimes it would say resolved or this and that. And now the ticket is completed and closed. And by the way, notice this little eyeball here. That's a watch option. That means how many people are actually viewing and watching this ticket. We can see that both of these guys are watching this ticket. So that means how many people are viewing it and working on it, which is kind of useful actually. So that way you can be like, hey, you know, ping them or, you know, send them a message. Hey, are you working on this too? You know, this and that. And uh, all right, let's move on to uh, another ticket that we can look at. And then if we click on all open tickets here, it's going to bring us back to the, the queue. We can see now that the other ticket is gone. It's, it's simply gone. It's closed and you'll no longer see it in the queue. Uh, but we do have other tickets we can work on. So let's do one more, which is a bit different. And this is a website down um, ticket. So this is kind of important. Our website is down. We can't access our main website. And then we can see that the urgency is critical. So of course, we're going to have to prioritize these critical tickets. Now, let me see, does this system actually say in the queue anywhere that it's a critical? It doesn't. So the only indicator you have here is on the left hand side, it's kind of these icons. And you know, this is kind of unfortunate. Uh, that I couldn't show you that that you know um, there there might be some other indicator that it's a critical issue. All you got to do is all the only thing you can do is go by whatever the summary is or whatever the title of the ticket is. So you kind of have to use your own judgment. In our case, I wouldn't have worked the first ticket first at all. I would have worked this one first. So you got to prioritize that. It's very important. But once we click on it now, we can see that it's critical. So of course we're going to um, contact them again, but before we do that, since this is a critical, we may want to um, do something else real quick. And this is going to depend on, on your business, whether you're the only one working there or whether you actually want other people involved. So there are options for that as well. And if you look on the right hand side here, we can add participants. If we click here and add participants, if your manager, for example, is Joe, uh, Joe Joe Schmo <laughs> Schmo did I spell that Joe Schmo let's do that Joe Schmo we're going to add him and then he can watch or even if we have Bob it's a boy 
uh, you know, as a coworker and he's working with you as well, we can add them as participants so they can follow what's going on, right? So that's pretty cool here as well. And then we can have, um, let's go ahead and work this ticket real quick. I'm going to reply. And again, there are no other way to contact them. So I have to contact them through the system. Otherwise, I would have called them, uh, messaged them, and this and that. And then what I would do here in this case, and this is just an example so we can work the ticket, but there are many things that you might want to ask when it's a big issue like this. Uh, the first thing usually I would say is, uh, how many, I would say, people are impacted. You don't want to say users. Usually that's something that IT would use within itself. You would want to say how many people are impacted. And then uh, when was the last time it worked? Are you using the correct link? you know, stuff like that, that would help you resolve this a big of an issue, right? And then later on, uh, you know, if you do realize that it really is a big issue like this uh, support team um, for this specific website that they may be uh, talking about uh, may need more information. For example, host names, IP addresses, this and that. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, typically, you would want more, but you would have to know what the website is and this and that. And this is just going to be depending on the work environment that you're at. Here we are learning how to use the system, not necessarily resolve issues uh, because we don't have enough information, right? So we're here learning how to use a ticketing system and that's that. And then of course you add internal note right away and says contacted user with uh, requesting, I'm sorry, requesting more information. Now, this is an internal note, and this means that only you and the people that work the system can only see it. So you can say user this time because we are talking to IT people who might read this. This is for your own note, work note, uh, internal note, and for the people that are IT, user cannot see this at all. So it's okay to say user. Okay, now that we're waiting on that, of course, is a priority. This is something you would actively work on, but we're just going to leave it like it is for now. Now, let's see. Uh, the, the, there are different issues. There are different options here for the, this ticket right now, and that's because the issue is literally selected as a problem. Now we have different things, and this is going to you know depend on the type of work environment that you're working at, and then. Uh, you can see that now we have an option just to, just to close it, but that's only if it's resolved and then there's cancel and then there's under review. I'm not sure why it would be under review. That's kind of a weird option to have in a ticketing system, but I guess it could be related to some kind of an access request uh, for something. But the fact that it's just reported as a problem is kind of confusing. Anyways, now we know how to create tickets how to work tickets, and how to assign them, which, by the way, we haven't done here, so we haven't assigned it to ourselves. Maybe that's why the option there was a bit different. Well, maybe not. Anyways, again, there are many, many different uh, ticketing systems, many third-party systems, and you just have to kind of adjust to them accordingly. So let's go back and see what else is open. We can see that this one here is assigned to me, that I'm uh, working on it. Let's see. On the next tab, assigned to me, it says zero now, but now it shows up as one because it took a little bit to refresh. And then we got other tabs that you can get into, but these are the basics. These are the basics of working and working a ticketing system that you must know before going to work for a help desk of any sort. And of course, you can look at your own statistics here, and that option is not here, but I think if I click here, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. Cues. Back to projects. Usually managers can only see reports, but then maybe we can view some reports here. Reports, workload, and yeah, so if you're a manager or, or sometimes even as just a tier one help desk, you may be able to see your own uh, progress. And here it is. You can see that I have one issue uh, that I've resolved. Any more detailed? So yeah, that, that just allows you to you know look up other people's tickets, uh, satisfactions. These are all statistics that managers only look at. 
Of course, you want to SLA is also you know those metrics of how fast you resolve issues, this and that. But what I taught you so far are the basics you need to work the system as an IT help desk tier one. So let's go ahead and look at what happened during this phone call and then we're going to stop it in real time and then I'm going to show you what happens on the back end. So meaning that what is going on with the person working help desk while they're talking to the user. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. Uh, what can I assist you with today? Hi, I, uh, I, I, for some reason I can't log in to Outlook. Outlook keeps asking me for a password. I don't know why. I, uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. Sure. Does it, um, does it uh, give you an issue whenever you try to log in anything else, or is this just this specific system? Uh, let me, let me try. I, I think it's just Outlook, but I'm not sure. I don't even know why Outlook keeps asking me for the password, but I think it's just Outlook. Let me try something else. Oh yeah, yeah. This, um, oh yeah, this other system is also giving me problems. It keeps asking for the password. I don't know why. I did have a little trouble, uh, like I may have like mistyped the password this morning. Okay, well, no problem. Let me, uh, let me look up your account. Uh, what is your login ID for this? My login ID is Irvin underscore uh, C-A-N. Okay, all right, I got it pulled up here. All right, let's pause that for a minute. Now we know the name of this user, so let's go ahead and look it up in Active Directory to see what's going on with his account. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. I really appreciate that. That way I don't have to play any ads for you here and that way you are supporting my channel. It only takes one second. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So let's go ahead and click find now. And here it is. We found the user, we can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in, so the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or okay, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. It wouldn't take my password. I, I, I recently changed it. I think I changed it like a couple of days ago. So I may have mistyped it a couple of times. Is that why? Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, if, if you mistype password once, you don't want to keep trying it. Usually it locks out after you try more than three times. Uh, but it's not a problem. I can unlock you. Uh, would you like me to reset the password as well? Or do you just uh, want to give it a shot without me resetting if you it? Can, uh, if you can unlock me, that would be great. I'd like to see if I can. Because uh, I don't feel like changing the password again. You know how it is. It's like you, you try to like come up with a new password and then it, it's like you're just sitting there trying to figure out well which one do i want to use this time like you know so uh, yeah if you can just unlock me that would be great okay no problem i uh i have it unlocked right now i want to want to give it a shot and see if it works all right hold on let me uh let me try this here okay I I think I'm good now. Outlook came up now, and it's uh, okay. It looks yeah, okay. My new <laughs> emails are coming through. So, okay, great. Uh, that's good. I I thank you so much. I appreciate. That. All right, no problem, no problem. I'm I'm glad to help. I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No, that is all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you 
fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that, you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here since we found it already we don't have to dig through the actor directory a lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it you don't have to dig and kind of like you know your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user you can just find it here and then right click and reset password and we're going to change the password to something temporarily And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. Today's video, we take a look at a call handling for help desk tier one, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it. This way, I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the back end in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video, guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling Help Desk Tier 1 Support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something you can help me with this? For some reason, it's just so slow today that I can't do anything. No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday. And then today, for some reason, it's just very, very sluggish. I can't do anything. I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job. All right, no problem. I can have a look uh, to see what's going on. Can you give me your PC name? My PC name? Uh... Yeah, it should be it should be under your PC information, or even there might be a, a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that. That it, it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters. If you can give me that, please, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I think I see it here. Um, it says T M. C three five six five eight three zero. All right, thank you very much for that, uh, sir. Do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment? I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you. Sure, go ahead. All right, let's pause the phone call just for a second here. So the user is talking about a slow computer. So it's a slow computer situation. So what is the major reason for a slow computer? In a business environment, most of the time when a computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight, but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used, meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used. But chances are if the computer was turned off, shut down, asleep or any of those reasons, 
it probably couldn't install these updates. So now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue. Of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software and chances are there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that. That that's not usually what happens in a business. That's something that home computers may have issues with. For a business type of computer, they're going to be up to spec, and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates. Of course, there is another reason, you know, being a virus, but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely, it's unbelievable. So, updates, main thing. Let's get back to the customer and tell them about that. All right, sir. So, what I found is that uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So, at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish uh, Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once we reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens and uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, if that doesn't work then uh, we can help you further see if that works all right I'll give it a shot um, all right I'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens all right great thank you so much for doing that I appreciate that Okay, looks like I'm. Uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and log in, and we'll see how it goes. Now, keep in mind, we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning, but it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards, it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right. Let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right. I'm checking. All right. So far, so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. Uh, I don't. Okay. Yeah. It, it it seems to be fine now. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and uh, a couple other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing. No problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay. Okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It it's uh I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever computers shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off cuz sometimes the computer won't even update properly even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer. And uh, that, you know, that should uh, kind of be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right. Will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye-bye. All right, guys, let's get into it. But first, real quick, please take one second to click that like button. This way I'm not going to play any ads at this point. This makes a huge difference for me. I really appreciate your help on this. Thank you so much. And now let's listen to the call. And then after that, during the call, we're going to pause in the middle of it and I'll show you how to fix this WebEx issue. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hey, this is Bob. I, uh, I have, I'm having trouble with my um, uh, WebEx meeting. The audio doesn't work. I'm trying to use my headset, but I, I don't know what's going on. It's just that I've been told that... Uh, they can hear me, but I can't hear them, or something's going on with, with my headset. I'm, I'm trying to use it for this WebEx, either, like, it doesn't matter if I create a meeting, 
or join a meeting, there's always the same issue with the headset. I can't, and it's a new headset I just got from my boss, I'm trying to use it here, and uh, it's just it's just giving me trouble. Is this something you can help me out with? I sure can. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, get your uh, PC name real quick. There should be a, a PC information uh, on your computer for that. It's it's uh, it could be a computer name or a workstation name. There might be even a sticker on your computer. Can you please give me that? Sure, uh, here it is. It's uh, 35C3TO578. Thank you very much for that. Do you mind if I take control of your computer just for a moment? I want to have a look and see what's going on. Sure thing, go ahead. No problem. Now, just real quick, I want to make sure the type of headset that you have, is it a USB one or is it the one that has two prongs or uh, two connectors, if you will? So it's usually it's... Uh, um, if it's just a standard one, it's going to have one that's red and the other one is black and you plug it in usually in the front of the PC or is it just a USB one? I have one of those that's just a USB one. Alright, no problem. I'm, ta I'm taking a look right now. Alright, let's pause the phone call here for a moment so we can troubleshoot, so I can show you how I would troubleshoot this. He mentions uh, audio issues, so every time somebody mentions audio issues, I would definitely look at the audio settings inside the computer. And noticed, I specifically asked him if he has a USB type of uh, headset or if it's just one of those standard ones with two plugs. And uh, he said he has a USB one, so we're just going to use that knowledge as our starting point. Alright, let's look at the system settings. We're going to right click on our speaker icon here. I'm going to select open sound settings. These are Windows 10 sound settings. I'm not a big fan of this. It is pretty simple and yes, you can do some troubleshooting in here, but I prefer to click on the sound control panel here, which is the old school way of pulling up and troubleshooting system sound settings for Windows operating systems. So I'm gonna minimize this WebEx here just so I can get that out of the way and not distract you with it. So as in, uh, the first thing we see here is that we have Realtek high definition audio. This is one of those audio systems that will be on pretty much every computer that has Windows operating system. I guarantee you that if you open up sound settings on your computer right now, you will have a Realtek high definition audio. And we know that this is default sound for that PC, meaning that everything that's built into the computer is going to use this and everything that is plugged into it as in specifically microphone or a headset through the regular 3.5 millimeter connector it's going to use Realtek so we can ignore that part of it right now because we're not going to use it we have to concentrate on a USB headset and he specifically you said the USB the only other thing that shows up here is this Plantronics C610 which is a USB headset and you can see there's a little you know there's a green check mark here that means that right now that Realtek is set as default I'm going to go ahead and change this Plantronics to default I'm going to select it I'm going to click set as default now I know for sure that everything on the system is going to use this playback audio as in speaker as default so we changed our speakers to Plantronics C610 which is the headset itself there is nothing else there so we know for sure that that is the headset that he is using now let's go ahead and click on recording here this is going to be set up for our microphone and here we go again we can see that he has a microphone either built in or plugged in somehow but you know, if it's a laptop, chances are that it's just a built-in microphone, and it's again set to Realtek. We don't want that. We want to set it to our Plantronics, and we're going to set it as default. Now, you don't necessarily want to do this as set it, set things up as a default, depending on preference of the customer. But a lot of times, to make sure that the issue doesn't uh, repeat itself. This is what I like to do is set their main audio to default, whatever that might be. And I will, of course, double check that with the customer as well. So now I know that my microphone is set to the Plantronics, which is the headset. And also our speaker is set to Plantronics, which is the headset. I'm going to click OK. So now everything else that comes up should be using that as default. Now let's look at the WebEx. Now, keep in mind, WebEx is kind of tricky when it comes to setting up audio. If I click on the little cog here and I click, you know, just to click on it to see 
what are the settings? Where are the settings here for the WebEx? And of course, you can see this that there is a preference. And once you open it up, you assume that the audio settings would be here, but they are not, unfortunately. You can see that there is account, my personal room, meeting, join, phone numbers, calendars, notifications, video system, but nothing talks about the audio. The audio is actually um, set up when you start a meeting or join a meeting. So let's go ahead and click start a meeting and this is going to launch our little start a meeting pop-up. So with the start meeting enabled here, I know our pop-up comes up, we can see there are some things here that are flipping through and we can see that the, this is the audio setting right here. We're gonna look at that here in a moment, but let's look at this real quick. You see how it says here, use computer for audio. A lot of times if you have a desk phone, like one of those physical desk phones that are just sitting on your desk, there chances are there might be some kind of integration there and that uh, you want to make sure that it's not detected because you can use a desk phone for uh, WebEx meetings and, and whatnot, especially if it's a Cisco phone, uh, usually I, uh, over IP phone, which all the new phones are. But in our case, we want to make sure that use computer for audio is selected. And uh, let's go ahead and select on our settings here that are kind of flipping through. We're going to click on that and see what we have. And here we have to make a minor change and change the uh, microphone here to make sure that it reflects our Plantronics headset. So we're going to select Plantronics headset or you can click use system settings. I prefer just to click it uh, microphone uh, Plantronics. So if you're going to set up WebEx only and only WebEx to use this headset, you would make sure that it's selected to the microphone and not use system settings. So in case you want to use system settings defaults for something else, um, basically what I'm saying is you can configure WebEx only to use the headset as well. Again, I'm going to double check this with the customer to see what his preferences are. All right, let's get back to the phone call. All right, sir, so it, it looks like there's uh, just a configuration issue with the audio. The headset is probably working just fine. I went ahead and made the changes in the system and the WebEx make sure that this is all set to use the headset most of the time. Now just keep in mind if you're going to use your PC speakers or if you have speakers connected to it, these, these settings may have to be changed back. But right now I set your headset to default so that way it's always going to use that for the time being. Um, if you'd like I can change it, I can only change, I can just change WebEx to use it and nothing else? No, no, that's fine. I don't use the speakers at all. I headset is fine. I don't want people to hear me talking anyways or hear hear what other people are saying on the meeting anyways. All right, no problem. I'll go ahead and leave it like that so it's all set to default now and it should work. Do you want to give it a shot and test it out? Sure. Let me uh let me get my coworker over here. I'm going to start a meeting real quick and test it uh, with her. Hey Susan. You mind testing this with me? All right, thank you. Go ahead and join. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you fine too. Awesome, all right, cool. Thank you, thank you for testing this with me. Hello? Yeah, um, it's working. It's working fine now, so uh, th thanks for fixing that for me. It was, it was so annoying. Every time I joined the meeting, it just didn't work. No problem, I'm glad to help. Um, is there anything else I can assist you with today? No, that's it. Uh, you've been great help. Thank you so much. You bet. You have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, guys. Another successful help desk tier one phone call handled like an IT professional. And this is an example of a help desk or a call center phone call in which you deal with an angry customer. So this is incredibly important to know because you got to have the skill in order to resolve their issues. Sometimes a customer is so angry that you got to deal with it in a special way so that way you can resolve his issue without it being escalated to your manager. So this is an incredibly important video, not just technically and I'll show you what the problem is with the computer, but also in a way to deal with it. So it's a social video in a sense. All right, guys, let's have a look but before we do that please take one second to like my video this really makes a huge difference and that way i'm not going to play any ads for you so what's going to happen i'm going to show you the customer's phone call an example phone call and then i'm going to pause the video and show you how to i fix it and most of all on how i dealt with this angry customer again thank you so much for your support and let's enjoy thank you for calling tech support my name is Irvin. how can i help you today 
oh my god, look, I need you to fix my computer, all right? Look, everything is broken. I can't open anything. All right, sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you with this. What seems to be uh, the, the issue? Yeah, what are I'm you, trying are you... to open up these Word documents. Oh, all my Excels, nothing is working. It's just it, the, the icons kind of changed. I, I don't know. When I click on it, nothing happens. It just doesn't want to. Look, I need this fixed right away because I got important things to do, all right? All right, sure, sir, hey, sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you. I'm sure we'll fix this for you. Just uh, uh, just give me a few moments here. Right? I hate to do this to you, but can you please give me the PC name? That way I can help you as fast as, I, as, fast as possible, all right? That way I can possibly take over your computer and just do it for you, all right? P PC name? What is this PC name thing? Well, there should, sir, there should be uh, um, an icon or on your desktop or something that says PC information or maybe a sticker on the computer that with a PC name. All right, all right. Let me let me see. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Oh, I I, I see it. I see it. I see a sticker here. All right, great, sir. Can you please give me that? That way I can just help you real quick. All right, it's uh three five seven zero C O T A F L. All right, thank you, sir, very much for that. All right, all right, I'm going to make sure that I look at your computer. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, request to take control of your computer, and all you got to do is just click accept if there's a pop-up or anything like that. Just make sure you click accept on that. All right, all right, all right. All right, I see it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for accepting that. All right, I'm going to have a look now, and I'm going to fix it for you. All right, don't worry. Just, just hang tight, please. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's pause the phone call for just a moment to see what's going on here. And you can see that the customer here is trying to open these documents and it just keeps asking for something to open it with. Uh, these are Excel and Word type of documents. You can see they are uh, extension on them is ODT and ODS. These are basically um, uh, open office type of documents. They can also be opened with regular Microsoft Office, but in this case, we're just going to reinstall open office in this and this is going to resolve the issue. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Of course, in a business type of environment, you would have a different type of tool. But in my case, I'm just going to install the executable that I've downloaded with OpenOffice, and this will fix it. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for holding. Look, I, I found the problem for you. Uh, I just need a few moments to fix it, but I guarantee you I will fix it for you. The thing is, though, the uh, Microsoft uh, Office or uh, the software basically used to... Uh, open these programs for you uh, is removed for some reason. I'm going to have to reinstall it. Unfortunately, this may need a restart. Oh my God. Sir, I'm really sorry, but I guarantee you this will fix it. Um, it. It may restart, it may not, but if it does, it shouldn't take too long, but I guarantee you will fix it, all right? So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reinstall it and then it should work for you. Just give me a moment here. All right, fine. All right, sir, I'm initiating it right now. It's happening, and uh, it, what I'm just kind of waiting for it to install, um, just you know, just ask you real quick, do you need to save anything just in case the computer decides to reboot on you? Because a lot of times when you install these big programs, it likes to reboot for some reason. I don't want you to lose anything else, you know? All right, let me check. Uh, yeah, I don't No, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Go ahead, go ahead, you're fine, you're fine. All right, sir, thank you very much. And thank you again for being patient with me. I guarantee you this will fix it for you. You just need a few moments and possible restart, but it should be good to go. And uh, hopefully this, co this computer is fast, so that way we can get back to them real quick. So I'm just going to keep clicking Next. And so far it's going really quick. And again, a uh, business you work for may have different type of tool that deploys these type of applications. You might want to go in there and do a repair or whatnot if it is Microsoft Office. But in this case, um, it is open Office. But... Either way, we're going to resolve the issue. All right, that was really quick, which is good. That means we can get back to the customer real quick. And you can see now that we can open these uh, just documents. These are just fake documents that I created for the sake of video. And you can see now that it's working. All right, let's get back to the customer. It looks, oh, well, it looks like it installed and uh, I don't see any reboot uh, requirements. So I think you're good to go. Um, you want to check it out before I? Let me uh, Let me have a look real quick. All right. all right, all right, looks good, all right, good, all right, thanks, thanks, man, I appreciate that. All right, no problem, sir, I, you know, I, I understand the frustration, it, it happens, but, you know, you're good to go now. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, nah, I'm good, thanks. All right, thank you for calling Tech Support, you have a good day. All right, you too, bye. Bye-bye.
there you go, my friends. That's how you handle a, an angry customer. I, uh, I made this video as best as I can in order to show you guys how to do it because it is kind of awkward to, uh, uh, I guess, pretend to be the tech support and pretend to be the customer as well in order to create this type of video. So I hope it came out good. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I also like to see when people just say hi. I really like that too. And uh, if you want to check out my channel, I have a bunch of different videos on help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, and all kinds of other IT stuff that you can learn from. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to another session for Help Desk Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, and Desktop Support Training. In this series that I'm creating, I have trouble tickets that come through the system and we work them together, fix them, and I also go into extensive explanations on how to go about it. So it's not just a simple fix and move on, but also talk about proactive things that you can learn from and actually expand your knowledge on. So this is really good video for those especially who are looking to get into help desk for the first time as well. All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button and if possible, share the video as well. I really appreciate it. It really means a lot to me. All right, let's get right into it. And we're going to work the first ticket here that says can't, cannot add a printer. And it just says error dot dot dot. And this issue is coming from our friend Mike Moser. If you're familiar with my video series, you know that Mike Moser has a lot of computer issues. So we're going to work that work his ticket again. Uh, and he says here, when I tried to add a printer, I get attached error. So let's see what this error is. And here we go. It's a big error. It says Windows can't open add printer. The local print spooler service is not running. Please restart the spooler or restart the machine. So I know that a lot of you who are watching this, who already know a lot of things about help desk, you probably learn about print spooler service. What that means usually is that you can't add a printer because the service has been stopped. And yes, you can simply enable the service. But why does this error come up to begin with? The reason for it usually is if a company decides to put restrictions on using the printer or adding the printer to certain users, to certain groups within the company. The reason for that is security. They don't want you to just necessarily add a printer and start to print secure stuff that belongs to the company. For example, account numbers, uh, personal information, all of that stuff is a security risk unless you have a type of job within that company that requires you to do this. So printing is usually very restricted in a lot of organizations and this is the error that you would get when you try to add a printer. So let's see what that looks like. Devices printers and scanners devices man they have so many different ways of getting to this point within windows 10 before it used to be simple you just go to add a new device or something like that so here is our printers and scanners in windows 10 so if we click add a printer and um, it's gonna what it does right now it just kind of looks for a available printer that's available on the network or locally if there is nothing there and if you're installing it for the first time, chances are nothing will come up. You may get a list of network printers that are available, but the chances are it may not be something that's right next to you. So let's say you work for a company that has, you know, two large buildings. Let's say it's just one building and there are three different floors and all of those floors have all together have 10 different printers. You will get a list of 10 different printers. And if they're not labeled correctly, you won't necessarily be able to add a correct printer. You don't want to add a printer when you work on first floor, uh, but you add a printer that's on a third floor. You know, that doesn't make sense. So what usually happens, and this time nothing came up because there, there are no network printers added or visible, at least. Uh, we have to click uh, the printer that I wasn't that I want isn't listed. And this is what happens. Otherwise, you would get a classic Windows uh, pop up where it lets you add a printer and this is what Mike is getting windows can't open add printer so we know it's the print services or print spooler service that is not running so we know that we have to go in and enable it and that's perfectly fine but there is something that I really want you to keep in mind 
there are two different types of services. If you go to your task manager, the very last tab is services, right? These are the services. But there is another section here where it says open services. And this one is different from the services in task manager. It's completely different. So you're wondering, well, why? What do you mean? They're both named services. So what's the difference? First difference that you visually see is you can see that there are things listed on the left side here and that are not listed on the right side and vice versa. For example, on the task manager services, you can see there is AARSVC and it's agent activation runtime. And you can see that as a first thing that comes up here, it's not that, it's ActiveX installer and it's completely different. And you can see that I have it sorted by name, so that way you can see it here in an alphabetical order. So what's the difference here? So if I go into the services of the task manager and I just look for a print spooler, right? It's called print spooler. It's not there. But why is that? Look at this. There's print notify, there's print workflow, there's another print workflow, and there are no other print things. You can see clearly that we are sorted alphabetically and there's no way we, we are missing when it comes to, uh, there's no way that, that we're not finding any here uh, unless it's just completely gone. However, if we go to this other services, which is, is the system services, and we just type in print spooler, it comes up right away. And then again, if you compare here, you can see that there are missing things there it's not it's not there but why is that well the task manager print services is print services specifically for the user that's logged into this computer it's not system services at all and these services do not require administrator privileges for you to start them or stop them or do whatever you want with them this is all for the user that specifically log into this, not the administrator services. The administrator services is this one here, and that's the one you want to activate the print spooler system. And then of course, you can just simply right click it and start it. You see how I was explaining to you uh, this in a specific way to make sure that you don't waste your time looking for certain things or for in this case services in the wrong place we have two different things completely two different things that are named exactly the same thing that's very confusing in in my in in my point of view especially for somebody who is new to computers so keep that in mind all of this stuff that's in task manager it's only for the user that's logged in currently that has the privileges to do so meaning people that don't have admin privileges you can do whatever you want but the system services you need to have administrative privileges to do anything with that all right so if we go in here and then we click the printer that i wasn't listed you will get normal pop-up where you can just literally add any printer whether it's tcp ip local or this and that but the error was specific to service being stopped like this, not necessarily disabled. So in an environment where they really want you to uh, make sure, they, when they really want to make sure that the user is not allowed to print, period, unless specifically given the right to do so, or for example, it goes to higher ups and they say you can, it's going to be like this. It's no, it won't be just stopped. In this case, we can just start it because we don't know why it stopped to begin with. So we can just simply start it. No big deal, right? But in a business environment where it's disabled, you will go to properties for the print spooler like this. And it will be like this. It will be disabled permanently. It will not be able to start up on, on Windows startup at all. It would just simply be disabled and they wouldn't be able to get anywhere with that and for that you have to be very careful whether you are allowed to um, enable or not in our case it was just stopped so all we did was just right click and start it and by the way you can start these services remotely let me show you something real quick if we open services and we can ask mike 
uh, Mike, hey, can you give me your computer name or your computer IP address? We can open services on our computer, on our own computer, and s uh, select action, connect to another computer, type in Mike's computer name, and then click OK. It's going to connect to it, and then you will basically get a same pop-up like this, and then you just go in and remotely start his service. Of course, he can try to reboot, and that might start it as well, because keep in mind, it's just stopped. It's not disabled. But if it's disabled, he can reboot a thousand times. It's not going to do anything. So now, since, we are, uh, since we've uh, enabled his service, we can say, Hello, Mike. I have enabled printing on your computer. Please try again and let me know if any issues, Irvin. Okay, so we're going to click save. Now he can try again. He can, he'll let us know if there are any issues and that should resolve it. Hopefully we hear back from him. Sometimes you don't want to necessarily leave it open-ended like this. Uh, if you know that this guy is really good at getting back to you on things, that's fine. But you can reach out to him and say, hey, can you try again right now? And if he says it's okay, then we can just go to add internal note. Printing now works fine. And then we're going to close ticket afterwards. But notice how I said enabled printing on your computer. I'm not going to tell him, hey, I have enabled print spooler system on your computer. Users don't necessarily need to know any of this stuff unless they specifically ask. Because sometimes they're curious, maybe know a little bit about computers. So they want to know how, how you did it, you know. Uh, but otherwise, you can just say, I've enabled printing on your computer. Please try again. And then we're going to mark it as completed. All right. We have one other ticket that we're going to work in our queue. And this one is says computer crashed. And it's very descriptive, actually. It says here, this morning, my computer crashed and I smell burning plastic. Uh-oh. And then it says, it appears to be working now, but not sure if this needs to be looked at. So I get this comment a lot, or a question, I should say. But it's a comment on my YouTube video, specifically this one here, where I was testing a bad power supply after burning smell and unexpected shutdown. And this is the reason why I created this ticket because I got this idea. And also I had somebody else on Discord uh, share their experience as well. And I'll show you some images of that. But I get this question on this specific video. And um, what happens is usually power supply, usually capacitor kind of blows or you know something overheats within the power supply. And that happens sometimes due to the uh, fact that power supply was overexerted, meaning that you, for example, added uh, more stuff to it, for example, a GPU, or you overclocked your computer or something like that. And it just wasn't capable of handling that type of draw, type of wattage draw, and things start to blow. Another reason for that is that uh, these capacitors for example, this gentleman here shared his um, picture of his open uh, power supply. These capacitors in here uh, will basically, or not just the capacitors, but the everything, the electronics over time when they're exposed to air and just environment, humidity, all of this stuff, they start to erode um, or corrode, I should say, not erode necessarily, corrode. Uh, and these capacitors can start to blow, which is the most common thing. Capacitors are kind of like batteries. They hold a charge in them. And if they can't hold charge properly uh, over time because of the corrosion or, or whatever else there might be a reason, uh, they will start to bulge and they would uh, start to leak. An example we're looking at here from this gentleman's... Um, or, these are perfectly fine capacitors. What you see, the white stuff here, this goop, the goopy stuff, that's normal. That's just um, adhesive. It's glue that's used for capacitors. Capacitors. Uh, they use this glue around the capacitors and underneath them to prevent them from um, moving, uh, from expansion, from basically uh, disconnecting. Because, you know, they are 
when you put something under that much, when you put something under the voltage and stuff like that, it tends to move, heat, and expand. They don't want. They want to make sure they don't disconnect from the circuit board. That's the way I understand it. I'm not um, electrical engineer in any ways, but I know some of the basic stuff. These are perfectly normal capacitors. You can see they're not bulging. But you usually see bulging is on top of the capacitor and they would bulge out they would also bulge down too uh, but this it would bulge up and it would basically be like sort of like an x over here and of course if they start to leak they would leak from the top there would be a leak on the top be like a, usually like a circle of it anyways these are normal normal capacitors his issue was um not power supply necessarily but if you do get a power supply that that it smells from it smells like burning plastic look at the you can if you feel okay with this you can open it up and and see um see if there are any obvious issues but generally speaking if you smell something burning you want to usually replace the power supply in this case it's actually very interesting he had a wire that was actually burning up maybe it's some kind of a short or something it's just bad wiring it to me it looks like just bad wiring um, that was done here some kind of a rigged thing that was burning and causing issues and in the end he just basically decided to see this is how he had it he was wondering if he should just you know try to solder it or or, or whatnot uh, but in the end he just decided to get a you know replacement power supply although it's cheap i usually recommend the name brands but in his case this is what he can get and i said in the end well might as well it will be safer than trying to solder you some kind of electrical tape like this or anything like that so going back to our take it in this case it's most likely just bad power supply we would have it replaced and then i'm going to reply to customer and say if i am help desk uh, but if i am desktop support locally or you know just a tech guy i would look at it and myself i would you know take it and look at it and see if the power supply is bad and replace it otherwise i would say um, well you know i would talk to them you know hello it sounds like you have a bad power supply please take your computer to local pc tech to take a look now i'm only saying this because i don't know the exact situation of this person they might be working from home or right not so i you know i gotta give them an option uh, but otherwise i would look at it myself and replace it replace the power supply or if it's under warranty i would contact the vendor and have them come out and have it have them replace the power supply you know if it's a computer under warranty uh, this is what usually happens you just call them and they do it you know it's really easy to replace the power supply your computer may still work even if it blows up something and that's the point of my video here is that what happens is the power supply that i'm testing here is actually this so it's the same thing that happened but it actually still works so i am testing it to check the voltage and it's been two years since i made this but i'm pretty sure i actually found that some of the voltage is not right on some of those pins and that's exactly what happens you still may have a working power supply even if a capacitor goes bad or something like that but you may be getting wrong voltage uh, wrong voltage to the motherboard or any of your computer components which can cause even more damage so this is why it's better to might as well just go ahead and just get a replacement power supply even if it's just something you know fairly cheap like this no name um, you know that's better than trying to risk it and cause more damage to your computer ladies and gentlemen my name is Irvin, also known as kabooman welcome to another help desk training video we have a couple of tickets we're going to work but before we do that please take one second out of your time to click the like button i really appreciate it, it means a lot to me 
The first one we're going to actually work is this one here where it says my printer is not working. Typically you want to work tickets that are in order. For example, this one says ISD 34 and this one says ISD 35. But the reason I'm going to work the ISD 35 first is because it's in relation to suggestion or something that somebody from my Discord actually asked and I kind of made it into my own idea, I guess. All right, let's see who said this. So a couple of days ago, I asked for suggestions on my help desk training videos, basically ideas for tickets or issues that I can work on or talk about because I really need more ideas, guys. I have over 420 videos or something like that. So chances are I've covered majority of topics. So I'm always open for those. And please don't forget to let me know if you have any ideas or anything that you want me to talk about, whether it's in the comments section below this video or on discord if you want to join my discord there is a link in the description so the idea i got for the other one for the printer ticket is from mr rookie bob so bob said is there a way to tell if device device if device drivers are installed correctly short of a device manager and he said had an old machine that i restalled uh, that i reinstalled and is network uh, wouldn't connect via ethernet and device manager said the driver was up to date had to manually download from the site and install before it started working so basically what's going on here he's saying that uh, everything looked fine in the device manager uh, when it comes to the ethernet adapter that he had installed and let me show you how that looks like so if i go to the device manager and a look at the device manager and in this case what was happening under the ethernet uh, everything looked fine but yet ethernet did not work by the way thank you very much bob uh, for uh, basically giving me that suggestion which i kind of made into a printer issue but i will talk about specifically what you mentioned so he said network adapter looked fine so in this case for example we have intel r ethernet connection adapter and that's the physical one. The other ones here is for the virtual box and one for Hyper-V. So they're virtual adapters that are tunneled, uh, that tunnel to the Intel R Ethernet, which is the physical one. So what he's talking about, that it looked normal. Everything looked normal. There are no um, issues in device manager. What usually happens is when you have an error, uh, in, when, when driver didn't install properly or something doesn't install at all, in device manager, usually on the bottom here, there would be a list of things with exclamation marks on them. In his case, it looked fine, but it still didn't work. So if you look at it, the properties, uh, you know, everything looked fine. It says device started working properly, this and that. But it didn't start working until he actually went to the website for the specific hardware that he has and installed that specific driver. And this can happen... Uh, when uh, Windows operating system installs generic drivers and uh, it used to be worse before and uh, you can see here he mentioned it's an older machine so chances are it's an older operating system as well it has gotten better with Windows 10 with Windows 10 operating system uh, because of the whole plug and play thing gotten better although they started suggesting that I think in Windows XP times maybe even earlier maybe Windows 2000 or something like that basically uh, what I had to tell him is there's no way there's no easy way to tell aside there's no easy way to tell aside from assuming that the wrong driver is installed so yeah if it doesn't work and it looks normal in the device manager then chances are you have to go and actually download or update that driver specifically for that specific piece of hardware whether it's ethernet adapter a graphics card sound card or anything like that and then i said i've noticed windows os likes to install generic drivers that sometimes do not work even though looks normal in device manager so that goes back to me saying or talking about generic drivers or basic drivers that they use uh, i guess generic would be more a technical term and this usually uh, especially true with older hardware but it has gotten way better with windows 10. okay now let's segue into this so yeah, basically to just kind of wrap this up, you would update your driver or install this driver package specifically for your computer, for your computer model or this and that. Okay, now let's hit the printer ticket because it's kind of in relation to that. Again, make sure you assign to this to yourself when you're working these tickets. This is a Jira 
ticketing system. And if you want to know or learn how to use this ticketing system, I have a specific video on how to use a ticketing system. In this case, we are just troubleshooting things. This ticket says here, my printer is not working. And it says, I've installed, I've in I'm trying to highlight it from the beginning. I've installed, whatever, I'm just going to highlight the whole thing. I've installed the printer this morning and there are no driver errors, but still not working. Please help me. Debbie. So Debbie says here she installed the printer and there are no driver errors. So just like we looked at it before, she would install it. And let's go to, I almost went back to the device manager, but we actually need printers and scanners which shows our printers that are installed and this is how it looks like in windows 10 it looks different and there is a way to actually see them listed differently in older operating systems but in this tutorial we're actually just going to do it the way windows 10 wants us to do it right so here we are printers and scanners and here's a printer that's installed here so we're going to look at it as in like okay well it looks fine looks like it's installed there are no exclamation marks or i should say there are no errors there are no big red x's or anything like that it looks normal and this is exactly what it's going on with a user's computer as well she installed the printer and it looks fine however sometimes printers can also be set to use generic drivers. So let's look at how we can actually adjust this. So she, chances are, just installed the software package on her computer somehow or through the means of whatever the company allows. And uh, it looks fine, but yet it's still not installed. This can happen with printers that are, for example, uh, printers that allow multiple drivers to be used so including generic and the one specific to the printer itself so a generic printer should work printer driver should work but then it also gives you an option to change it to the specific to that printer that you have so i know this sounds confusing but what happens is for example a large printer maker what they would do uh, they would create a global print driver for example xerox and that global print driver will work, uh, printer driver will work for majority of the Xerox printers that are out there, or at least a group of them, maybe not all of them, but at least a group of them. Aside from that, they have specific and different drivers, including drivers that support different functions of the printers, including secure print, meaning that you are, let's say you're working in an office and there are hundreds of people working there and you decide to print something and everybody is printing on the same large Xerox printer, one of those big ones, big boxed ones that are like ten or twenty thousand dollars printers, but you have to walk across the entire office floor to get to it. And then of course, if it's a secure document, it's like some kind of sensitive information, let's say a contract of some sort, you don't want everybody just to see it. So you set up secure print and then you once you go there to the printer you type in your code and you get your print out when you get there not doesn't print out and then you go over there and searching through the all the other printouts or maybe somebody takes it you know what i mean that's the point of having multiple drivers available uh for specific for for printers right so you can choose between different ones in this case we're just going to look at the basic thing that we can with this canon one again this is a Canon MP250 is just a basic, uh, fairly affordable printer that you can use at home. I don't have access, since I'm working from home at the moment, I don't have access to the large Xerox one to show you different uh, drivers that are available, but maybe if we're in luck, we're, we can find something here uh, that's similar. So you would usually go to something like advanced and select a printer driver like so you can see here that under printer properties it gives me an option if available to select a different driver or even install a new one in this case it's grayed out unfortunately because this printer is literally has a specific printer it, it's not a xerox twenty thousand dollar printer guys you know what i mean but at least i am able to show you where you can do so so unlike example of the inter ethernet adapter um, that uh, bob is it bob yes bob that bob mentioned 
Uh, in his case, he literally has to use a specific one, and the generic printer in that case, it looked like it was normal, but it wasn't. However, it, when it comes to printers, you can have and expect to see different printer drivers that you literally select. And it's very simple. Uh, once you install it, if it's not available there, you simply use this drop down and select the one that you know that might work. And sometimes you may have to actually experiment experiment with that. So uh, you know, make sure that you select the one and the select the one that is literally what customer wants. So if Debbie here wants to use a secure printer. Uh, features she may have to select a specific driver that allows for that if she debbie wants to print in color she may have to use a specific driver for that very important to know when it comes to dealing with printer stuff like this okay so i guess i'm going to reply to her and you know what in this case i would actually call her and ask her all this information because it's again it's not very simple and i hope it's simple to understand i hope it came across as simple to understand to you guys uh, because there really isn't necessarily a simple way of explaining it but i would talk to her on the phone and ask her debbie uh what kind of printer well, what are you going to use the printer for basically and then she would tell me and then based off of that i would set up her printer drivers and then we would call it that so i guess since i'm talking to her i don't have to reply to her so for that i'm just going to add internal note and say configured printer as requested by user slash customer irvin save and then I'm going to complete it. All right. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Please take one moment to like it. I appreciate it. I know I already said it, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. All right. Let's look at one more. And uh, that should make a for a nice, nice uh, session, nice training session for us, guys. Here we are again. If you watch my other videos, we have again Mike Moser. Mike Moser's got a lot of problems with his computers. He's always <laughs> opening tickets. Anyways, here we go. I am getting computer errors and PC reboots. And it says, this morning I am unable to use programs and computer restarts. I had to reboot four times. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And it says, I work from home, so please call me. So in this case... I would call Mike, and of course, just a touch on this, Debbie, I would ask Debbie if, if she was like on instant messenger, I would ask her, hey, can I call you? You know, but you know, in this case, Mike specifically said that I can just call him, so I'm gonna call Mike. So I'm gonna call Mike and ask him exactly what is going on. So chances are that everything is okay. He says here, I had to uh, reboot four times so chances are that everything is okay at this time but of course we would double check this with customer slash user but the fact that he's working from home and that he had to reboot four times and then he said that i am he says i am unable to use programs and computer restarts to me right away my intuition my experience tells me that one uh, he's unable to use programs uh, because chances are maybe he is not connected to the vpn first and then he's trying to open these programs that require external connection or external access um, from his from his home from his home connection and then we got computer restart so maybe he is turning off his computer whenever he's done using it so it's not able to uh, install updates or anything like that so i would make sure that he indeed is keeping the computer turned on while after he uses it because updates come overnight usually and then i would see which programs are unable to connect and if he's telling me that he is trying to use these programs before he connects to vpn then chances are he's not doing it right so this might be a training issue of course get on the computer and see if there are any issues but chances are if he says everything is fine then what can you do i specifically created this ticket um, so that way i can show you an example of uh, something that you have to do as pc support and that is training 
sometimes you have to train people on how to use computers properly. So what I'm going to do, and I'm, I'm talking to the customer, but I'm just going to type here what I'm going to tell him. I'm going to say, okay, good morning. And then I'm going to ask him, do you turn off your computer at the end of shift or meaning at the end of day then once he's done working or do you keep it on and then if he says i turn it off or shut down then i would say Please, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Please ensure, please, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be nice because I don't want to be, you know, I don't know who Mike is. If Mike is a manager, I don't want to talk to him like he's lesser than me. So if I say, please ensure that, then he may not take this as in like, he may not actually do it. You know what I mean? Uh, please leave computer on after work so that it can get updates uh, this will minimize reboots let's say restarts because he said restarts and will allow for faster login okay so especially true when you're working from home you want to make sure that user knows that it's best to leave the computer on and if they're like well yeah it's using too much power and this and that i'm just going to say well it actually uses very little power when it's not being used and we're going to say that as well but but the point is we want to make sure that the computer gets all of its updates first. So if he rebooted four times, chances are that at least two of those times, or let's say at least one or two times that the computer was just wanting to reboot, no matter what he, whether he did it manually or not, whether he rebooted on his own to resolve issues or anything like that, it doesn't matter. We want to make sure that the computer reboots during after business hours when he's not using it. And then if he says, well, when I rebooted, it took forever and this, that, well, that's because maybe it was getting updates, you know, or the computer is slow, but chances are it was just getting updates. And then I would also say, uh, just to make him feel better off, because, you know, some people are, um, for the lack of better words, anal, they really want to do things their own way because this or that they, and if, if some people think that the computer is using a lot of electricity they may not want to keep the computer you know turned on when they're not using it and i'm going to say computer uses very little power when not in use it, it's kind of wordy what i said there but it gets the point across and then i'm going to say it uses around 8 watts compared to a light bulb, uh, which is around 60 Ws. So this kind of puts them at ease. They leave the computer on because 8 watts is just very very little and i compare it to something they can understand because people a lot of people don't understand what watts are what are watts and what is that you know but if i compare it to a light bulb a standard light bulb um they're going to say well eight watts is really nothing which is completely true i actually have a power uh, meter that's plugged into my wall and my custom made computer has a lot more stuff than uh these uh you know computers that are from company like these basic small form factor computers uh, it's still only used around 8 to 10 watts on just idle, you know, with with monitor turned off. Monitor itself can use some power as well. Okay.
And then I'm going to say, so let's assume Mike said, okay, no problem. You know what I mean? And then I can say to kind of minimize what he was talking about here, where it says, I am unable to use programs. Chances are that, uh, you know, he didn't log into VPN first and then things happened or things didn't work. So I'm going to say a good a good way to ensure programs work properly when working from home is to is to log in in this order so i'm going to give him a basic instructions on the safe way to log in when working from home. So I would say log in to VPN first, then your IP phone, because you know he's working from home, so chances are he's using IP phone, and then everything else. This will ensure, uh, well, it's, I don't want to say safe, but I'm going to say, you know, let's, let's make it full fancy, pro, active, uh, blah, 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 let's see. <laughs> this will ensure proactive workday. How is that? A proactive, this will ensure a proactive workday. So that should help and give basic instructions because we always want to log into VPN first. Everything else that requires connections like an IP phone or anything else uh, will depend heavily on VPN being logged in first. Because chances are when people log into computer, they start to log into everything at once. Some companies even have like automatic, have software that automatically logs you into like 20 different systems. And sometimes that stuff even starts to execute upon login to computer because it's set up to do so while you're at the office, while you're physically connected to the network and it can do that. You know, you would imagine you log into your computer, you know, you lock your computer, you log into it and then suddenly things start to execute. <laughs> That's the automatic login system that they have in place. And when you're on VPN, none of that stuff is going to work or I'm sorry, when you're working from home, none of that stuff is going to work. You have to get on VPN first, and then it's going to work. So, you know, it, it's kind of a touchy type of thing that you have to kind of be nice about when it comes to explaining. Otherwise, Mike is going to come back to me and say, things are not working again the next day. So we have to make sure that that's minimized and that that's not happening. But if we provide training, especially if it's somebody let's say Mike already had an issue yesterday and then you already helped them and here is Mike contacting you again. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, that, you know, he knows how to do things properly so that he can minimize issues that are happening there. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Please let me know if you have any ideas, further ideas. You can let me know in the comments below or you can join Discord and just, you know, let me know or say hi. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. In today's video we have another crash course of what I typically do every couple months and that is combine some of my most recent videos into one so it's a single place to start watching everything that I made because I feel like it's important and maybe it's easier to find for people watching. So here we are. We have starting off a couple of videos on VPN. First VPN video talks about troubleshooting VPN. Some of the most common things to kind of look for and kind of explain to you what VPN is for those people who are new to IT. Video explains things to think about when it comes to working on VPN and especially when a user asks for a password reset. Following on that, we have Zoom troubleshooting setup and audio issues that you may come across when it comes to Zoom. Following that is a video on how to deal with a broken monitor. And then after that, we have a video on 
broken links, website links, and the last video is basically about installing Windows 10. I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them as usual. All right, let's get into it. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hide your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right, so this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting the site, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here, where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different, varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can 
install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through VPN when it comes to customer connecting to the VP. So this is the main thing that you see when it comes to VPN uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk. They're, most of the time they're going to say, I can't connect to the VPN. The main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from, let me see here, from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in U.S. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they are launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already, meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%. But people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software. Dot com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind, they're, they're still there. At this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect to VPN and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that vpn software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the vpn you, you see what i'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly, but you do see that with 
smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know main, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. There, there are exactly the the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires, their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can not just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just, it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So, the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their passwords or they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. 
Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or force to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So let's go ahead and click Find Now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double-click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in, so the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now? Since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. 
and now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? And then you click open Zoom or install Zoom and it's going to install it. And then what you get and what you actually see is this window. This is the window that you would typically see first time you use Zoom. And then you realize maybe my audio is not working. People can't hear me or people can't see me. We're going to definitely talk about that. But the, also a first pop-up that might, you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio. So you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio. So that's going to pop up and then you just click on that. And that's very simple. But then even then, if you don't have your audio set up correctly, it may not work. Let's look at the microphone uh, icon here. You can see there's activity there. That means it's detecting that there is a microphone. It's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through. That's good. However, we may have multiple microphones. How do we know which one is being used correctly or if any? So what if that's not happening? That means we need to tell it which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C6, C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as same as system and I have multiple ones. So it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset. So I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate like if you have multiple things like me this way you can keep track and make sure that you know if you want to use it separate from other equipment you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use and now my audio is set this is if you're using a headset if you're using like a laptop if you have a laptop you have to make sure that the microphones laptop and speakers are selected so if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this, speakers and the camera. Since I'm not using a laptop, all you see is speakers and no, cam no microphone here. But if I was to, for example, switch to my a, uh, webcam and like, for example, I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro Webcam. And I'm going to select that if you want, if I want to use that camera. Now this webcam doesn't have speakers, so I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here. So just make sure that the real tech is selected. But if you have a webcam, make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers. So now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics. And it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me. So it's picking up less of it. Right now I'm speaking into something else. Anyways. That's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here. 
test speaker microphone and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it and then it tells you do you hear the ringtone and it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working so i highly suggest you use that for testing and then you can also have if you have a phone embedded that's another thing uh, but you know this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed the zoom for the first time and this phone integration is something else so i don't necessarily want to talk about this because it'll be way too much and way too confusing um and then uh you can if you click leave computer audio uh that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone like your cell phone you know or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here, and then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know? And then there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that, and then select speakers, real tech. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. And then, you know, like, for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in and, you know, adjust the background noise. But this is fine as it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Just kind of leave it at that. Otherwise, you can just cause issues, more issues with the audio. And if it works, you know, don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing, you know. So just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected. Do a quick test on them and make sure that works now let's look at the video video all right now i just have a picture there and if i click start video you can see me here talking and this is uh <laughs> this is my puppet here i guess and i just have that for and you can see me over here in the in the right hand corner uh right there you can see me uh just kind of talking and waving so i'm the puppeteer if you will so my video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open in another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is. And I'm going to actually switch to it. So maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there. Yeah, you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera, um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else. So make sure that no other program is open and using your camera. That's why you get that error, you know? Otherwise it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You select the camera you want to use and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here. And uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again, but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD, and you can mirror your video. You can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier. And, uh, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is, you know, I don't like using it um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly, but, you know, you know, some people like it, some people like it. So, and that's fine. Um, I personally don't care for it. Here's a, some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh, backgrounds. So let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on. I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it. And I'm going to select that. I have a green screen. Oh, wow. Hey, that's pretty cool actually. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? All right, all right, let me, let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. That's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to 
something else choose a virtual background Ooh, at the beach I wish I was at the beach right now look at that would you look at that that's pretty cool oh look it's moving <laughs> that's actually pretty fun I've seen other people's um, other people using virtual backgrounds and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen but in my case I have a perfect green screen because it's softer there's no cloth behind me or anything like that it's just my puppet and he um, has a perfect green screen because it's 100% green ski and let's do one other oh okay huh? I think this one's the best although it's not moving and then there's none you can see there's my perfect green screen over here you know all right guys I hope you like this video I think it's really fun to actually create this video I uh, uh, it's it's cool it's cool like it's not that hard to use but yeah you know, people still have issues and that's understandable it's okay to have these type of issues you know it's okay as long as we know how to fix them these are normal computer issues that happen all the time all right guys so here's our ticketing system hey, if you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems I certainly have them check out my help desk playlist so in this case uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here and we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that so the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves and I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself so what do we have here this ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me and this guy's name is Mike Moser so in this case this customer really wants us to call them so in this case we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that this guy wants to be called so we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor now I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays so in this case we're going to ro role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home so that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation but then again of course when you do help this you will help people that are working from home as well so let's give him a call and see how that goes hey this is mike hello sir this is Irvin with help desk i have your ticket about monitor not working now just to make sure is this mike moser yeah this is mike moser all right sir i just wanted to see uh what i can do to help you with this um so your monitor is not working yeah that's right my monitor is not working i don't know what's going on this morning i uh, logged in and i couldn't i don't know it's just it's just a blank screen it's just black it like, kind of looks like it's dead so i'm not sure what i can do here sir um do you um when was the no just to make sure is your monitor turned on like is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on yeah it does it does look like it's turned on but i don't know what's going on all right no problem sir now does your uh, now just i just want to make sure is your computer turned on do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it yeah 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 i know it's uh it, it's working i uh, press the on button and uh it, it's it turned on everything seems to be working it's just the monitors i i can tell i can tell that the i can hear the noise whenever i turned on the 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 computer i heard the noise you know that 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 noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer oh okay okay yeah that that's pretty good uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually it's better than you know better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself yeah 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 i know yeah so um do you by chance have two monitors yeah i i actually do yeah that's great sir so if you can um can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working yeah i can try that hold on Thank you sir i appreciate that so what's going on chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them so if you unplug the one that's not working the other one should come up with a picture uh, all right all right I'm, I'm gonna try here hold on all right 
Oh wow. Okay, yeah, yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So, uh thankfully it's just one monitor that's broken. Um in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is it wasn't working, it was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, no, no. I didn't touch anything. It's just, you know, that's I, I just I, this morning is just stopped working. All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with mo one monitor for for now, but um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the the system that you have in place, maybe through the through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website, or if by chance you go to your local. Um, office uh, where they have the uh, you know IT guys locally maybe they can give you a new one or something like that because I know you work from home so um, all right all right well I'm glad I got one working uh, all right I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for time being uh, all right uh, well thanks for your help yeah no problem sir if there is anything else that you need help with please let me know uh, but yeah it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken and ch you know chances are that if it's an older one that just happens all the time um all right um anything else no nah, no nah, i'm good i'm good thanks for your help all right sure no problem you have a wonderful day all right thank you you too bye bye all right so now that we have finished talking to the customer the next thing we have to do is uh leave a uh note or and even close the ticket in this case so this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so uh, chances are i mean depending on the setup in your business environment that you may want to route this ticket to their to his local support it depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there you know but we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says, customer's main monitor is not working. Um, let's see here, what, what else can we say? Can we provide more detail? or, or uh, about what we did or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it well it's up to you I and mean, this is about a style of you how you work so but i like to provide details so what i'm going to do is type in instructed mike to unplug the first slash broken monitor after doing so, it appears that the monitor is indeed broken. And then we're going to type in a workaround down here. And again, this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in, but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it. That's for sure. Your How you do it, it's up to you. This is what I'm going to do. Workaround. He will use his second monitor for time being. Later, he will acquire a new monitor. And that's pretty much what I'm going to leave here because what I did here is, you know, stated that indeed his monitor, main monitor is not working asked them to basically test it because uh, that's but the only thing you can do when you're not physically there ask them to unplug the first broken monitor a lot of times you would just check the cables see if everything is plugged in but i kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked them to unplug the first broken monitor because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken but it's actually not what's going on is that their main monitor goes out but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black right so there's nothing going on they assume their computer is broken in this case he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right it's it's the main monitor that's broken and i instructed him to unplug the first broken one and after that it appears that the monitor is broken indeed 
However, he has a workaround, which is here for time being. So we're going to save that and uh, we're going to change the status to complete. And uh, I think that saved it. I, I always forget where there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys. There you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously, you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was the... Uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. All right, guys. So let's look at this ticket. I have a, this a mock-up ticket that I created in this uh, service desk system, and it's called My Email Is Not Working. The uh, description would say, Hi, my email is not working. This is my link. And then they show you a link, and there's a link right there. We can click on it. We can check it out. That's perfectly fine. And then we have an attachment of an error. And if we click on that, it gives us a lot of clues to what the problem is. So I love seeing attachments of the errors because they can save me a lot of time when it, when it comes to working tickets. And we already, you know, we can already guess what the problem here is because we've seen this type of website before many, many times. Chances are we all use this type of website, and we can see immediately why mail is not working their email is not working and if we click on the link sure enough it's not working because it's broken but as as we can see here we we know that we are just missing the l there so if we just type in l there just a sec type in l we can see that the email is working so we can simply come back to the customer or user and just say here, this is the correct link, which is perfect and great. This is easy ticket to do, and it's no problem, right? The situation what I wanted to talk about is related to when a user or a customer reports a link not working of a website that you're not familiar with at all. So we can fix this one easily just by adding L. But when we go to a website, for example, imagine if this was the problem here, this link up here. Imagine if that was the problem. How would we even know that this part of it is not missing, just that 8? How do we know that? So we won't. We won't know that. It's not like we know every hyperlink for each website to know for sure whether the user is using that specific link. I mean, it can extend to, as far as we know, a limited length. So how do we deal with that specific issue? So let's pretend that this is a website that's not google.com. That's something totally different. Now we have to reach out to the customer. And preferably, this issue I would handle preferably over the IM or instant messenger if available within that company. If not, you may have to call the user and talk to them directly. That might be another option. And the way I would go approach this, I would reply to the customer. I would say, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then if, if it's, again, if it's a website that we're not familiar with, we don't know for sure. Because the thing is, though, we click on the link and we also get the same error, so we don't know whether they're using the correct link or not, or if the website is down for sure. So we have to figure out first whether it's the broken link, because 90% of the time, it's the wrong link that they're using. And it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that. We have to make sure that we're respectful towards the user or the customer, because this type of stuff happens, you know, especially if they're pushing back, saying that it's not... You know, it's, you know there, there's, there is the correct link, but that's okay. We're going to get to that part here. So, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then we can say, um, if we're suspecting a wrong link that they're using, is anybody else in your group having this issue? 
Or we can say, is anybody else in your group able to access this website? All right. So we can send that off to them and wait for their reply. But you know, since since it's a website, we don't know. We we kind of want to resolve this as quickly as possible. We don't want to necessarily wait for them to receive an email from the ticketing system for the notification. Wait for them to reply this and that. That I mean, that's fine if you know or if they happen to be watching their email all the time. But chances are they're not. This is what I'm saying. You might want to reach them over the IM if possible, or if you want to call them. So a lot of times they come back and say this, customer, yes, that is the correct link, right? So they may come back and just say that. Then, then what do you do? And if you're still suspecting uh, that it is the, you know, that it, that it is the wrong link, you can say, can you please check with one other person just to be sure and then they might come back and say uh usually after a little bit because they are you know chances are they are probably checking you know and then um you know if they come back and say yes it's working for them so this is your clue right here immediately. We immediately have like even higher suspicion that it is indeed a, a wrong link, a wrong link that they might be using. If, is, if this is working for somebody else and not for them, and it's obviously not working for us, that's because I, Irvin, and the customer, and the customer, we both have the wrong link that was provided by the customer. And then if they keep saying, if they keep insisting they are using the same link as me, you can say, can you please show me the screenshot of a working website so you got to be you got to be very careful with this you got to be kind of uh, systematic in a way but also respectful at the same time you can't just tell them no you are using the wrong link that's not that's not the way you deal with uh, customers or users on the help desk so customer would you know reply with screenshot and then you would look at that screenshot and then chances are that that screenshot will have that clue to you of what the correct link. So you're looking at it and then you're like, well, you are, unfortunately, you are using the wrong link because you're missing like an eight. Or in our case of the email here, you know, we can go back to this. If we look at it, we can say, well, in this case, you're missing an L. So that indeed is the wrong link, unfortunately. And that would resolve that. Sure, at some point, you will come across an issue where it's a website that, it, it you know, the website is down for everybody. So, and, and that's different, you know. If you, you know, especially if you're familiar with the website, you'll know, yeah, this is not normal, this and that. But in this case, this is how you deal with a customer or a user that simply has a wrong link for whatever reason it happens you just got to be respectful and be systematic about it and very professional about it this comes up a lot on help desk wrong link tickets it's very very common thing all right guys i hope you i hope you like this video i tried to make it as as a real world example as possible and explain it in a way where it's easy to understand Please let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I have lots of help desk videos. They're very, uh, very useful, very popular. A lot of people like them. And I hope you have a wonderful day, okay? All right, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, wait. I almost forgot to mention, guys. I have lots of written stuff that's related to help desk, network administration, system administration, all kinds of IT 
topics. I don't even remember how many I got, but it's on my website. It's at CosmicNovo.com. So if you go there, you can see that I have a bunch of different written versions of all kinds of different IT stuff that you can read. If you're if you would if you would rather read um, some of this stuff, then you can certainly do so on my website. Hello friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, I am talking about save files to delete within a local profile. So you will get this ticket or this type of ticket in a help desk environment if a user starts to run out of space. This usually happens with older hardware. I want to say something that's like five years or four years old. What happened was during that time, they were starting to install solid state drives, but solid state drives were a bit more expensive. So to keep the cost down, what they did small hard drives inside of it like 120 gigabytes or so so by the time you install everything on it like programs and everything else the user will quickly start to run out of space on the local profile so in this video I will show you which files and folders are safe to delete within it oh I almost forgot if you got one second please click the like button I really appreciate it thank you so much guys you're awesome thank you so I actually got this question from one of my viewers and this is what he said he said, hey man, I got a question. Can I delete app data, Apple compute, mobile sync backup folder? There are two folders. Uh, can I delete what's inside of them because they are 24 gigabytes plus? So he was asking this or he or she was asking this because, you know, they wanted to make space on their hard drive. So, for example, let's say you have a hard drive like this one here and it's only 120 gigabytes and you only have 37 gigabytes free. And now you want to install a new program or a video game or something. And uh, you can't because there is not enough space. So now you're looking for ways to make space on your hard drive. So that way you can install that program or a video game. Or maybe you just, you know, wanted to make free space. So I wanted to really talk about this from a tech support point of view, meaning that you got to be very careful on the things that you delete and you got to use a lot of common sense. But yes, you can delete some things from app data folder, which I will show you where it's at. Uh, because a lot of times it can take up a certain amount of space. For example, I mean, in, in, in his case, in this case, this person uh, wanted to free up 24 gigabytes of space, which is quite a lot, as you may imagine. So be very careful if you're going to do this. And I will explain to you in, uh, why it is important to uh, not just kind of rush into things and delete everything that you see, especially in app data folder. All right, guys, if you don't mind, take a second here uh, to click the like button. I really appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. Um, the reason I'm asking this is because I'm not going to play an ad here like uh, some people might. So if you're going to spend one second to click that like button, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, so let's get back into it. And let's go ahead and look at app data folder so what, what what is this person talking about there is a an app data folder that's located in your local profile so if you open up your hard drive and it's in the root of c so if you're literally just opened it up this is called root of c for people that are not familiar with computers and inside of it there is a folder called users if you select that and you open it up you will see that there are a bunch of different names and you will probably see something that is very familiar to you what you're looking at here are basically local profiles that you use and anybody else that uses this computer so if you have your own login chances are you're going to see your own local profile inside of this computer so let's go ahead and look at this one here that is called buco so we can right away see that this folder here is taken up 43 gigabytes um, in, in space. So there's definitely space we can uh, free up in there in case you want to. Again, you got to be careful. So if we go inside of this, here is that app data folder that we were talking about earlier. The app data folder holds data that is literally for apps. So pretty much anything from uh, configuration to uh, files being stored. See, in this case, he was talking about a folder called backup. And inside of that backup, there were two other folders that had 24 gigabytes. So that means that in this case, Apple uses that location in app data 
to create uh, those two storage points and most likely were just some kind of backups for that software. So what I told them is that, hey, if you're not using that program anymore, you can go ahead and delete it. So let's look at an example of that. And I don't have Apple installed in here, but we can look at other things that we may want to delete. Generally speaking, if you no longer want to use any of the programs or you have removed the program uh, and you see a name of it in here, you can literally just go in and delete them. Anything that you see here, as long as you already know that you are not going to use it or you have it uninstalled it, you can remove any remnants of it. So here I can see there is an ATI folder. I don't need that. Uh, if you see Blizzard folder, I don't need a Blizzard Entertainment folder. I don't need that. So I'll go ahead and select those and I'm going to hit delete. Of course, if you have ATI folder in there and you have an AMD video card or a graphics card, do not delete that folder because you may be deleting some configuration files and any files that may be required to simply run properly. So, and there is a, a, some other things we can look at in here. So let's go down. What is this? CEF. I have no clue what this is, to be honest. So, by default, if you have no idea what it is, leave it alone. There's one here that's called comms. I have no idea what that is, so I'm going to leave it alone. And there's another one here that's connect devices platform. I have no idea what that is, so I'm going to leave it alone. You get the idea here? You don't want to start deleting things that you're not familiar with. However, if you know for sure that something is no longer on your computer, no longer needed, then you can certainly delete it. So here's an example of something that kind of looks like we could delete. And it says downloaded installation. So what could this be? The only thing I can think of here is that there, you know, this might be something that is downloaded simply on your computer, as it says, and it just created a temporary location for it. And sure enough, this is a TP link PLC utility and I no longer need that. So I'm going to delete that, but I'm not going to delete the entire folder. I'm just going to delete what's inside of it. So in case the system is using um, this uh, folder, which I kind of doubt Microsoft wouldn't do this. So in that case, I'm going to delete that as well. So here's a Google folder and we can see that it's taking up 561 megabytes of data. We don't want to delete that if you have Google Chrome installed on your computer. Because see, here's what happens. If you go inside of it, and then you go to Chrome folder, and then you can see user data, we don't want to delete user data. Do you want to delete all of your cached uh, files, all of your cached uh, passwords, your, uh, for example, your, uh, whatchamacallit, um, bookmarks? See, there is a bookmark file right here. If you delete that, then you're going to lose your bookmark. Here's a cookies. Of, uh, file. If you delete that, you're going to lose all your cookies. We don't want to delete that unless you're doing some kind of troubleshooting with Google Chrome. But in this case, we're only talking about making space on your computer. So this is, as you've noticed, this is totally different from basic stuff uh, that you could normally do when it comes to freeing up space. Yes, you can do other stuff like, uh, so you can look at the, you know, if you look at the recycle bin here, you can go inside and delete everything that's in there. For example, you know, just empty it, this and that, and it's gonna make more space. And that's not what I'm talking about here. This video is specifically making more space um, in, in some other ways that are not typically available by default um, through Windows uh, operating system. So going down the line, uh, there is a Microsoft. We don't necessarily want to go and delete in here, but let's have a look what's inside of Microsoft folder. We can see that all of these things are part of Microsoft. So yeah, I'm not going to delete any of this stuff because it may break my Windows operating system. There's Microsoft Touch. You probably don't want to delete that either. Here's the NVIDIA one. And I, since I don't have NVIDIA installed on my computer, I'm going to delete that. Here's another one. It's called The Witcher 2. And it's, uh, it's an empty folder. It does have a temp folder inside of it as well. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that as well. So the point of this video is, yes, you can go inside of app data and look for things that you don't use that may be taking up a lots of space and then you can delete them. Just make sure that you are no longer going to use those programs uh, that may be 
they may require those app data files. And that's part in local, but you can also go into roaming and see if there's anything inside of that to delete. And then here it is. I'm just going to go ahead and delete the, uh, the one that was called ATI. I'm going to delete, uh, let's see, NVIDIA one like we did and so on and so forth. Just be very careful. Here's a good example of this because it may hold configuration data like this VLC folder. And I know I'm using VLC still. Let's see, where is my VLC? Here's my VLC media player. So I know my VLC is going to use this configuration data and you can see that it's literally called configuration settings. So yeah, you don't want to delete this because you still need to use your VLC. So be very, very careful guys. But yes, you can make space in, on your computer uh, to you know delete more things. Of course, aside from app data, you can go to desktop and you can see the desktop has 3.8, three gigabytes of storage. You can go to your documents and there'll be more stuff. You can go to your downloads and wow downloads has a lot what is this oh this is when i was downloading this uh they had uh they had a uh, basically educational version of windows server 2016. oh yeah i want to delete that those were those are huge files that's a lot of space saved right there um, of course i want to empty my recycle bin so that way it actually does empty all that space all right, so that's just one thing you can do when it comes to local user profile. There are other folders you can look into, but I just wanted to give you an idea of things that you might, you may be able to down, uh, download, <laughs> that you may be able to delete without getting in trouble or breaking your computer. Here's another one. It's called Windows Old, and I can delete that. That happened. Oh, it's no longer. Okay, well, whatever. So... Um, yeah, there you have it, guys. If you like this video, please leave a like. If you have any questions, feel free to ask him. Don't forget to subscribe. And let's see how much space did I save real quick before I take off. All right, that's not bad. I think we started off with 37 gigabytes, and now we have 50 gigabytes of free data. Again, please be careful when you do this stuff. If you have any questions, ask me, and I'll be glad to help you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. Welcome to another help desk ticketing system tutorial. In this case, we're dealing with audio issues. It has a very specific error, and I'm very excited to talk about it. Before we do that, please take one moment to like or subscribe to this channel. I really appreciate it. Also consider joining this channel as a member. It's only $1.99 a month. The reason I'm saying that is because in the future I plan to release an additional video for members only. So if you're interested in that, you might want to consider that option as well. All right, guys, let's get into it. This is a Jira ticketing system. And if you're brand new to Help Desk and want to know how to use Jira ticketing system, please go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Koboman, and in the search box, type in ticketing system. What you see there will be a lot of different tutorials using this exact same ticketing system and also on how to use the ticketing system itself, meaning how to navigate, how to note, how to talk to the customers and all that. All right, let's get into this ticket. It says here, my audio randomly stops working. And in the description, it says, recently, after a computer update, my sound randomly stops working. So there was an update, and then suddenly now he has a randomly stopping audio. So he was just randomly stopped working. It says here, rebooting the PC will fix it, but will stop randomly. So... And then it says, see error attached. Let's look at this error real quick. It says, audio render error. Please restart your computer. Now, this is an error that comes up on YouTube videos. So the, the reason you get this error typically is because of driver issues. And that is also hinted by the fact that the computer received an update. So every time you see this type of error, it says audio render error. That means that the player on YouTube uh, failed to render audio, meaning it failed to use the driver to render the audio. So that's the best way to kind of think about it. Every time you see audio render issues, it has to do something with not able to initiate the driver or the device itself. In this case, it's most likely just a driver issue. All right. So 
first thing first, let's make sure we assign the ticket to ourselves before we do any action. But for this, we want to actually reply to the customer and say, hello, when would, say it depends on the situation here on how the business is set up, but you can also say when would be a good time to, when would be a good time to uh, take a look at this issue. Uh, you know, it depends on who this person is. Uh, this guy's name is Mike Moser, and we don't know. Mike might be a manager of some sort, or it could be just a regular user, or he could be a director. We don't know. We just want to make sure and kind of get an idea of who he is before we actually just say, I'm going to take control of your computer, and we're going to fix it now. You know, we can't stop this guy from working, especially if he's a director level. Can you imagine that? Uh, you know, we got to work on his time and whenever he's uh, available, you know. So that type of thing usually would happen with tier two help desk and higher, but tier one, not necessarily so much, you know. All right. So it wouldn't be a good time to take a look at this issue. And uh, of course, I'm only saying hello here because Mike Moser already knows me. So I'm just saying, you know, he already knows me. I don't have to introduce myself. Otherwise, I would say my name is Irvin with PC support, you know. So whenever he responds, we're going to actually take a look at his computer. Now, if there is, of course, if there's a number to call, we would call him and talk to him and ask them, you know, can we take control of it? Can I take control of your computer so that way we can take a look? Um, also, another thing you want to ask him is actually to make sure that you have his computer name so that way you can get the, um, um, so you can control, take control of his computer. But also, if it's set up differently, uh, once you get his computer name, you can get his IP address. And with an IP address, you can also take control um, of his computer. And then at some point, you just want to make sure you get this information so that way you can do your job basically and let's assume he said okay i'm ready now you can say great uh what is the name of your computer or your ip address so that way we can take control of his computer now you know if you're talking to him you know, this is the best way to just to talk to him. I mean, it just depends how you're communicating. In the end, you want to be able to take control of his computer. I mean, there are different ways of taking control of computer. You can use a remote desktop software, like, for example, Dameware or some other ones. Uh, but uh, you can also, and nowadays, you can take control, you know, just using WebEx or using, I don't know, what some of the other meeting uh, tools that people use nowadays any of those meeting tools even just the chat applications will have some kind of an option of sharing screen and also requesting to take control of their computer all right so once we take control of his computer we're going to uh, pretend like this is his computer and then we're going to go to our sound setting that's the first thing we're going to look at and we're going to see what shows up there here's the thing though when there are driver issues, uh, the things will look normal because when there are driver issues like that, and it's specific to this error here, audio render, please restart your computer. Although most people will be watching this video and say, well, that's my issue. You know, YouTube is giving me this error. However, the thing is, though, this is so, there are so many computers out there and this issue, the fix for this issue will be specific to your computer. However, you might want to watch this whole thing to get, at least get an idea where to look and maybe try some of the things that I'm about to show you because there are many different solutions for this. However, in my case, I will go to, uh, I will tell you what the solution was for this gentleman in real life. I actually, this actually happened uh, at my job. It's just that, I'm, of course, it's a different person, but I will tell you exactly what happened in my situation. Okay, so the things look normal, you know, whenever there are driver issues in this case, because it happens randomly. Remember, this person reboots and everything goes back to normal. So we have here just a Plantronics headset input for microphone and everything looks fine. And of course, we got Realtek high definition audio, which is normal. You know, this is something you would normally see. There are no other inputs uh, because he's got the headset. And you can see here that there is real tech, just regular speakers, you know. Um, the issue I actually worked on was specific to HP laptops. So it was a HP 840 
G3, I believe. And the thing is, though, it actually had a different uh, type of audio, the onboard audio. Typical onboard audio is Realtek high definition audio. This person had, uh, I think it was called Connexent, Connexent, I S S T, something like that. And uh, it was showing up like so. Instead of Realtek, it had that Connexent I S S T, which is very unusual. I most of the time, 99% of the time, I see Realtek, whether it's high end computer or not. But in this case, HP decided to have that type of uh, thing. So everything looks normal, but yet the issue happens. You know, the person swears up and down that the issue is happening. And sure enough, there is an error. So we know that there is an issue. And again, we are suspecting audio issues. So for that, we're going to go to our device manager. So there are a couple different ways of getting to it. You can go through the manage part of the computer. But what I usually do, I just right click this icon PC and just go to device manager. But then again, you can go through the computer management and get to the device manager as well. Okay, so from here, we're going to look audio inputs and outputs. The first thing that shows up here, here's our Plantronics um, USB uh, headset that we've plugged in. We can tell that it's a microphone and that it also has a speaker. So this is the, you know, this is the headset itself, normal. And then we got that Realtek high definition audio. In his issue, uh, the problem was actually a conflict between the new driver and the other onboard driver that was happening on there. So the reason we the reason it stopped working for him is because an update actually came through. So the way you can roll back an update on a driver is simply to right click on the device itself, go to properties go to driver tab which is the second over and then select roll back driver if available and that should revert back to the old one and chances are that in his case instead of saying coaxent it said just regular high definition audio just like the Realtek here so that's one way to roll back the driver if it updated indeed and of course we can see that the what the, the update driver date is um, you can also try to update the driver, which can also fix the issue. So if we click update and click search automatically to all, you know, search online for drivers, uh, sometimes this fails. Sometimes it fails, but a lot of times we just say you have the correct driver. But if there is one available, it will uh, go out there and look for it and possibly install it. And I don't want to blame this on Microsoft that it stops working or not. It's just... It depends. I've seen it fail and I've seen it succeed. So, uh, you know, so what, what can you do after that? I mean, you can go specifically, go to a website and look for the driver update for that. So we're just going to go and look for HP 840 G3 drivers. And you can do the same thing, whatever the name of the computer is. And this case, here it is. And once this loads, we're going to look at the available drivers. And of course, we're going to select driver audio here. And here it is, Connexent HD audio driver. And sure enough, looks like the most recent one is September 18th, 2020. And that's fine. We can download this. We can install it, given that you have administrative privileges and that it's allowed within your company. So this is one of those things you have to kind of double sh make sure so you don't get fired for installing or downloading uh, software and installing on somebody's computer. Okay, so that's one step of it. However, with some research, and again, it's okay to do some research whenever you're troubleshooting issues, especially if you've never seen this issue. Ch chances are, if you're watching this specific video that you did your research and you can, you know you did your Google search or YouTube search, and this video came up. That's fine. As an IT professional, I like to resolve issues based off the knowledge that I have. Uh, that's the difference between somebody who's experienced and who's not. Um, and I don't mean to sound mean when I say any of this stuff. Here's the thing. I get this sometimes where people just say, Oh, anybody can do tech support. You just Google it and then you find an answer, this and that. No, uh, you know, Googling and finding answers is perfectly fine. 
as a last resort. So I'm only right now I'm speaking to people who are watching my videos to be help desk guys or tech support guys. Uh, please try to use your knowledge first to uh, resolve issues on your own, given that you have enough time. If you really, really cannot figure it out on your own, it's okay to Google it or look at the knowledge base articles for your company on how to fix specific things. The reason I say that is because you will acro come across issues that you can't fix that are proprietary to the company that you're working for. So what if some kind of application or program stops working or even piece of hardware that's specifically designed for your company? You think you're going to be able to find an answer on Google? Yeah, good luck with that. Again, I'm not trying to sound mean. Uh, there's nothing wrong with searching for an answer. In this case, I actually look for an answer as well myself and actually found that there might be a conflict between uh, that specific uh, coaxent ISST uh, hardware and Intel Display Audio, which runs over HDMI. So since this is not being used at all, but anybody, literally nobody is using Intel R Display Audio, uh, which is basically signal audio signal from HDMI. This is built in into your computer, typically a laptop. I went ahead and just disabled it just as an, a proactive thing, which could have resolved the issue as well, rather than just updating the driver. Okay, so updating, installing driver could resolve the issue. Uh, but, um, you know, and in this video, and uh, what I'm going to do is actually, you know, fast forward to this point so you guys uh, can see. I'll, I'll put little marks on the bottom of the video so that way can, somebody can just click on the solution. And another thing to consider is I, I've seen issues or resolutions for it as well to be uh, related to the fact that you can possibly update BIOS and this and that. But from my research, uh, what really resolved the issue is either rolling back the drivers on your main audio, whichever that may be, or and or disabling this Intel R display audio. So hopefully that helps to those people who are just looking for a specific solution to this error. Otherwise, if you're watching these videos for my tech support part of it, I highly encourage that you uh, watch some of my other videos on how to properly go about resolving any issues, not just something that you can Google to resolve, you know? All right, and then we're going to close the ticket. We're going to say updated audio drivers. By the way, what I did, IRL, for this manager actually fixed the issue. So there is that. Uh, updated audio drivers for users, for user. Ah, you know what? I'm just going to say updated audio drivers and disabled Intel audio device going to save it and then we're going to close it complete all right guys there you have it thank you so much for watching again i really appreciate you guys liking commenting subscribing if you have any more suggestions for different videos specifically for help desk i know some of you already suggested some specific things uh, like on citrix and this and that i for those videos I'll definitely have them on a back burner. I haven't forgotten about you or anything like that. It's just that I have to make a lot more time to actually make those type of videos. And they are very niche. They are very niche. Right now, what's carrying my channel is help desk type of tutorials and ticketing systems. You know, whether it's, you know, help desk, desktop support, system administration, anything like that, that helps people get jobs. You know, Citrix, I'll try to see if I can make it into a, a ticket and that would be the best way to go about it because i've seen citrix issues uh, before and, and anything that's like that that is very niche and specific if you can give me a scenario in which um the error the error came up if you can give me a specific error or a specific uh, 
um, issue that you've resolved i can even talk about that it's just it's really hard to come up with ideas and show them on how they're resolved uh, in in a way where it's useful you know what i mean and even this video is is also kind of very specific to this audio error but at least it gives you uh, some some ideas on where to go to update audio drivers and how to go about updating it. ladies and gentlemen my name is Irvin, also known as couple men welcome to another help desk tutorial so my videos are good for help desk tier one tier two and tier three and also desktop support and of course system administration this is another video of the same series. But before we do this, I want to shout out to James Oringi. Thank you so much for becoming the very first member of my channel. So what I did last month, sometime last month, I realized that I had the ability to activate memberships on my channel. So I went ahead and did that. And Mr. James here has... Uh, signed up as is the first one to sign up so thank you so much james i really appreciate it that will go towards my coffee fund thank you so much man i appreciate it all right moving on so in this video we have a couple of different issues the first one is rdp sound issue and then we have another ticket for a local admin account that is not working by the way if you have one second please click the like button that also makes a big difference for my videos and also helps other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself thank you so much okay all right, so let's look at the first ticket we have here, and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio coming from that computer is not working. So there are a couple of reasons why somebody would want to have a second PC and use a remote desktop. And the first one is... They literally have a second PC which has specific software, specific documents, specific files, this and that. And they have a second PC that they want to access. And the only way for them to do it, especially in a business type of environment, is using regular Microsoft built-in remote desktop. The other reason is that somebody literally has a second computer as part of their job to process um, certain files maybe databases or do certain processes that require extra cpu power you know this and that you know maybe there are other reasons as well but those are just a couple of examples of somebody using a second pc and using it via remote desktop so he's using remote desktop to access this second pc but he can't hear any audio coming from that so it's kind of like this you see in this computer here where i'm basically recording this you can see that the name of my computer here is tech support this tech support computer is a remote desktop session so if i play any audio on here for example i go to youtube and i play a video um, i'm not able to hear any audio and that's his problem here so we can fix that so first thing we have to do is open up remote desktop session on user's computer on his computers on mike's computer we open up a remote desktop session and then we click here show options we're going to expand options and uh, we're going to go to the third tab where it says here local resources and the first thing that comes up is remote audio so we're going to click on settings where it says here configure remote audio settings so this is exactly where we need to go so we're going to click on settings so this computer here is uh, well this remote desktop session is set up to play audio on this computer so by default it's set like this if i was to use a remote desktop session on this computer to connect to a second computer over there um, it will play audio from that computer on my computer okay i don't want this to sound too confusing but let me just show you so if i go to youtube.com forward slash kobuman it's going to okay my first time going to my own channel on this computer anyways any audio that you see here right now is actually being played on the remote computer itself that's exactly what his problem is so in order to fix that we have to make sure that its settings are set to this play on this computer otherwise we can't hear this 
voice at all, as you can so. Right now, on my computer, which is here, where it says tech support, I'm using remote desktop. Right now, it's set to play audio on the other computer, which is this setting. So on the second PC, wherever it may be, this is what it's set like right now on my computer that I'm using right now. It's playing on remote computer right now. So to fix this, we have to make sure that it's set to play on this computer, which should be set by default. And, uh, and, and that's fine. This is how we would fix that. But I also want to show you something else. So let me complete that ticket. And we're going to come back to this because I really want to talk about something here that's going to be also related to troubleshooting. Very important. And let's wrap this up. So we're just going to add internal note and say change remote desktop settings to play audio audio on a local computer okay and then we're gonna of course have them test it you know this and that that's fine this should be easy ticket and then we're going to close it of course of course don't forget to assign ticket to yourself as well very important so you can get credit before you close it and since we know mike mike moser we've worked with him many many times uh we're going to just close it we're going to let him know hey should be fine now so we're done with mike but i do want to go back to that remote desktop connection to show you something very very important so let me explain what i mean if you get a ticket that a user cannot use their local headset for example they have a headset somewhere their user is somewhere else and you need to troubleshoot their headset sound issues and you can't because if you use remote desktop session let's say you're limited to only using remote desktop session it's going to look just like this you remote into their computer just like i am connected to this tech support computer right now and it's going to look like this it's just going to say remote audio there is no headset to select there is no audio to troubleshoot here let me show you if i go to sound settings here it just says remote audio there is nothing else there is no headset to select so you would assume that something is wrong right well that's that's not right the, the problem is is actually this you have to go to local resources before you connect to that computer you have to go to local resources on your remote desktop session click settings and select play on remote computer just like we had it previously and then you go in and then you type in user's computer name you click connect and then and then we can make changes to the local see now it's looking looking like it's different uh it made <laughs> it made different settings here you see now we can select speakers that are real tech which is the typical uh you see how i got confused because i made the change right away it took a little bit to configure but yeah now we can actually see that there is real tech uh, definition audio same thing if i go over there and plug in a headset you will see it come up as well all right so you probably saw you probably saw that i plugged it in now we can troubleshoot that headset on that remote computer so you would just say to the user or ask them to plug in their headset if it's not showing up like that and then you'll be able to do it otherwise if you don't change it to play on the local computer like i showed you you won't be able to troubleshoot it and you will just assume that there is something wrong with the audio you know you have to make sure that it's set play on remote computer you know otherwise it's, you won't be able to troubleshoot it so that's something to keep in mind if you only have remote desktop connection as the available resource of taking control of somebody's computer and troubleshooting these type of issues all right i hope that comes off as something that you can easily follow because it is kind of confusing and but it is what it is this is how you have to kind of go about it and to to troubleshoot some of these weird issues that might come up okay doki all right so let's look at this other ticket says my local admin account is not working and it specifically says here hello i have a local admin account to make changes on my pc but it's not working thanks larry 
So this guy was given specific local admin account to use for some reason. And of course, uh, don't ever, if you, have, if you have the ability, don't ever give somebody a local admin account password uh, because of the security reasons. You have to you know, double and triple check to make sure that this person is actually allowed. So we're going to go with that assumption. All right, let's assign the ticket to ourselves. We're going to work that. We're going to contact him and ask him, hey, what is the name of the local admin account that you're trying to use? So, and then he tells you what the name is, and then we're going to search for it in on our computer. Now, this is not to be confused with the main admin accounts. Those are different. They will not be listed under local admin users. So we're going to just type in users here to get to the point where we can add or edit and see which users or which accounts are available there to begin with. This is just one way of looking at this. This shows you some administrator accounts. And the other way is if you go to the system settings or system properties, and then we look at advanced system settings, and then we click on user profiles, we're going to see all the accounts that are listed here. However, there is a big difference here, what we're looking at. We're looking at two very different things. And I want to kind of emphasize this. This is why I created this uh, fictitious ticket, is that what we're looking at here is local accounts that are on the computer. When it comes to this window here, this is where you would add them. These are all the actual account login information that's available on this computer. Now, what we're looking at here is actually user profiles that are stored so this is location or this is how much space is taken up by creating a local profile on the C drive. This is not a this is not information for this person's for any of these accounts. This is just what's stored locally. And the thing is though although that describes this, if you were to click and delete this profile it would delete it everything that's in stored on this computer meaning all of these things are located on the c drive so if you go to local users on the c drive so c users you can see that they are here here is the buco which is the first one here is the cobalt test account which is this one and here is the yt login is this one so if i click delete on any of these which I can't delete this one. This one never shows up uh, if you're using it. Uh, it's kind of bizarre, but this one is actually on here as well. It's not showing up. I don't know if that's some kind of a feature of Windows, but this YT login actually does exist on this computer as well because I'm using it right now, but yet it's not listed. And I know it's an admin account. It doesn't matter. Getting back to the point of what I'm talking about here. If I select, for example, this one, BUCO, and then I select delete, it will delete everything that's inside of this folder. So anything that's inside of here, desktop, documents, everything, everything will be deleted. Okay, now that we understand what that is, we're going to cancel out of this. I'm going to leave this window open here because we're going to get back to it. What we're going to do, what I actually wanted you to learn from this fictional ticket um, is what happens when you can create when you create a local admin account or try to use another account on a computer um, to troubleshoot issues for example let's say you need to use an admin account to fix something or to run specific application this is what happens when you do that so what we're going to do here we're going to create a local uh, microsoft account and we're going to name it local admin not a very secure name but it doesn't matter because you know this is just for practice and it's forcing me to do all this stuff now okay so now we have another local admin we're going to change type to administrator so this is just the standard user. We're going to change it to administrator. Now we have a local uh, local account that's administrator account. However, if you go to the settings here in user profile, you can see that it's not there. There's nothing there. And then if we go to the root of C again, we know we have the local profile. We go to root of C. We go to users. 
it's not there. Well, why is that? Because I want you to know that this completely separates this account from the stored data on the computer in the sense that there is no local profile created, only a local admin account. So it's only a local admin account until you log in to this computer for the first time or or if you use for example your own local admin account whether it's domain or local it doesn't matter let's say you're troubleshooting something let's say you're troubleshooting something and you want to run for example this google chrome as administrator in order to troubleshoot some things you can literally right click this icon and click run as administrator and on a business restricted computer um, you will get a pop-up to log in to use your local credentials but since i'm already logged in as admin on their another account it's not going to give me that so what i'm going to do is hold shift right click this google chrome icon so i'm holding shift key on the keyboard and now we have an option to run it as different user otherwise it doesn't show up run as different user doesn't show up here let me show you right click it's just run as administrator but if i shift right click run as different user so that's where we're going to select i apologize this is this is just a glitch here run as different user this is just a scaling issue with my uh with my monitor but it's basically asking me here to put in my login credentials so we're going to do we're going to use this local admin so it's same thing if you have a domain admin you would type in the same login id so we're gonna your your own local id or your your domain admin id i'm sorry so but in this case we're going to use this one so we're going to type in local admin so if I tab over, it's actually in the password space. I'm sorry, you can't see it. It's because of the scaling on this 4K monitor and using remote desktop session specifically. So if I click OK, I've typed in local admin and the password below. You just can't see it. And I'm just going to click OK. And now it's going to run Chrome under that specific account, under that specific local administrator account. So this is useful if you're trying to update the computer and you need to use your own administrator login. So right now, this specific window and only this window is running under that local admin and separately from this other ticket window. It's run separately. To prove it to you, we're going to go back to our folder and we can see now that there is a local admin <clears throat> profile created because we use that local admin to run as as admin on this computer so it actually actually had to create settings folder inside of that you can see that you see so this is how these things work and let me show you this here we, got, we don't need this here anymore but i want to go back to here user profiles now when we click on user profiles we can see that local admin show up and it's right there and you can see it's only 78 megabytes that's very very tiny and usually when a user logs in for the first time into computer it's going to create a much larger local profile but the reason this one here is only 78 megabytes is because it only created a basic sort of like a template information for this local admin profile on this computer just so we can run and store settings for chrome okay and then we're going to let me see if i can open it here and we're going to and here it is you can see that there's some basic documents here and then there's app data and then if we go to for example local google chrome folder is there al along with microsoft it's just the basic Microsoft stuff that comes with default um, default settings for the Microsoft operating system. But it has that Google Chrome that we just opened. You see that? And it says 98 megabytes, but that's because, you know, it, by the time we opened it up, Google Chrome itself had actually, you know, stored some data on its own, this and that. And uh, <laughs> so that's how that works. But the great thing about this, if you have somebody, a remote user, who's never logged in to a computer before. Let's say somebody takes their computer home 
and they can't log into it for some reason, but you have remote desktop access to it, uh, you can uh, basically do the same thing to get it going. So uh, it, it's kind of a workaround, but uh, it, and it's kind of confusing, I know. But as long as you can get this local at local profile uh, created and get it going, that way when somebody locks their computer, they can literally type in the same thing and just get access to this without having to be connected to the network in order to log into this computer for the first time. Okay, that was quite a bit and I hope this wasn't too confusing. Hopefully it gives you an idea of what's going on with these profiles and again whether it's a local profile or domain profile it's going to act the same way if you run it as admin or run as different user but this is what happens in the background while you're doing all of this stuff. Okay, so I'm just going to reply to customer and say, hello, Larry, I've created a local admin profile named local admin. And the password is you know, XXXXX, whatever. This is not necessarily what you want to do because then everybody will see it. Matter of fact, I would just tell them what it is, but we're, I'm just gonna pretend like we're doing this, which you shouldn't necessarily do at all because, you know, whoever looks at your ticket and God knows how many people, they'll know what the local admin uh, login ID is and password. So you might want to just, you know, tell him, or I don't know, whatever the, 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 the settings are or whatever the setup or requirements are for the company uh, when it comes to dealing with, you know, giving out passwords like this and login IDs as well. The second ticket is about email not working. It's a very particular one because it does have an error that comes up. So pay attention to that error and then we're going to work through it together. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video is about help desk tickets. Most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what Help Desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to Help Desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. Next one is my email is not working. By Mr. Mike Moser again. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. You will get this quite a bit. And um, if you guys want to guess, I'll pause briefly by talking about it and you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets, but but first, uh, email's not working. I gotta assign it, assign it to myself so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid when my boss look at, looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is, my email is not working and then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in my premiere video, why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PCA support. And by, you know, chances are, uh, the Mike Mike Moser here uh, already knows us, knows who we are, so maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case. But, you know, if you don't know him, keep doing it. It's part of the job. I have your... Sorry, guys. Ticket about 
email not working did you by chance change your password recently so guys this is exactly what i'm suspecting here is that either his his password mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the window some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can for which you can change the password on just a website like one of the websites will use that single sign-on that single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login so when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on, also known as SSO, it's going to ask for your domain login. If your domain login's password expired that day, it's going to ask you to change that password. When you change your password on the website, your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away. What do I mean by that? Your computer that you're logged in, you're still logged in with your old password. So what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs. If you don't, you get this pop-up. This is what happens. And maybe, also, maybe, he locked himself out out of the computer. So we're going to concentrate on that. And with the reply, I suspect it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue. What we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password because maybe they forgot the password, typed it in 10 times and then now they're locked out and their Outlook doesn't have their current password, you know. But this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't, again, replicated on their local computer. The websites that use the password are fine but the system itself hasn't received the new password. And that's the issue here, most likely. So we're going to go inside of Active Directory. And this is my virtual server here. And I'm just going to log in real quick here. I'm going to open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing help desk may have a web just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as i'm doing right now it may not give you direct access to active directory at all which is normal which is unfortunate but it's normal so you may have different means but you are basically doing exactly what i'm doing and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case so what i like to do is you see the uh, users folder on the right hand. So instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users. We don't know. So what I'm going to do is right click the folder. I'm going to click find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right-click him. Right-click him. And then we're going to click Reset Password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like, what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you 
Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he's locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your computer like this. Lock your computer, Mike, and then do control all delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system. It will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. What I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way, it's going to ensure that everything in the background running whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office. If you may, keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell him, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add external node here and say, resolve issue by password reset I'm going to keep it simple like this and this will resolve this issue I guarantee it guys thank you so much for watching I really appreciate you I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced tier 2 tier 3 system admin network admin and whatnot I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has a lots of written material you can check out, and especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job. So interview questions and answers, I have a lot of that stuff. All right, thanks again. Please share a like and leave a comment. Thank you so much. Welcome to Tech Support TV. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. Today's video is all about tickets. We're going to use a Jira ticketing system to learn help desk. I will teach you from the beginning on to how to navigate and use this system. And also we will use this system to work many, many different issues, meaning tickets that come through the system. We're going to work them and there's going to be a lot that I'm going to teach you. Watching this video, you can pretty much say that you're ready to work help desk. This session is going to be six hours long. And after that, it's going to repeat itself for people that might miss some of the things. If you have any questions, please ask them in the chat box to the right or leave a comment below. Also, if you can join the channel, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me stay awake. It's only $1.99. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy it. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we will learn how to use a ticketing system. This video is designed for new people to help desk tier one or tier two. What we will learn in this video is how to create a ticket and how to work a ticket in a ticketing system. Here's an example of a ticketing system. This is called Jira. I got a recommendation for this from a fellow YouTuber named Kev Tech, if you want to check him out as well. And uh, keep in mind, there are many, many different ticketing systems out there available. 
and uh, a lot of them are proprietary, meaning the company that you work for will have their own ticketing system, but lately or uh, most recently they've all been web-based, just like this third-party ticketing system that I'm about to show you. And when it comes to navigation, working the tickets and this and that, it should be very uh, very much the same as you would do when you work for somebody else. So this is going to be very educational for people who are about to start working on a help desk or just tech support where they use a ticketing system. By the way, guys, if you got a second to like this video, I'd really appreciate it. For this, I'm not going to play an ad for you, so I'm going to bother you with that. But if you can take a moment just to click that like button, I'd really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get back to the first thing we need to do. We're going to create a ticket in this ticketing system, but we have to familiarize ourselves. Keep in mind, you are new at the company and you've never experienced this before, chances are. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to uh, look for. Well, this is typically what it looks like. You have a system that's open like this, uh, typically web-based, and then on the left-hand side, you got a few different tabs that you can select first one is the main queue what well, you're looking at here and when i click on all open and what shows in the middle is all tickets that are open currently these are tickets that come through and then next one is assigned to me and if we click on you can see that you haven't been assigned any tickets whatsoever and then if we click on unassigned issues you can also see there however if you keep if you go back to the all open that means that are all there that means that there haven't been worked yet even if it's been assigned so and then of course we have incidents down here and this is going to be based off a top of ticket and then we got service requests changes and problems so these are all different categories for these tickets that are there now not to confuse you or to lose you let's go ahead and create a ticket because this will show you what the ticketing system is about so let's say uh, this reporter here, which is Kobuman1, he is the user that reported all three of these issues. These are all issues that he has. So let's see how he did that. So he went to a system, and he's got a probably similar system uh, that, he, that we see here, and then he clicked on create a ticket or submit a new ticket. And the first thing that they're going to do is select an issue type, which is right here. Don't ignore this part where it says project this is just because i'm an admin to this so ignore this what they're going to look at first is issue type this is what's going to ask you and they're going to either have a drop down here or they're going to be able to type in the type of issue that they have so they can just type in report an incident and if they select that for example that's what would going to be selected so whatever it is that they have chances are there's either a an article on how to fix it themselves if it's like some kind of a minor software issue but they in general they will have a way to search for their problem and once they do they will come across that problem they would select it so for example if they would just type in get see help it's going to show up and then they can select that at the same time if they type in like for example name of the website or a program it's going to find that as well, and then they can select that, and that way it's going to be routed to the support team for that specific application, website, system, or software. See, that it's very self-explanatory. So, and the next thing, once they figure out what the problem is, I select the correct issue type here, they can type in the title of it. And it's kind of confusing here that where it says summary, but it's actually just uh, a title. So let's go ahead and pretend that this is a test ticket and we're just going to type in test so that way we have uh, a good so we can track it so we can see how it shows up in the system and then we're going to type in test again because we're just learning how to create a ticket right here and it's going to be very simple if we scroll down there will be other uh, things you can put in there for example a user can attach a screenshot and if they click here they can just add it you know browse it this and that typical they would upload a screenshot of the error if they have and then they can select the component and then if they're savvy enough they'll be able to figure out okay well what is the issue about and they would select that so let's say they you know some kind of actor directory issue they can just select that and then assignment here you can see that it's automatic we can leave that this is some of those one of those admin uh, issues and this is not uh, what uh, a user would see and then you can also 
uh, create a ticket on behalf of somebody else. So I'm going to create a ticket on behalf of Kobuman1, which is the same person that reported the previous issues. That way, um, if, uh, if a user is not able to create a ticket for themselves, you can do it on their behalf as well. Another reason to create a ticket is to also keep track of internal things that you do and you need a record of it. So, you know, doing tickets just as an internal part of uh, what you do is a good way to uh, uh, just have a record of uh, some kind of change that you have done on a computer, PC, or whatever. And then next thing we have is priority. Um, uh, well, actually, we do have approvers, but this is related to whether somebody needs to be approved, for example, to have an access to a specific server, uh, whether they're approved to have email or instant messenger, or even if they're approved to uh, get new software or if they're approved to get new hardware, right? So, and then we have priority here. And priority is kind of self-explanatory. If a big website is down, chances are they're going to select the highest priority or, you know, it's, if it's affecting a lot of people, they can just select highest priority. But if it's nothing big, they can just select lowest priority or whatever, you know? And then of course, urgency is uh, also kind of similar to that, which would, I don't know why they have it twice, but you know, if it's a website down, it's going to be, of course, critical. And then it's going to impact a lot of people. Impact, very uh, important. If it's a lot of uh, people, it's critical and it's the highest priority. It's going to be expensive, widespread. If it's just one user requesting something, it's going to be minor. So, and then pending reason. This is um, if you're working on a ticket and then you need a pending reason why it needs to be approved, this and that. Like, for example, somebody's requesting something. Um, uh, that they would deal with that. Product categorization and this and that, this is usually automatically populated by uh, the system itself. Users wouldn't typically deal with any of this. They would just put in a basic you know, ticket and then you would have to figure this out if it needs to be, uh, you know, if it needs to be um, uh, dealt with or categorized. Uh, there is a category here, optional categorization. We can just select connectivity in case we are working with, you know, a big system downage. And then, of course, there are labels and you can create your own labels, you know. Okay, and then we're going to click create ticket. Now we can see on the right side that there's a notification that came up that's typical in a ticketing system. If you're working the system, if you have it open, you would get a notification that the ticket came through. So if we refresh this, if I click on all open, it's going to refresh it. It may take a second here, but it's going to populate with the new ticket we just uh, submitted. It depends on how fast the cloud is or the storage uh, where the, uh, the ticketing system is at. It may take a moment to come up. Uh, let, me, let me hit the refresh button here. And uh, there it is. There's our test email. And at the same time, you and your group, including the user as well, will get an email notification that a ticket came through. And uh, and that would look some that would look something uh, like this. Here's our three other tickets that are already in the system. The other one just came through as you saw. So you can see that there is a new ticket that came. So you get a, a desktop notification and then you get email notification. All right, now we learn how to create a ticket. That's very simple. Now let's go ahead and uh, work a ticket. Here's a really good one we can uh, pick. So once you're in the main uh, queue, is what they call here, uh, you can just pick any of the tickets and assign it to yourself if you're allowed to do so. Typically, that's what happens. You can pick up tickets, work them, or sometimes a manager assigns a ticket to you. But this time, we have the permission to assign tickets to ourselves, so we're going ahead and do that. We're going to select this middle one, and then we're going to assign it to ourselves. This is going to be slightly different, uh, you know, depending on the type of software you use. But typically, what you want to look for is something like this, where it says assignee. I want to click on that, and then I'm going to assign it to me. I'm going to click on that. And sometimes there's a save button or this and that. This particular system doesn't, and it's just going to assign it automatically. So let's go ahead and go back to our queue, which is click on all open here. And we can see now that it's assigned to me. And uh, I'm going to go back to it, and then we're going to now work it. So how would you do this? There are a few ways of, of working a ticket. Uh, this is going to depend on a preferred contact method that the user has. If we look at this ticket, 
Uh, it's not very detailed, right? And if we click on here, view request in portal, uh, you know, a lot of times you would open it up and there will be more information here, but it kind of looks the same as the other one. So we're just going to go back here. The thing is, though, a lot of systems would specify what type of preferred contact method they would have. For example, I prefer to be contacted with email or uh, there would be their email address there or something like that. I prefer to be contacted with IM or, or do I prefer to be contacted by the phone. So user would typically specify that and you know there would be more stuff, uh, detailed information about them. This system unfortunately doesn't have that information. The only thing we have is ability to reply to customer directly here. So this is what we're going to do. It says here the issue is I have two monitors, both have the same picture. So that means that it's a configuration issue and we can help them deal with that. Uh, if, if they are outside of your company, let's say you're doing tech support you know, for somebody else in a different state, you're not on site, you're not there to help them, you can simply say, if you've never worked with this uh, person before, you can say, hello, my name is Irvin. At, with tech support tech support at STL Missouri so you know you want to tell them hey my name is Irvin uh, I'm with tech support or whatever your name may be and I am at this location so that way they know that you are uh, you know that person it's, it's an introduction it's a simple introduction and then you can say I have your ticket about a monitor right? and it's simple you tell them who you are where you at and that you have their ticket about a monitor this is what you typically do if you're contacting them first time through email or through like for example instant messenger or even if you call them this is something you, you have to let them know who you are and why you're calling them or why you're contacting them since this is a message through the system, through the ticketing system, you don't necessarily have to introduce yourself because they know that the system that they submitted a ticket through, uh, somebody is reaching out to them because of that, right? And then, you know, if you can help, I mean, this is a remote type of thing. If you can take control of their uh, PC and resolve this issue for them, that would be ideal. But if you don't, well, I mean, what can you do? Um, well, you can just at least suggest uh have you tried you know what is it expanding your desktop onto second monitor that's usually the problem when it comes to this right and this is one of those things that you can ask the customer if you can take control of their computer that would be ideal however if you happen to be on site if you happen to be on site that would be even better so um, you can say, may I stop by to take, take a look when would be good for you. So that way you can do go there directly and just resolve the issue. And then now we're going to just click save. This should send an email to the customer and, uh, you know, that should reach out to the customer in some way whether it's they having to have the system up and they get a notification or they would get an email uh, from the system saying hey uh, this tech guy Kobo man is trying to reach out to you this guy named Irvin actually is trying to reach out to you or both usually it would be both so they would get a communication from you so the next thing you would do is add an internal note means uh, that's a, a note for you and the people that work for you or the, not the work for you or with you if they want to know what's going on with that ticket they can look up your ticket and see that you have reached out to user and awaiting feedback right so you can be more detailed about this this is just a basic navigation and notage of a ticket. So 
what we have done here is reached out to the customer. We have created an internal note so that everybody can see that what you've worked on and what kind of work you've done when it comes to this ticket. So let's say your manager is like, hey, uh, what's going on with this ticket? They can look it up and see what you've done, you know. And um, if it's, if it's uh, something you can resolve on site, you can say uh, configured dual monitor. And then click save and now since you've resolved the issue we have configured the dual monitor at this point it's resolved now we can close the ticket right we can go ahead and close it and in this case we have to go over here on the right hand side where it says waiting for support if we click on that it gives you a bunch of different options for the status of the ticket you know you can see that whether you escalated a ticket uh, you know, waiting for support, canceled or completed. We're going to set it to completed. Sometimes it would say resolved or this and that. And now the ticket is completed and closed. And by the way, notice this little eyeball here. That's a watch option. That means how many people are actually viewing and watching this ticket. We can see that both of these guys are watching this ticket. So that means how many people are viewing it and working on it, which is kind of useful actually. So that way you can be like, hey, you know, ping them or, you know, send them a message. Hey, are you working on this too? You know, this and that. And uh, all right, let's move on to uh, another ticket that we can look at. And then if we click on all open tickets here, it's going to bring us back to the, the queue. And we can see now that the other ticket is gone. It's, it's simply gone. It's closed and you'll no longer see it in the queue. Uh, but we do have other tickets we can work on. So let's do one more, which is a bit different. And this is a website down uh, ticket. So this is kind of important. Our website is down. We can't access our main website. And then we can see that the urgency is critical. So of course, we're going to have to prioritize these critical tickets. Now, let me see, does this system actually say in the queue anywhere that it's a critical? It doesn't. So the only indicator you have here is on the left hand side, it's kind of these icons. And you know, this is kind of unfortunate. Uh, that I couldn't show you that that you know um, there there might be some other indicator that it's a critical issue. All you got to do is all the only thing you can do is go by whatever the summary is or whatever the title of the ticket is. So you kind of have to use your own judgment. In our case, I wouldn't have worked the first ticket first at all. I would have worked this one first. So you got to prioritize that. It's very important. But once we click on it, now we can see that it's critical. So, of course, we're going to um, contact them again. But before we do that, since this is a critical, we may want to um, do something else real quick. And this is going to depend on, on your business, whether you're the only one working there or whether you actually want other people involved. So there are options for that as well. And if you look on the right-hand side here, we can add participants. If we click here and add participants, if your manager, for example, is Joe, uh, Joe Joe Schmo <laughs> Schmo did I spell that Joe Schmo let's do that Joe Schmo we're going to add him and then he can watch or even if we have Bob it's a boy uh, you know as a co-worker and he's working with you as well we can add them as participants so they can follow what's going on right so that's pretty cool here as well and then we can have um, Let's go ahead and work this ticket real quick. I'm going to reply. And again, there are no other way to contact them. So I have to contact them through the system. Otherwise, I would have called them, uh, messaged them, and this and that. And then what I would do here in this case, and this is just an example so we can work the ticket, but there are many things that you might want to ask when it's a big issue like this. Uh, the first thing usually I would say is uh, how many, I would say people are impacted. You don't want to say users. Usually that's something that IT would use within itself. You would want to say how many people are impacted. And then uh, when was the last time it worked? Are you using the correct link? You know, stuff like that that would help you resolve this a big of an issue, right? And then later on, uh, you know, if you do realize that it really is a big issue like this, uh, support team 
um, for this specific website that they may be uh, talking about uh, may need more information. For example, host names, IP addresses, this and that. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, typically, you would want more, but you would have to know what the website is and this and that. And this is just going to be depending on the work environment that you're at. Here we are learning how to use the system, not necessarily resolve issues uh, because we don't have enough information, right? So we're here learning how to use a ticketing system and that's that. And then of course you add an internal note right away and says contacted user with uh, requesting, I'm sorry, requesting more information. Now this is an internal note and this means that only you and the people that work the system can only see it. So you can say user this time because we are talking to IT people who might read this. This is for your own note, work note, uh, internal note, and for the people that are IT, user cannot see this at all. So it's okay to say user. Okay, now that we're waiting on that, of course, is a priority. This is something you would actively work on, but we're just going to leave it like it is for now. Now, let's see. Uh, the, the, there are different issues. There are different options here for the this ticket right now, and that's because the issue is literally selected as a problem. Now we have different things, and this is going to you know depend on the type of work environment that you're working at, and then uh, you can see that now we have an option just just to close it. But that's only if it's resolved, and then there's cancel, and then there's under review. I'm not sure why it would be under review. That's kind of a weird option to have in a ticketing system. But I guess it could be related to some kind of an access request uh, for something. But the fact that it's just reported as a problem is kind of confusing. Anyways, now we know how to create tickets, how to work tickets, and how to assign them, which, by the way, we haven't done here. So we haven't assigned it to ourselves. Maybe that's why the option there was a bit different. Well, maybe not. Anyways, again, there are many, many different uh, ticketing systems, many third-party systems, and you just have to kind of adjust to them accordingly. So let's go back and see what else is open. We can see that this one here is assigned to me, that I'm uh, working on it. Let's see on the next tab. Assigned to me, it says zero now, but now it shows up as one because it took a little bit to refresh. And then we got other tabs that you can get into, but these are the basics. These are the basics of working and working a ticketing system that you must know before going to work for a help desk of any sort. And of course, you can look at your own statistics here, and that option is not here. But I think if I click here, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. Cues, back to projects. Usually, managers can only see a report. But then maybe we can view some reports here. Reports, workload, and yeah. So if you're a manager or, or sometimes even as just a TR1 help desk, you may be able to see your own uh, progress. And here it is. You can see that I have one issue uh, that I've resolved. Any more detailed? So yeah, that, that just allows you to you know look up other people's tickets. Uh, satisfactions. These are all statistics that managers only look at. Of course, you want to SLA is also, you know, those metrics of how fast you resolve issues, this and that. But what I taught you so far are the basics you need to work the system as an IT help desk tier one. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is about help desk tickets, most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what help desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to help desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. First topic is going to be about PDF file not working. It's an interesting one. Pay attention on how I deal with this and also how I deal with the customer when it comes to communicating this issue with them. Very important.
first ticket we have here it's called PDF files don't open of course make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it the title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open and in the description it says for some reason PDF files do not work so what do you guys think the issue is here I'm gonna allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer but I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this while you guys do that I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first first I'm going to introduce myself hello my name is Irvin with why I can't spell today with help desk support I have your ticket about PDF files not working can you please send me your computer name or IP address so when I reply to this customer and I click save here it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about and the reason for that is because in this situation we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it but it's preferable if possible for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it if you have to that's fine of course this is going to depend on the company that you work for you know depends on the what the requirements are but chances are if you're help desk you're going to take control of their computer take a look at the problem and resolve it as quickly as possible so for that to happen for us to use remote desktop we're going to need their computer name or IP address both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely so in this case PDF files do not work so number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed so so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files a lot of times that's the main thing or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files but chances are this is what's happening second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing you may have Adobe installed on the computer but if if it's still not or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens that means we need to change the uh, file association we're going to change that right now now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted in this case all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email however they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via you know via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message uh, some you know most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply whatever their preferences are make sure you file make sure you follow that to the T very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with in this case we send them an email and once we get a reply and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer uh, let's say we do get a reply and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them maybe the customer said that the PC name is C-O-B-U-M-A-N-1 so what I'm going to do in that case I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file so I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman1. So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. 
All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association, different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down, and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if, if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming. Uh, we're approaching P. So should be here shortly PDF there it is PDF we can now see that PDF in this case is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge we simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader there you go problem solved uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser which is fine too you just ask them what they want all right all right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry, guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly. But good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues that's fine we know what we did so if anybody else looks at that whether it's your boss or you know somebody has to refer to it to that ticket and see what you did they'll know what you did so issue resolved we're going to close this ticket as such so yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has, has a lots of written material you can check out, and especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job. So interview questions and answers, I have a lot of that stuff. All right, thanks again. Please share a like and leave a comment. Thank you so much. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Let's keep it moving. If you watched my previous videos, you know that I've been on a roll with these help desk uh, tutorials. We're going to keep it moving with third-party software. You have to be allowed to install third-party software, meaning the biggest issue here is obviously having a license. You got to have a license to install third-party software. The second thing is whether it's allowed by the policy in relation to the company on how they deal with security when it comes to type of software. Because some software may be a risk to the company and we don't want to install that and you don't want to lose your job. So it's incredibly important that you uh, are very careful, especially as help desk. But what you take from this video is that you got to be careful when it comes to somebody requesting software. There is a procedure for that and that procedure has to be followed. As simple as that. So let's have a look at how that goes. I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. 
All right, it says I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer. And same thing repeated in the description, and it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike, so you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software, and this guy, is, in this case, Oracle Database, is a third-party software, no matter how you look at it, we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them. So what we're actually going to do, and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email, a reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see, uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install Oracle database on their computer without permission. So here's, here are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Mike here, Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over, requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this, all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello, you guessed it. My name is Irvin. You're going to be doing this a lot, except you're going to be using your own name, of course. <laughs> with PC support, I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's just do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before i install this software i have to check to see if it's on approved software a list so if you send a message to him like this it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say hey i already have it i already have it i just need it installed meaning that i already have it approved of course you have to check that real quick and then sometimes you may have to install it manually but also he mike might actually already have it installed might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer, in which case he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier one would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like uh, database driver installed or something like that and I'll show you that as soon as I uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I you know kind of talk about this part of it but when it comes to help desk tier one you have to make sure number one that it's approved and number two that you install it for them in whatever that might be you may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers and you may help them you may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name and remember we use Kobelman one as a computer name a lot that it has that computer Kobelman one subscribe to Oracle DB so what in, in, in that case it should automatically install itself but it also what he might mean is actually configuration so 
I have to check that, but if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just going to, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration, this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself. And it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver. It would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. You know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there. And then you configure it, whatever the system that you want. So you would just click add, and then you would select which one you want to use. And then you go in through the configuration, set up the ports, IP addresses, uh, server names, or whatever it needs to be. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it. It just depends on the level and the requirements for the company. Again, this is possibly help desk tier two. Definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this. Okay, I'm going to go back to that system. All right, but in this case, we're going to assume that he just wanted it installed. So we went ahead and installed it. I'm going to add internal note install well let's do this let's do this subscribed pc to oracle db means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then i'm going to do this installed software as requested Okay, and now we're going to close the ticket as complete. All right, easy peasy. And there you have it, guys. Just make sure you follow these basic rules when it comes to dealing with this, and it's not going to be a problem for you in the future. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and leave comments. I'm sorry if I missed any of your comments during the premiere. And uh, yeah, I'm not trying to ignore anybody at any point, but if I... If just in case, if I do, I apologize. You can always leave a comment below and I'll gladly answer any of your questions or if you just want to say hi. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. Today we have a combination of videos so that way you don't have to go through and look for these topics. This way you can just sit down and watch the whole thing at once because it's very useful, especially for help desk. The first part of the video is about practical help desk troubleshooting. Uh, it's a very good one uh, because in this example, you're not allowed to use RDP whatsoever. The second part, it talks about Windows updates and how they are important to understand if you're in help desk or even desktop support. And the last part of it, if you're new to help desk or want to get into IT, this last video shows you how to create a resume. This resume is based off my own resume and based off its own success. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment to like. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, let's get into it. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Dameware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description, it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it However, first thing first thing first, we gotta assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I always want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is 
Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me what your PC name is? So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here is just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Kobuman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Kobuman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. The way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace a uh, backslash backslash type in kobuman one and then another backslash. And then we're going to access his C share drive, which is should be enabled by default for your business. It may not be, but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment. It should let you in. You may get a pop-up asking you to log in, and that's fine too. Just use your credentials, and if you have access, that's great. So once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. You can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Kobuman 1, and we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program, and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him, which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile, because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him what is your local profile name? And then he's going to tell you what his local profile name, which is going to be the same thing as his login. So we're going to pretend that the, his login is B-U-C-O. We're going to go inside of that. And typically, typically configuration data for any type of program that's run, there on, that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder. So we're going to click on app data. And then yeah, a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming. So let's have, let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay and uh, because once he launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this. And you can see 
that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, as, as in program that it needs to function, it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile. And the same thing happens with anything else. For example, there's Google here. You know, if you go inside a Google here folder, uh, and if you go, you can see that it's a Chrome. And if you go inside of that, you can see there's user data. Again, this is what I talked about. And if you, for example, go to default, you can see that there is a cache data inside of it. And of course, you can find things like, uh, I don't know, their uh, favorites and stuff like that, which is, by the way, missing on this one, uh, but that's okay. So let's stay on track here. Since we messed with Adobe, I'm going to tell them, go ahead and Adobe, uh, try to open Adobe again. So let's go back to the user's computer. All right, so we're back at the user's computer. We don't need this window anymore. Actually, I'm just going to... Yeah, let's close it. We're going to close it and then we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, so in this at this point, I'm telling them, OK, go ahead and open Adobe. So he's going to type in Adobe and then we're going to click Adobe Reader. We can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at, you know, our point of view as a technician and we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new. And you can see that here that the date is 6-10-2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 1.01 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program. And a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right, now, just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings, that's, an, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop, as long as you have the proper credentials to do so. So on your computer, on your own computer that you're using, your work computer, you're going to open up a registry editor, and you have to run it as administrator. So remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman1 here? And let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function, some kind of key to make it work. We can do that remotely as well. So we're going to take Kobelman1, which is the name of his computer, and we're going to connect to it over the network registry. So we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network. We're going to click network. We're going to put in Kobelman1. We're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network. And it usually takes a little bit, it depends, you know, on, on the setup. But you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group. But a lot of times it would just be a domain name which says new server zero. That's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home. But it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain. It will be the main name first, followed by the computer name. So that means it found it. When it's underlined like that, it means it found it. We can click OK. And we are now directly connected into his registry. So let's go ahead and kind of navigate, see if we can find that Adobe. We're going to expand H key local machine. You know, it's a local machine on his computer. We, we are now connected to it. And we're going to expand H key local machine. And guess the next thing we're going to do. We're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software. But you can see right away that Adobe shows up here. So if you expand that, you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects. So that's not what we're actually worked on. We actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC. So if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for adobe here and expand that and we can now see that there is adobe reader there right there and then if we expand that there's dc and inside of that we can you know whatever we need to make changes to we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved.
okay now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket of course finish up noting your ticket i'm going to add internal note here first i'm going to say issue resolved by configuration and then depending on the environment that you work in you may have to specify what you exactly did in which case we did uh, um, i don't know reset config folder data we're going to save it and then we're going to mark it resolved completed and that's that that ticket oops that ticket should be now gone out of our system and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket all right let's click on this ticket this ticket is called i am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop so in this case there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know it was with deleted or just simply gone who knows maybe it was moved somewhere that happens sometimes too user would just accidentally you know for example they would like if you look at over here they would drag it somewhere and it would go god knows where you know so typically you would say hey can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of you know let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of you can ask them hey does anybody else have a copy of it maybe i can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts we can certainly do that again we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further but we're going to role play and then first thing of course we're going to do assign our ticket assign a ticket to ourselves and then we're going to reply to customer hello this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you thanks you <laughs> thanks Irvin. okay so now user has been asked or you can call them you can talk to them again we're going to go back to the user and you know we're going to get that pc name and in this case we're going to pretend that the same pc name is Kobuman. so we're going to keep doing that the pc let's do this users PC name is Cobalman1. All right. So, kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So, let's pretend that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called Inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is but what if for some reason just using a pc name doesn't work some, there might be an issue with dns so just type in in kobolman1 and you know going inside of that you know shared drive or shared network connection i should say what if that doesn't work then we're going to have to get an ip address and see how that goes so you can ask them too hey what is your ip address and if they're like uh i don't know uh you can just ask them okay well can you go command line this and that but that's too complicated so let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the ip address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know before we do that let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user because we don't we don't want to do that we just want to find that out on our own all right let's go back to our own computer all right so let's say this this wasn't successful and 
this didn't work and for some reason we can't access it using you know Koboman one like so let's say that doesn't work let's say we're not able we get an error or just doesn't you know it just says not found then we're going to find the in uh, their ip address and see if that works so of course the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping we're going to do a quick pingage you're going to type in ping Koboman one and here's our result and guess what it is it's an ip version six <laughs> it's an ip version six i uh if we do this it's not gonna work nothing's gonna happen because this uh systems are not set up to you know what i call backdooring into a computer some people may disagree but this is what i call backdoor into computer you can just type in and usually instead of just a you know pc name you just type in the ip address and same deal let's see if we can get that c share yeah it's not going to work so now we need to actually find what the ip version or translated or i guess translated in, in a way but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent ip version 4 of this ip version 6 uh, ip address so this is ip version 6 that we're looking at here but we want to know what the standard is what the standard ip version 4 is so let's go back to the user's computer you can say hello sir can you please tell me what your ip address is and you can just tell them uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in i don't know there are a couple of ways of getting to it i'm just going to tell them to type in network and then the first thing that comes up is network status and i'm just going to tell them uh why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties and then if we scroll down it gives you a bunch of different information now here's our ip version 6. remember this is our ip version 6 that we tried earlier and it didn't work but luckily we do have equivalent ip version 4 which is right here and that is 192.168.1.102 all right let's go back to our computer all right now let's try that so we're going to backslash backslash 192 and you can see that i accessed that before so 192.168.1.102 and then c dollar sign enter and there it is same thing uh that we can do with uh what you call it same thing we can do with the registry we can connect using the ip address but let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick we're going to go and copy the internet shortcuts folder back into their desktop and now that we are back at user's computer now we can see that internet shortcut has appeared now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing reg edit and then we're going to use that connect network registry let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way 192.168.1.102 okay and again it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on and now it's actually asking me for login id so i'm going to use typically you can use your domain login but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin, uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish my ticket here, you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's in detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete
All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button. It really means a lot to me. That way, I know you guys like my stuff, and I'll keep making more videos because of that. Thank you so much, and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Windows updates. What do we need to know about Windows updates? Let's have a look on Windows updates, how they look like on your computer. I'm sure you already know this, but this is how you get to them. If you click on the Start button and then click Settings, and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you, I'm sure, have seen this happen on your computer, but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing. So here's an example of security intelligence update here for Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So what that was actually was an update for your built-in Windows antivirus software and we could we saw that what they called a KB, which is a knowledge base article about that. Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart so there's a pop-up here that says restart and of course we have a you know big old restart button here so let's kind of dig into this version 1909 why does it say version 1909 well let's see what our windows version is so if you go to search button and just type in w-i-n-v-r v-e-r i'm sorry so if you hit enter it gives you the windows version so here it is it's our version 1909 microsoft version 1909 and again it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific os build so it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what let's just open edge see if it works i've actually seen edge work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it just crashes out of the blue but that's okay we're going to just open it up and we're going to go to googleage and search for our knowledge article is what i call them um don't know exactly what they would call it hey there is no connectivity which is really really surprising because i know i do have connectivity huh cannot connect securely to this page oh there it is that was really bizarre guys i'm not sure it could be my internet that is causing this issue although i did get a new modem just literally last week maybe it's my router maybe i need to change some uh, router setting so here here's our uh KB here, and it's 4497165. Let's see if it refers to that. 4497165. We have double checked that. And here is a knowledge article from Microsoft. Here it is. It's an Intel microcode updates. And now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom. So you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it. And it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903, all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903, all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909, and then all editions, and then there is more. 
So basically, it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909. Okay, and in the summary, it says, it, you know, basically, it's a description of it, and it's an upgrade. It's an update to Intel Microcode for the following products. Uh, of CPUs basically is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel CPUs and that's what the updates is for. So it's we got Demerton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U, and then there's these other ones. We got Haswell's, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just the basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing, the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. Uh, basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have, like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay, you know, these are all just, you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs and they've obviously they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update, but this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update and it's a good example because you don't want to like, you know, you don't want to brick all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to Apps and Features. So I'm going to right click our little start button here. We're going to click Apps and Features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, add remove software or program that you've probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We were looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above turn on Windows features on and off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column. And there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have the actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. 
So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed. And it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2560063. Is that what it was? That's right. 256 five zero six three two five six five zero six three and here it is the first update for microsoft windows and it's very vague we don't know what this is so this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is so it's kb four five five six seven nine nine all right let's see four five five let's see my short term memory it's really early in the morning so i can't <laughs> exactly sometimes 6799 6799 <laughs> i had my coffee but my short memory is not that great so let's see here again <laughs> march march 12th that's when it was created and if it's 4556799 we're going to click on that i'm going to move it up here and see what that is all right, so here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again, and uh, you can certainly read that as well, and you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry, it was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is, it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on, improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security on Windows perform basic operations. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that. It's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system. So here's a security update that I wanted to show you and it's KB4552152152. Uh, Let me see if I can remember that. 21552. Nope. I need more coffee, guys. 45521. 2152. Okay, there it is. Alright, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, 4552152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the promise to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, alright, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. <laughs> There's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that and when it comes down to it it's up to it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information and it again this is kind of disappointing but it is very very vague very vague um, when you do desktop support you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that which is a great thing otherwise I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this 
Now, when it comes to these type of updates, Microsoft is 100% in control. And, and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing, and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they're safe and you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them. And that can take sometimes up to a month or even more, depending what the update is. But you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff. And yes, I know most of these things you can just literally you know, just install and test it. If it's a minor update or it's just update, you know, this and that, you still don't want to like install it and say, hey, it works fine on this computer. No, you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week, I want to say, with some computers being used, actively used to see if everything is okay, just to make sure that that is cool. Hey guys, here we go again. My name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. We're continuing where we left off. Our previous video was about Outlook issue. Today, it's going to be about a printer. I'm going to work the printer ticket. I'm going to show you how to install a printer for a user and how you can also communicate that with the user in a proper way so it's not confusing because there are multiple things you actually have to get from the user in order to do this properly. It's a really good video for a help desk. That being said, it's based or it comes from my large video that I made that's about two hour long training specifically for help desk. If you want to check that out, it's right there. And that being said, please take one second to like the video. I know I say this every video, but thank you so much, guys. You're awesome. All right, let's get into it. By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says, I need help installing a printer. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're gonna, you know, I'm I'm we're gonna fight through. We're almost almost done here. I'm trying to install a printer, but it's not working. We're going to reply to the customer. I say hello. My name is Irvin. With Help desk, what kind of printer are you trying to add? Local printer or network printer? Now this can be confusing to, to the user, to the customer. Because what I'm actually trying to figure out it's actually are they at home are they working from home are they trying to add, add a local printer or are they trying to add a network printer which is actually in an, an office but to them network printer could also be a local printer sometimes they don't know you know but that's okay we're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on but we can also say also can you please send me your PC name with and you know what let's 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 hold off on this part of it because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial so if they first reply and say and usually I, I like to be more proactive but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault, necessarily. this is just how human mind works. They can't multitask. If I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer, for somebody that works from home. This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager, whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they, some people are not allowed to print either depending who they are. But chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a, 
there there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues so we got to be careful about this we got to find this out um, if possible I would call them and talk to them uh, if not I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over I am and not necessarily over email I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we we need to find out but in this case let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply say okay in that case can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add let's do this I can add the printer for you however I need your PC name to take control remotely so you gotta word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're gonna do this so let's kind of go over it again. Okay, I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control control remotely. And can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? So of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name. And I didn't want to say, can you send me your PC name or IP address? Because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer and I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer IP address of the printer trying to add you see what I'm saying keep it as simple as possible but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner once we get this information we're gonna to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson and the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed we're gonna go to the search bar and you, you can get to this through the control panel as well but I'm going to say devices and printers here we go printers and scanners devices and printers we want to get to here guys this is this is where you can see devices and I'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what I call Mickey Mouse version of Windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one we can simply click here the printer I uh, here I'm looking for the pl the printer that I want isn't listed other way of going to this here is control panel devices and printers here and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before this is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here it's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers so every device you know whether it's a USB or or whatnot or monitor or you know the headset that we talked about earlier and of course if there are any printers they will be listed here but of course there is a button guess where we need to go we're going to click on the add printer and this is the same thing we looked at earlier but this is just how it looks like that's how it used to look like before before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff you know and uh, 
they they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing which doesn't make sense to me why not just keep it the way it is where it's just one place for one thing you know anyways that's a different video okay so it's not going to find anything what i'm going to do is click uh the printer that i want isn't listed so same thing we did earlier and then here you can add the printer multiple ways where it's a bluetooth wireless local printer blah 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 select anything that you want but in this case we're going to select and network printer which is going to be added using tcp ip address or host name or an ip address that we got from the customer and here we're just going to type it in for example 168.2.1 whatever it's whatever the static ip address is for that printer it's going to have to be a static ip address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we got to have a static ip address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're going to leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use what that does it pings the printer and says hey i'm trying to add you but do you have a driver and then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer it's going to have that driver it's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it you know same thing when you're adding a local printer you may have to download the driver install the driver but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer you know once you click next it may if it doesn't find if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to uh, nothing's going to happen here so i can't really show you this at this time but what happens it's it's going to say okay i found this ip address i know it's a printer there but which one is it and then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model like for example xerox blah 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is that the which type of printer that you're trying to connect so if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically you're going to have to ask the user can you tell me the name and model of that printer so that way you can get those drivers and install them properly once you do that it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default kind of like this so if you see one like that just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants he or she wants and then make sure it's set as default see if you have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle okay and now we're going to add a external or internal note i should say added printer as requested ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining me in today's session today's session is going to be help desk tier one tier two and desktop support based i have received feedback from the community when i asked for ideas for the next help desk video simply because i am running out of ideas so if you guys want me to talk about specific things please let me know in discord there is a link in the description of this video so again if you want me to talk about something specific uh, please let me know in discord and the reason i'm doing it like this is because i simply ran out of things to talk about i really appreciate people that did respond to me in my last inquiry asking for assistance when it comes to topic ideas please keep them help desk tier one tier two or desktop support related however if you do have ideas about more advanced stuff also let me know as i can make separate videos for those thank you so much so first Ticket is based off my feedback that I got from Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Uh, you know who you are. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an idea for this ticket. So let's have a look. And the first ticket here says, I can't log in to my computer. And the error is domain not available. So the reporter name is Mike Moser. And Mike here says, please help me. I only get an error domain not available when attempting to log in. So I'll log into his computer, right? I am able to log in using my phone app to contact help desk, so I don't think it's my password. So here's what's going on. Uh, this user, whenever they try to log into their computer, they simply just get this message. It says domain not 
available. And there are a couple of different reasons for this to happen. And the first one is the computer simply needs to be joined the D, D domain that it belongs to. So that way it doesn't get this error. And the second uh, reason for it is that computer is simply not connected to the network of any sort, you know, physically. Um, if it's a computer that is like work from home type of computer where it simply needs a network or internet connection, chances are this would not happen, although it may. I've seen that happen as well. But generally speaking, when it's work from home, uh, this would not necessarily happen. Uh, but the, the reason you would, the second reason you would get this is when you're not physically connected to the network that the computer belongs to uh, when it comes to the domain itself. Okay, now I digress. Let me tell you what domain is. There are a couple of different domains, right? There is a first domain that you can think of, right? Here's, for example, cosmicnova.com. That's one example of a domain. Cosmicnova.com is literally name of the domain. It's also known as the website, right? So that's that. However, it's different from a business environment. Business environment has its own domain, which all the computers on that network are joined to specifically. And that is found on their computer properties. So this is just one way of getting to it. It doesn't matter which way you get to it as long as you get to it. But if you right click this PC, for example, or just go to system settings, you can just type in system settings or something like that. And it will get to this point. And the the part where you want to look at is here where it says computer name, domain, and work group settings. This computer is on a local home network and it's joined this work group here where it says new server zero. In a business environment, it would literally say domain here instead of work group and it would give you the name of the domain, which looks like this here. This computer here, so this computer here, if we look at the same settings, you can see that it literally says here domain instead of work group, and it gives you the name of the domain. You, have, you see how it says here tech support dot dot com. It's kind of similar to what we saw as a website, for example, cosmicnova.com that I showed you, but it's different. This is just for the business. That's the name of the business. And that's what is going on with this ticket. Again, let me show you here comparison real quick. This is what my local computer looks like. You see it says work group instead of domain. But then this one here, here it says domain. So if the issue here is, I'm just going to minimize this here. If the issue here is that this user's computer needs to be added to the domain, this is how you would do it. You would go back to the system and you would go to advanced system settings and then under computer name here the very first tab you will get an option to change computer name and then if you look down here where it says to rename this computer or change its domain or work group click change and then you would select literally change select domain and then type in what was it tech support dot cobuman dot com is that what we had here? I know we did. I just want to show you that it is in that tech support dot .com. Minimize this real quick. And then we're going to click OK. And after that, you have to reboot the computer. See, it's not going to do it now because this is a local computer and the other one is just a virtual machine. But you would get a notification that says, do you want to join this computer to this domain? If you something like that. It's been a while since I actually manually had to do this. It's super rare. But I digress, it would say, it, you would have to reboot afterwards and then it would be added and it would here would say, it would say domain instead of work group and it would be tech support .com. Now there is a, there are other reasons why this might happen. It could be just an error in the, in the system itself, the operating system. But another reason also could be is that this computer is not physically connected to the network where the domain is located. So if it's like a business environment, let's say it's a large building and the computer gets this error, um, you know, it's either what I said before is that either it's not added to the domain or it doesn't exist on the domain or it's not physically connected. So you might want to check the cable. Just adding a quick note while editing this video. This can also happen whenever user receives a new computer and they don't log into it before taking it home, meaning that you have to be connected to the domain 
for your first login so we can create a domain based login or local profile for that user this is why this error happens otherwise at home they can just use their password and log in locally even though it's not connected to the network or domain of any sort uh, th these are the only things I can think of right now when it comes to this error and that's is how I would deal with this specific issue so if this user is at an office I would physically go there and um, you know make sure that the computer is you know plugged in if 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 it's, if it's a guy that's literally within the same building I know some people do tech support or you know desktop support or whatever in a building where there's like I don't know 100 users 200 500 doesn't matter they can physically go to their computer and check all these settings make sure they are added I can't think of any other way to do this instead of having physical access because you can't log in so you can't really take uh, control remotely if this is somebody who's working from home for example and this really shouldn't be happening when somebody's working from home and the reason I'm uh, mentioning working from home is because obviously a lot of people are going to working from home especially in the current situation but I've seen it happen couple of times and for each one of those times user had to bring the computer back uh, to the office or you know location where you can actually make these changes the reason being is so you can physically connect it to the network so that way you can re-add it in there um, using a local admin so by the way in order to make those changes where that I showed you in there when you go to advanced settings to add the computer uh, in this case you might have to do it using local administrator privileges and uh, it depending on the business setup business environment you may be able to because here's what happened in order to for you to do it remotely to add the computer back to the domain which still may not work properly because they're working from home but let's say you are somehow doing it you would have to get local admin uh, login so that you can actually log into the computer to begin with and then make the changes here right you'd go in and make the changes otherwise you have no other way of doing it and you would have to literally have the user type in all the information and you would literally have to guide them to do it and you know whether your company allows this type of thing it, re realistically it's best to just have them bring it to the tech guy at their office and just have him deal with it but hey every company has different rules maybe you are allowed to do this maybe you are allowed to share this information uh, local admin uh, password uh, with with the, <laughs> with the user I don't know uh, but this is how you would go about resolving this okay so I'm just gonna reply to him and say uh, well first of all I would talk to him I would talk to him on the phone and uh, make sure that this indeed is the error and that he can't log in any other way and uh, I'm just gonna say in this case just to be safe okay uh, can you please bring back the computer to the office so we can fix it and you can provide details typically on a ticket when you're adding um, internal notes or any notes you want to be specific uh, in this case I don't necessarily want to be specific if I'm just talking to them but since I'm talking to them on the phone I highly suggest that you do talk to them on the phone uh, if you can't you know if it's again if it's not at the local office make sure that uh, they're already aware why you want men, why you want them to bring it back at, at least give them that doesn't matter whether I understand it or not uh, this just tell them this is what you have to do and this is how we can fix it you know and then I'm just gonna say computer needs to be added to domain and again this is all with the assumption that I'm talking to the customer I already talked to them and ensured them uh, that this is going to get fixed and how I'm gonna go about it so I'm just putting down basic information and instead of just you know this is just a formality at this point okay so we're gonna wait for the customer to um, come back by the way I forgot to assign this ticket to myself I really got into it. it's been a while since I uh, made some of these help desk ticket based videos so yeah make sure you assign the you know ticket to yourself and uh, we're gonna get back to it 
and possibly route it to the local IT tech support people, depending how your computer or, or how your tech support is set up. You may have to route this ticket to them, but in this case, he's just going to bring it to me and I'm going to just resolve it. All right. Next ticket, it's thanks to uh, feedback from this gentleman on Discord. Uh, let me show you here. Well, first of all, let's uh, let's read the ticket. It's the ticket that I created based off of uh, his feedback and idea. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, is I forgot to change my password and now I can't log in. And it's kind of specific here in description. It says, "Hi, I forgot to change my password last Friday, and over the weekend my password expire. I can't log in to change." So it's kind of specific to the way why he can't log in. It says, I forgot to change my password last Friday and over the weekend my password expired and I can't log in to change it. Usually, usually customers or users would get notifications on when the password is about to expire. And I've also seen where, you know, user either forgets or just kind of ignores it because sometimes you just get one notification i've seen that too it's only one notification like 14 days before it expires or something like that uh, and uh and that'll be pretty much it and then they forget about it but the reason i made this specific ticket is in a scenario that this gentleman on discord described to me again i appreciate your help and here it is what he says mr rtm thank you and it says, if I catch a help desk call and user wanting to reset their password, uh, I'm sorry, if I catch a help desk call and a user wanting to reset their password uh, to easily guess passwords such as password or password one, two, three, I advise them that their desired password is not very secure to coach them and how to make the password more without driving them crazy or resort to writing it down somewhere. So he's giving an example of how he's handling um, password resets whenever he uh, works basically a help desk uh, call. Or I'm assuming, at, from what I gathered, he works at a location where he probably takes turn, and he can correct me if I'm wrong here, he probably takes turn on basically on answering a help desk call that probably comes through their central line for the tech support guys at, at uh, locally probably there. And then he says, off-site users do not get system notifications of when their password will expire. You see, this is something I kind of touched on. I've seen it. Usually, Windows will just say your password. You get a pop-up notification. And it kind of goes away to the side. And a lot of people don't see it. But in this case, they don't get any notifications, which is something wrong with the system. To help with this, I let them know when the new password will expire, expire and we built expiration date into the new password. Uh, so he has to let them know. Uh, but see, I'm not sure if he means that he set the system to do this, but I don't, I don't think so. Because uh, from when I talked to him l l further down, it didn't, didn't seem to be the case. And then it says here, for example, if the new password expire on 12.16, we might use something like this password without quotation marks. So he's giving me a really good example of a short but a secure password. This is a really good uh, password. It has a combination of with the asterisk as a symbol and then combination of numbers. And then it says, I tell them with, I tell them about one of the passwords checking, checking sites. And on one of the sites, the password check results are that that would be take computer 23 years Okay, so he's basically giving him an example of, hey, this is a secure password. It's really simple to remember, but if you want to test your password on how long it would take to crack, you know, he's basically saying that uh, to the user that the password is very secure. They don't necessarily have to worry about it. And uh, it says our password lasts 90 days, which is normal before the account gets disabled. So the new password is strong enough and it's not... Uh, so complex that they would struggle with it. The password also checks all the requirements for the password complexity. So yeah, this is a really good password. Um, the, what I find interesting about this is that he is given him permanent passwords. Typically, in a business environment, uh, what you want to do is give him a temporary password. It, it, again, it, this highly depends 
on the environment, on what business prefers. Uh, but when it comes to security, you you realistically you realistically want to give them a temporary password in Active Directory. So if we go to Active Directory here again and uh again i'm sorry well again well yeah again because i made a lot more videos about active directory and uh <laughs> so yeah it's again and uh, it's just kind of finicky here i had to send them send that alt control delete so i can get to the login part of it anyway so when you typically go in and let's find mike moser here mike moser and you know somebody says my password is expired you would just basically change their password and give them a temporary password meaning that whatever i type in here for the new password i confirm password and then leave this checked which is checked by default it says user must change password and next log on it's a temporary password so whenever they log in they will create their own hopefully in a perfect world, a secure password like this gentleman suggested. But since in his uh, situation, in his business, the notifications for the password expiration have been expired and probably for some other reasons too, uh, probably because they can't log in. Uh, he has to give them a permanent. This is, I'm assuming these are remote. Well, he, it is say offsite users. These are all remote users, so they can't uh, type in the new temporary password in at all uh, because their current computer will only take their old password. So chances are they can log into the computer, but they can't uh, change their password at all. So the computer wouldn't even register because it's not connected to the VPN at, all, uh, VPN at all, and it's not connected to the domain. It doesn't have access to the to, to the business network. I'm sorry. One more note. Man, this goes to show that there are so many things that can go wrong that to think about when it comes to resolving these type of issues. But another reason person cannot log in to VPN to change their password is because when your password expires, your account is locked. So your VPN will not allow you to log in at all. This is why he is giving them permanent passwords, which enables their account once more. So he doesn't realize that the password has been reset or changed at all. So he has to give him a permanent password, which is something I've done and still do occasionally because this is the only way. And then later on, I offer them uh, an option to actually change their password again. But once they're connected to the VPN, then they can set it to whatever they want. So this is the setup that they have over there. And which is fine. This is how his business runs things, you know, however, Technically speaking, it's a security risk to for him um, also to know the password for all the users, you know. And again, I mean, this is technically speaking, you know what I mean? If the user is fine with that, um, you know, that's fine. This is a very secure password. And if the business uh, gives 100% trust to the tech support guys there, that's perfectly fine too. Who am I to judge? But technically speaking, uh, it's more secure to uh give them for them to have their own password I, I mean you can argue this back and forth uh, i can see uh, I, I can argue for both sides either way as you can tell but you know in this case this is what's uh this is the situation for this gentleman and then it says here users and then i asked them uh because i wanted to clarify uh does this user not get password notification with vpn and then and then I realized that they were off-site. So chances are they wouldn't even get it. Uh, but because the, the the notifications are not working to begin with for some reason. So even before it expired, they didn't get it. But of course, if they're not on VPN at all, it's not going to... You know what I mean. It's What is there to send if there is no connection? What is there to send a notification if there is no connection? Just like you get notifications for YouTube or any other website, you have to have network connection. In, in that case, would be outside internet. So and it says here, users uh, used to get notifications at the login prompt, but that quit a few years ago and our company, uh, our company went to a password page, uh, page off of our internet site. So 
I'm not sure exactly what he's talking about here, but I suspect it's some kind of website where you can just use a single sign-on. There are some websites that are set up to be reached uh, just over the internet company website, and you can use your domain login, and uh, like that, you can uh, access basically, you know, company resources without actually having a sump company's resources, not necessarily the network itself, but through the website, which is kind of a proxy in this sense here, a proxy way of getting to something on the uh, for the on, on the company. Um, th there is usually a website that's set up that you can access just using your credentials. And a lot of times they're just SSO credentials, meaning single sign-on. The other issue we found was that the users get got confused in the Windows login, and it was prompting for a change. So we pretty much advised them if they get a notification to get to go to the internet site for now. So yeah, it looks like they have some kind of a website set up for that to help them deal with these password issues and to check probably to check let them check uh, when their password is going to expire we are implementing a ping sso system that should complete later this year um, and uh, but the awareness training of a secure password doesn't drive you crazy like sticks with them and and crazy sticks with them um so yeah so he basically goes around and trains and he mentions this uh, users that you can have a secure password without actually having it be too complicated and it says I actually teach this in a security awareness training in the new employee orientations so he's a really good guy he's going above and beyond when it comes to teaching passwords pass security basically I also plan on taking a laptop um, on a rolling cart throughout the hospital and spend a few hours just letting users come up and check their complexity of their current passwords so he also plans uh, to go around. He, you know, th this is really cool, actually. I work, uh, right now I'm working from home because of the whole situation, but I also work in a building. It's kind of a campus type of building with three built buildings connect together. And that's pretty cool when you can actually, you know, grab a cart, put your laptop on and just go around and just help people. You know, that's really cool and fun. And then he's gonna do that. He's gonna go around and have people check the complexity and i have a feeling that what he's talking about here is that he has a password uh testing website that he they can go in and type in their password and it will take their it will test the complexity or security of their password which is pretty cool and um and then he says if it's not very complex i show them how to improve and still be easy to remember yeah this is really cool i I really like his feedback and just different way on how he's dealing with things uh, when it comes to tech support. It's very interesting and a bit different from the things uh, that are done, the way things are done uh, in, in, in my particular business environment, but nonetheless still valid in my opinion. And then he goes to talk about we have outside clinics that are not part of a hospital or have remote access to our patient records and have stress preserved. Uh, have stress password security for with everyone and I stress password security with everyone that's cool I like that and then their help desk um, is aware of this uh, probably practices the same type of thing and that was pretty much it I kind of uh, tried to get more understanding of what's going on but then and and then why the basically issue wasn't addressed to begin with which in this case is the fact that they're not getting notifications for the password resets in his environment but it's something that he can't help a lot of times we are limited even if we want to help we are limited in a company that um, that doesn't necessarily want you to mess with things that are above your pay grade or don't give you the tools to do it you know so the way i would deal with this issue is same way i would actually uh, call them and talk to them especially if they're a remote user and set up this password just like he did it i would give him a permanent password i, I made actually a video about this and which i dealt it with the same way um, it was a i think the video is called vpn password or something like that I highly suggest to, uh, for you to actually watch this if you're interested in this specifically as I expand on that um, in that video as well and how you would uh, deal with that. But yeah, if 
you know, if the password has expired and they can't change it, I would do the same thing as this gentleman. I would give them a, a permanent password and uh, offer them to uh, basically reset their password again so that they can get a prompt to change it again. You know, give them a temporary password. But this is after they log into the computer with the permanent password that I've given them, just like that gentleman explained. And then, assuming that I'm talking to them on the phone, I'm just going to call this, uh, I'm going to give it an internal note for my boss. I've reset user's password and just call it that. I'm not going to leave anything else there because it's it's uh, redundant. Um, that's all I've done. That's all there is to it. If management is completely aware in these type of situations that uh, if you, somebody's on a VPN and they can't change their password, this is how you would do it. You know, there's no other way unless there's some kind of weird system set up. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's all there is to it for this particular ticket and of course i would close it if you want to know more about how to use ticketing systems i have a lot more videos that i've already made on how to literally use specific uh, ticketing system in this case jira service desk very popular so uh yeah you, in this case you can just go in and just mark it as completed and so on and uh, yeah i have uh, lots of videos like this that are uh, the work a lot a lot of these different type of tickets and issues if you have more recommendations guys please let me know i am there are so many things i can think of uh, i can't always come up with new ideas so i really could use your help on this i will gladly talk about anything that you have um, that, that you have issues with matter of fact the gentleman that uh, gave me an idea uh, for this last ticket he also um offered his help and whatever you know and there are other people who are who are there for that as well so uh, if you you know if you have time and, and let's say you're working help desk and you come across something interesting let me know and uh you know i'll create a video on how to solve it or some you know something like that if it's more advanced i'll create a separate video hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobelman today's video is all about tickets 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 Help desk tickets. We're going to work on some of the most common ones that come through the system. So if you're into help desk, by the end of this video, you will know how to work help desk pretty much. I mean, there are going to be some of the most common things that will come across. I promise you that. So it's going to be a longer video. This is why it's going to be a premiere video. So if you want to interact with me on the right side where the chat is, you can too. But if not, well, sorry to have missed you. But if you have comments or questions, feel free to leave them below as well. I'll gladly help you out with whatever you need. One thing to keep in mind, the way I teach IT is very particular, very proactive, and very easy to follow. This is what kind of separates me from other people, which is perfectly fine. People have different ways of teaching things, but the way I do it is in a very proactive way. Not only do I talk about on how to fix a computer problem, but also how to deal with the customer at the same time while you're doing so. So I hope you like that type of style. All right, that being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, and let's get into this uh, awesome video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that there is a lot to do here. We have what looks to be 12 tickets that we're going to work in this entire session. So keep in mind, if you're watching this while it's premiering, while this video is premiering, I am in the chat box as well. So if you want to interact with me, ask me any questions while we are watching this video together, feel free to do so. I am available to answer any of the questions that you might have, or if you just want to say hi, that's perfectly fine too. I more than welcome that. I love to hear from you guys. Okay, so we have a lot of tickets, guys, and now we have to prioritize. Of course, we have to use common sense here, and we're going to go for the tickets that came in first. The way we can tell is by looking at the date and time, but we can also look at the uh, ticket number. So that being said, we're going to select this one, which is ISD 15. We're going to work that one first. Of course, if you see a ticket that says big system outage, make sure you prioritize that because it's affecting more people. 
it's more it's going to impact more people so you make sure you prioritize that otherwise you just work tickets in the uh, order received all right first ticket we have here it's called PDF files don't open of course make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it the title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open and in the description it says for some reason PDF files do not work so what do you guys think the issue is here I'm gonna allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer but I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this while you guys do that I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first first I'm going to introduce myself hello my name is Irvin with why well, I can't spell today with help desk support I have your ticket about PDF files not working can you please send me your computer name or IP address so when I reply to this customer and I click save here it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about and the reason for that is because in this situation we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it but it's preferable if possible for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it if you have to that's fine of course this is going to depend on the company that you work for you know depends on the what the requirements are but chances are if you're help desk you're going to take control of their computer take a look at the problem and resolve it as quickly as possible so for that to happen for us to use remote desktop we're going to need their computer name or IP address both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely so in this case PDF files do not work so number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed so so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files a lot of times that's the main thing or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files but chances are this is what's happening second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing you may have Adobe installed on the computer but if if it's still not or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens that means we need to change the uh, file association we're going to change that right now now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted in this case all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email however they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via um, via you know via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message uh, some you know most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply whatever their preferences are make sure you file make sure you follow that to the T very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with in this case we send them an email and once we get a reply and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer uh, let's say we do get a reply and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them maybe the customer said that the PC name is C O B U M A N 1 so what I'm going to do in that case I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file so I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman one 
So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman 1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming, uh, we're approaching P. So should be here shortly, PDF. There it is, PDF. We can now see that PDF, in this case, is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge. We simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go, problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too, you just ask them what they want. All right. All right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly, but good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to Change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or you know somebody has to refer to it to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Stay very professional when you're working tickets uh, for any company and always be polite. All right, moving on. So we're going to work on this number 16. We worked 15, so we're going to work this one. It says website is super slow and then in the description it says every website I open is super slow. So what could that be guys? Tell me if you're watching this in a uh, when it, in, if you're watching this while it's premiering. See most of the time when we think of websites running slow we think of internet, right? We think of internet and yeah, that's that's one of the most logical things we can you know, consider as causing the problem, which would be slow internet, right? But internet may not necessarily be slow. Maybe there's something going on on the computer that could be causing this. Again, this is one of those things we can uh, resolve. In my opinion, the best way to resolve it is to actually take a look at the system again. So we're going to go in here again to say, hello, my name is... Irvin, we're contacting the customer again with tech support. I can help you with slow website issue. Can you please provide PC name or IP address so that I can take a look? We're going to do it like this, guys. So, as I said, the main thing to kind of consider as a website running slow, and in this case, every website is running slow. It's not just a specific website. So it's not an issue with just one website. It's all websites. 
yes, internet could be running slow and that could be the main reason, but there could be also something in the background that's taking up this, uh, this uh, bandwidth for the internet or not just necessarily in internet, because in this case, user or customer might be considering internet as in every website that they access, while a lot of websites might be internal. So even, even if it's just, um, even if they say that every website is, is running slow, that may not necessarily be the case. So not, that's one thing that, to, that you might want to consider checking, is that you could be just internal websites. So let's say they have five different websites that are only for them, for that business. So that's the first thing I would check and ask as well. Uh, when I'm as, as a follow-up after I get their PSA name, is it all website really, or is it just the internal ones that you use most of the time? Because sometimes users don't know the difference between internet and intranet, while the uh, intranet is uh, being you know the internal websites. Anyways. There are other things that could be causing it. So if it's just a local network that's causing the issue, that's something to consider. So let's again pretend that we got a same PC name. Cobbleman1 is user's PC name. We got an internal note. And the way you put these notes in, it's going to be up to you. As long as you make sure that everything you do is listed in there uh, professionally and, and in in a in, in a descriptive manner so that when somebody looks at it they can tell exactly what you did I know I keep repeating myself on these things but it's very important guys so we're going to pretend that that's the that's the PC name uh, it's simply because I'd, I don't want to show everything on this main PC because this is your main PC that you're working with so in this case we're role-playing okay here we are at users computer Again, the same PC name that we're going to use. So I, I made videos on this too before, but yeah, make sure that you know, check and, and you know double check to see which websites are slow. If it's an internal network, um, if, if it's internal websites, then there's an issue with your network. You may have to contact the network team. That's another issue. But a lot of times it's just the updates that are coming down for some reason. And it could be related to the fact that maybe user hasn't uh, turned hasn't uh, left the computer on or didn't or turned the computer off when it's not being in use. So whenever they turn it on, it tries to install all these updates. And as you can see, there is an update here waiting to happen. And then of course, you can also open up their task manager and just look at their performance, see if there's anything taking up bandwidth. And here we are, just kind of looks like by default we have selected Ethernet. Um, adapter and then we can see what kind of activity we have going on right now right now it looks to be you know just normal usage because I'm using RDP remote desktop so you will expect to see this type of usage but nothing crazy we know that this is not even one megabit per second speed so you know this seems normal and then you can test the websites see what's going on and to kind of go about it in that way look at the processes, see if there's anything working in the background that's taking up a lot of CPU power. They can also make it seem like the websites are running slow. If the CPU utilization is really high, that could be the problem. If you see that, look at what is causing the, what is using the CPU bandwidth or CPU power in that case, and then um, resolve that issue in, in that manner. But, you know, again, Internet is running slow. Check their bandwidth speed. You can do a bandwidth test to see what's going on. I don't want to do it right now because it will re reveal my current IP address. But you can go to Google and just type in bandwidth test. You can do a bandwidth test. If that looks sketchy, you can look into that. There are many other things uh, that, that can cause this. But the ones I've mentioned here are the main reason for this to happen. So... Just kind of look at these things, see if there is anything actually on the computer causing the problem. If everything looks fine on the on the computer itself like this, this is perfectly normal, that could mean that there is some kind of a network issue. In which case, I would possibly, uh, I would possibly route this ticket to tier 2. 
so that way they can reach out to the network people so network team they would reach out to the network team and say eh, you know there's something going on but the chances are you would have multiple users reporting the same issue that's you know but you can also look if you have a setup in the in, in the in the system for your company there might be a place or just like a web page that keeps track of critical issues that are happening right now you can check that page to see if there are any network issues this and that this is a really good start to get you going in the right direction to make sure that there's nothing going on with the computer first because that's your job your help desk tier one and maybe tier two but this is your job to make sure there's nothing going on on the pc that could be causing the problem and move on from there all right in this case we're going to role play and just assume that there are no issues there are no issues at the moment this also happens uh, you know a lot of times where somebody reports slowdowns with the websites but then if it if it was some kind of a background process like updates or you know something in the background that required extra bandwidth or even cpu bandwidth and uh, it may seem like you know website issue but it could by the time you get to it it might be just fine so yeah again i can't stress this enough check all these things first before you put a note down like this at the moment um, and then depending on your environment what i do which i'm allowed to do at my current employer i can say i will keep the ticket open for 24 hours to monitor so I'm allowed to do this um, at my level uh, some help desk places they don't want you to keep the tickets open at all in which case you may have to close the ticket right away so I'm going to leave this ticket open for the time being I'm going to change its status to waiting for support waiting for support well that's us we can't do that so I'm trying to think here, you know what, since I don't want to see an appropriate status here, I'm just going to leave it in waiting for support. Uh, the, the ticketing system I use at my work has something, a lot more specific things that you can actually select. But since we're limited with this current ticketing system for demonstration, I'm going to leave it waiting for support and just kind of keep track of it. It's assigned to me. I'm going to keep track of it that's what matters so we're going to move on from this ticket here okay let's see here the next one is ist 17 it says my documents are missing all right let's have a look and again we're going to make sure that it's assigned to us very important and uh, it says here my documents are missing i found that my documents are missing very simple so this person or this reporter is saying that their documents are missing. We're going to have to figure out which documents are they talking about. So I'm going to reply to the customer. Again, follow the instructions given to you by the customer on how they prefer to be contacted. I'm going to say, hello, this is Erwin with PC support. I have your ticket about missing files can you please provide your PC name so I actually done a video on this already and for that I'm going to actually cut into that so you guys can, it, it, it's the same deal as this. I just want to kind of use it because this is going to be a very long video, as you guys already know. So I'm going to use my previously made video that's literally dealing with this same issue. So I'm going to just kind of plug it in there, and then we're going to continue after that. But for now, I'm just going to leave it at this, and I'm going to close the ticket. But yeah, again, I'm going to show you the video of, of something that I've done exactly like this, so you guys can know how to deal with that so i'm going to close it completed and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket all right let's click on this ticket this ticket is called i am missing internet shortcuts folder and then if you look in the descriptions 
where you can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that, you know, it was deleted or just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of you know let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of you can ask them hey does anybody else have a copy of it maybe i can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts we can certainly do that again we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further but we're going to role play and then first thing of course we're going to do assign our ticket assign a ticket to ourselves and then we're going to reply to customer hello this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you Thanks you. <laughs> Thanks, Erwin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user. And, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kobuman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC, let's do this, users. PC name is Kobolman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that uh, actually let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is i uh these are just the typical ones that i go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever i'm working tickets whenever you know i work as a business system analyst but i do work on tickets especially nowadays now that we're working from home so they need more assistance so this is what i do mostly nowadays uh, simply because different times you know different times guys so now i'm just gonna finish my ticket here you know made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete okay now that we're done with that type of ticket let's move on to this 18 here it says I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right. It says I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer and same thing repeated in the description and it's this guy named mike moser all right mike so you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software and this guy is in this case oracle database is a third-party software no matter how you look at it we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them so what we're actually going to do, and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email 
reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install Oracle database on their computer without permission. So here's here are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Mike here, Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello. You guessed it. My name is Irvin. You're going to be doing this a lot, except you're going to be using your own name, of course. <laughs> with PC support I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's let's do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before I install this software I have to check to see if it's on approved software or list so if you send a message to him like this it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say hey I already have it I already have it I just need it installed meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer. In which case, he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as Help Desk uh, Tier 1 would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like uh, database driver installed or something like that. And I'll show you that as soon as I, uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I, you know, kind of talk about this part of it. But when it comes to help desk tier one, you have to make sure number one, that it's approved and number two, that you install it for them, whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers, and you may help them. You may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name, and remember we use Kobelman 1 as a computer name a lot, that it has that computer, Kobelman 1, subscribed to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So I have to check that. But if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just going to, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration, this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself. And it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver. It would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. You know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there. And then you configure it, whatever the system that you want. So you would just click add. 
and then you would select which one you want to use and then you go in through the configuration set up the ports IP addresses uh, server names or whatever it needs to be so if you're not comfortable with that that's fine you don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it it just depends on the level and the requirements for the company again this is possibly a help desk tier 2 definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this okay I'm gonna go back to that system all right but in this case we're gonna assume that he just wanted it installed so we went ahead and installed it I'm gonna add internal node install well let's do this let's do this subscribed PC to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed and then I'm going to do this installed software as requested okay and now we're going to close the ticket as complete all right easy peasy moving on to numero number 19 my computer is freezing twice a day oh that's an interesting one okay and my computer is freezing twice a day so this kind of related to our to our uh, websites are kind of running slow websites are running slow excuse me uh, take it in the sense that chances are that this is just Windows updates causing the problem so I believe I have a video on this I will show you uh, kind of a clip from that on how to check for issues like this where the computer is causing problems so I'm just gonna plug that in in here uh, and uh, because it talks about the exact same thing what you should uh, check in order to see why a computer is running slow and why it's happening in this case twice a day so I'm gonna cut the clip into that then we're going to continue with our ticket number 20 in the meantime I'm just going to go ahead and close this ticket but then again don't worry I'll show you how to do this and how to check on this ticket and how to resolve it hello my friends my name is Irvin also known as Kobo Man. in today's video we take a look at a call handling for help desk tier 1 in which case user has a slow computer I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well friends if you have a one second please click the like button I really appreciate it this way I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point I really appreciate that it means a lot to me thank you so much so let's get to it I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the backhand in order to help this user this was going to be a fun video guys let's get into it right away thank you for calling help desk tier one support uh, my name is Irvin how can I help you today hi my computer is running really slow is there something you can help me with this for some reason it's just so slow today that I can't do anything no matter what I do everything everything is really slow sure thing uh, what, what's going on when did you start having this issue it started happening this morning it was fine yesterday and then today for some reason it's just very very sluggish I can't do anything I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job all right no problem I can have a look uh, to see what's going on can you give me your PC name my PC name uh... yeah it should be if it should be under your PC information or even there might be a, a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that that it will be either combinations of numbers or letters if you can give me that please I'd appreciate it sure I think I see it here um, it says TM C three five six five eight three zero all right thank you very much for that uh, sir do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you sure go ahead all right let's pause the phone call just for a second here so the user is talking about a slow computer so it's a slow computer situation so what is the major reason for a slow computer in a business environment 
Most of the time when the computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used but chances are if the computer was turned off shut down asleep or any of those reasons it probably couldn't install these updates so now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that that that's not usually what happens in a business that's something that home computers may have issues with for a business type of computer they're going to be up to spec and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates of course there is another reason you know being a virus but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely it's unbelievable so updates main thing let's get back to the customer and tell them about that all right sir so what i found is that uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish uh, Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once we reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens and uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, if that doesn't work then uh, we can help you further see if that works all right I'll give it a shot um, all right I'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens all right great thank you so much for doing that I appreciate that Okay, looks like I'm uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and, and log in, and we'll see how it goes. Now, keep in mind, we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning, but it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards, it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right, let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right, I'm checking. All right, so far so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. Uh, I don't. Okay. Yeah, it, it it seems to be fine now. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and uh, a couple other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing. No problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay. Okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It it's uh I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever computers shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off. Because sometimes the computer won't even update properly, even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer. And uh, that, you know, that should uh, kind of be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right. Will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right. No problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, guys. That's how you handle this type of call. I hope you find this very useful. This is a real-world example, guys, so I hope you really do find this useful because this is exactly what's going to happen whenever you do start doing your help desk tier one tech support. All right, guys. So 
let's take a, a, a brief break. This is a good opportunity uh, for us to take a, uh, I suppose, couple of minute break. If you guys uh, want to, you know, run somewhere real quick and come back. Uh, if you're watching this as a premiere along with me. And uh, I hope you guys are liking this stuff so far. I believe it's very valuable because I'm showing you real life stuff that actually happens. I, uh, I've i said this before and I know you guys that, that are watching me uh, on a regular know that I normally work as a business systems analyst. and But right now, in this current situation we're in, working from home, I'm mostly doing tier tier one, tier two, and tier three or whatever, help desk, but tech support in general for whoever might need issues. So this is a real world experience. And um, if you like it, please click the like button and, and share this video with your friends if you have time. If you don't have time, for me, if you just click the like button is also very, very, uh, uh, very helpful. And I really appreciate that so much. What do you guys think so far? If you if you're watching this in a premiere, uh, during the premiere of the video, please uh, say you know please you don't have to, but if if you want to say something in the chat, I more than welcome it. Otherwise, feel free to leave me a comment uh, in the comment sections um, below. And uh, if you check out my channel, there's going to be a lot more stuff, not just how to teach you, not just teaching you the help desk uh, job, but also how to get these type of jobs. They could be help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, uh, project management. Uh, I, I, there's so much. I think I have almost like 400 videos and they're all longer format, similar to this. I do have hardware videos if you're into computer hardware and stuff like that. I do have those. Um, they're pretty popular as well. Okay, that's it for our break. Let's go ahead and continue and uh, just kind of power through these tickets, guys. We got to make sure we work these tickets. All right, moving on to uh, ISD20. And this one says here, I close my documents without saving. Oh boy, you love to see these type of tickets because there is there is not a whole lot you can do with this. The problem is, you guys know this. If you haven't saved something, it chances are it's gone. There are a few exceptions. Some programs automatically create a save file and it creates a copy of it. In which case, you would go through and 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 um, see if you can recover it like that. Another thing is, and these are things we have to think about before we even before we even reach out to Mike, you know, before we even reach out to this user. We have to think like this, proactively think, very proactively, because we're going to have to try to see if we can recover any of its any of this stuff. The biggest issue here is, and we're going to have to confirm this, is that they close the document without saving. And if there is no automatic save feature in that program, there's nothing we can do. However, sometimes people will actually do the opposite. They would save the document and overwrite what's in there already. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe there is a backup of that same file somewhere that they can look at and compare and see which one is more valuable to them. Because this is a really awkward situation. you got to be very careful with this. So we're going to reply to customer because in reality, there's really not a whole lot we can do to help this customer, unfortunately. Hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. Let's do tier one like this. And you guys can do um, whatever you like, you know, as long as it's appropriate. I have your ticket about closing a document, document 
without saving it. Did you happen to save it somewhere else? Or, or did you just close the window? See, this is, you, you can't, I'm going to put a smiley face there. Because chances are we're going to have to tell him here that, that we can't help him. So sometimes it's okay to use these emoticons to kind of let prepare prepare the user that once you give him the bad news is that it's not your fault per se. So I'm going to send this. It would be different if they just delete an entire document, which, you know, we, we touched on previously. And that there will be places where you can, you know, restore it, whether it's just from Windows Restore Point. Because what happens is when you create a re Windows Restore Point on your computer, it also creates copies. And if you set it up to do it regularly, it'll create copies and backups of every file that you've uh, created and edit it at some point. So you can go back and pick an older one and you know this and that. But in this case, they literally just close the window as far as we can tell. So when they come back and say, yes, I closed it without saving my work that I typed in all day, then we, we may have to say, unfortunately, We don't sorry about that guys. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to recover that file. Once you close the window like that it is gone forever not smiley face so and to make them feel better you can say however I can take a look at your PC to see if I can find a time-based backup, saved backup, but I am not 100% sure there is something there. So you got to give him something. You can word it any way you want. Just make sure you're very understanding and polite about this because chances are, again, that, that there's nothing you can do about this. So do all you can to help them out. See if you can find it. And if not, then, you know, it's just tough luck. You know, what can you say? Don't, don't tell this to the customer. Just be polite, but do the best you can and, to, to you know to help them out that's all you can do in this take it and then once once you do it you just close it I mean this is one of those situations you will come across that that happen that simply happen you know part of working help desk is to actually be in these awkward situations occasionally not all the time but occasionally all right guys let's move on number 21 here ISD Number 21, computer shuts down multiple times a day. Now, I'm going to have to refer this one to uh, being related to either, well, okay, L let me ask you guys, what do you guys think this might be? To give you a little moment to, or, you know, to give some people a chance to actually answer this if you're watching this as a premiere video. Uh, while you guys give me a reply, 
I'm going to assign it to myself and I'm going to reply to customer and I'm going to ask them hello well I'm gonna say who I am first with PC support when your computer shuts down does it give you any error or does screen simply go dark or 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 nothing happens you know what let's leave this this is way more descriptive and it's to a point so all right um, going to have to refer you to uh, my video here or part of the video where I talked about updates because this can happen when if it's just a regular update you get update and it wants to reboot multiple times this happens usually when computer has been turned off overnight and now it's getting updates that's number one reason number two reason bad hardware if they come back and say it it just goes dark you know screen goes black nothing happens it's just it shuts down multiple times then chances are that this is hardware issue in this case we would have to say this um, it sounds like it could be a hardware issue uh, we will need to perform a let's, let's be very descriptive hardware diagnostic on this computer so we're gonna have to say this and we're gonna have to run hardware diagnostic there are different ways of doing this on for example some computers I want to say HP's maybe some Dell's when you reboot the computer and when you hear the boop the boop <laughs> the beep when it's posting you can press for example I don't know F8 F9 F11 I forget exactly which key it is but it gives you to kind of a boot menu but it also gives you an ability to perform hardware diagnostic in this case if the computer just shuts down like this randomly no warning nothing it just goes dark it's a hardware issue to me there's no doubt about that there's nothing else that it could be but it could be overheating so the computer could be just dust dusty inside dirty maybe uh, what's his face needs to be uh, changed like the the uh, heat sink and um, the fan maybe they need to be taken off cleaned out the thermal paste that connects to the CPU needs to be changed and uh, yeah stuff like that when it comes to heat the second thing is that happens mostly and causes this shutdown is hard drive hard drive simply starts going bad and it just shuts randomly shuts down so it's either either one of those things at random so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you have to do some kind of a hardware diagnostic and then that's going to depend on what kind of tools you have available to you as help desk there might be something else you have to do when it comes to resolving this issue these this user may have to actually take their computer to a designated office or place where they would physically bring their laptop to if this is a person that is working from home for example if they're not if they work in an office environment their local IT support um, their local IP support I, 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 IT not IP uh, information technology support or tech support will have to do a diagnostic and figure out what is going on with their hardware every office will have one of these guys maybe not there but maybe a guy that travels between locations that will deal with this chances are if it's hardware if, it, if their computer is under warranty maybe even a technician from for example HP or Dell would uh, check on this and see what's going on when it comes to 
possible hardware issues. So that's how I would go about it. There's really nothing for me to show you here uh, because you would literally just do a diagnostic. For example, you open up a menu and you select test hardware. If it's one of those type of diagnostic software or if it's pre-boot software or you can specifically tell it test hard drive, test RAM, test motherboard. It's as simple as that. And it will tell you if there are any issues with that. And you can also look at device manager and look at um, at there. This is what you could also do. I'm sorry, I'll have to actually tell you what to do. I'm going to go to the computer and um, and let's let's do this here. Let's do this here because I don't want to leave this one just without actually showing you something and not just you know I don't want to just explain it. I'm going to say this users PC name is Cobbleman1. All right, let's go to it. All right, here we are at Cobbleman1. We're going to go to the device manager. I'm sorry, we're going to go to event viewer. Uh, we can also do this in the event viewer. What we're actually looking for is Windows logs, Windows system logs, and we're going to look for errors that come up and these are typical errors that show up when there's a hard drive going bad so we're going to just i'm going to find something here that kind of looks similar to it i forget i forget the exact um when uh, the event id but it will be blatantly obvious to you when it comes up see this computer doesn't have any errors as far as i can tell see it will be related to something like this you see it says ntfs file system is healthy no action is needed when there is something wrong there would be a red icon here that tells you that there are some issues going on here you can also go to a reliability monitor i talked about that in my previous video see here are some warnings here something like this but it will be red there it is errors here we go there are always errors guys See, these are all talking about different things. Uh, some, most of these are actually a normal, but what you're looking for is a source, as in, and then look at the source here, and then look at the file system. Anyways, this is stuff you would be looking for specifically when it comes to file issues. See, this one doesn't have that. Um, obviously, there's nothing wrong with this PC when it comes to NTFS file system, but when it comes to source, this is what you would kind of look for and see if there are any errors coming up like that and they'll be very descriptive just like the, the one i showed you earlier here where it talks about ntfs file system it would say there is an issue with you know some kind of ntfs uh file system issue so it's very it's going to be very apparent and then in the description you can see just like every time you click on something here you can see the description of what's going on here so this is what you're going to have to look for and there'll be a lot of them if trust me if there are if there's an issue with hard drive, there's going to be a lot of them here. And then you can just go to a reliability monitor. Reliability monitor. Ah, it's being stupid. Control panel. Reliability monitor is inside of, where is our, I think it's security maintenance. And... Where is it? Security network. Man, I recently did. I'm getting tired, guys. This video is getting long. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I think it's probably been an hour. Maintenance. It's here somewhere. Reliability monitor. Here we go. Security and maintenance. View of reliability history. There it is. Reliability monitor. So I was in the right place. I just didn't see this reliability mon uh, button. And you may have seen like stuff like this. You see this hardware error right here, actually. You see that? There's a red X. And that's how it's going to look in the uh, event viewer as well. Hardware error. Let's see what this one talks about. See? There's an error and it's going to be something similar to this. Anyways, guys, I don't want to beat the dead horse, as they say, on this, on this issue. So... What we're going to do is simply um, run the diagnostic or have somebody else at local level to actually do the hardware 
the agnostic. So I'm going to add internal note here and I'm going to say a routed issue to local PC support to trouble shoot hardware issues. <clears throat> Save and I would route it from here but I don't see that option in this system unfortunately. Anyways, I would route the ticket to, to the other uh, support people to troubleshoot it. So in this case I'm just going to close it as completed so it so it leaves the system but yeah make sure you route it to the proper people all right so what's next isd 22 i believe is the next one and it says usb drive not working let's have a look <clears throat> okay i'm going to assign it to ourselves of course it says usb drive not working and it says nothing happens with the usb stick inserted and um the way we're going to handle this is going to be based off whether uh, the business that uh customers is working for allows for external media to be plugged in uh, whether it's headsets or USB drives or any type of external storage. So that's going to be a factor here, um, most likely. So what do you guys think the issue is here? It says nothing happens when USB stick is when USB stick is inserted. So what do you think might be the case? I mean, maybe the USB drive is not working, but there might be something else. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's another one that we may have to handle in a particular way, uh, depending on the situation that we're actually dealing with. We know that it's a USB drive, and that they're trying to insert it into the computer, and nothing happens. So here is what's going on. Either the USB drive is not working simply it's broken or USB drive needs a driver which is kind of unlikely because most of the USB drives uh, that I've encountered it's simple plug-and-play you guys seen this you plug it in computer says wait while we configure your drive and then it configures it and then it asks you what do you want to do now with this drive how do you want it to open and then you can tell it, okay, just open it up as a folder or something like that. Or a third thing where the company uh, or a company that this user works for simply does not allow any external media to be plugged into USBs, meaning that the USB port is disabled. So it could be one of those things. And uh, if that's the case, there is nothing we can do about it. We can inform the customer that their company doesn't allow for USB sticks to be used but the way I would say it first I would uh, if if it's a case this is this is assuming that this is the case that it's not allowed for this company uh, for for company um, or if it's not allowed by the company to use USB uh, ports this is what I would say hello My name is Irvin with tech support. Unfortunately, our company has USB ports disabled as part of company company security policy which is perfectly fine we can say that uh, but you know I have to assume that there are situations in which it is allowed let's say this is somebody high somebody high up for example this is some kind of manager or director level 
and for some reason it's okay for them to uh, have or to have access to USB ports and use anything that they want then that will be different you know but in most large companies it's set up to detect whether it's a USB port or uh, I should say whether it's not USB port but whether it's a USB drive versus a USB headset or something like that and in, in which case it would know you plug in a headset and it would just work but still once you plug in a USB drive it would not work so that's certainly possible but sometimes you would also get a warning once you plug in a USB drive it says hey just so you know we you can use a USB drive but we're going to scan everything that's on it and once you plug it in it starts to scan that's everything that's on it which is which is fair you know you're using a company's computer and then you plug it in a USB drive so that's simply that's what's going to happen but in this case we're going to say this to um, our user and we're going to say if you need further assistance please let me know which I don't necessarily like to leave it open-ended like this because I'm going to close the ticket but if we're trying to be nice about it and kind of trying to let it let them down easy because it's not our fault we already told them we you know port is disabled as part of security policy I wouldn't necessarily leave this open-ended like this because that implies that you possibly could help them if they say well can you enable it for me uh, but we're going to say this but when it comes to USB ports this is something controlled by security team we want to put it on them because they're, they're the ones um, that, that are uh, placing these restrictions on the USB ports we can assume again that they're okay and then we can go inside of their computer you know the typical thing we've been doing so far you know ask them what their computer name is and then we go inside of their computer like so you can go to this PC and see what's what's inside of it what's plugged in and what's not so and then if if there is no USB drive visually that comes up we can go to our device manager let's see right click the desktop uh, the uh, Windows icon go to device manager then we're gonna we can check for USB storage we can see there is a unknown USB device there so and this could be what you know customer is talking about this is could this could be what user is talking about nothing happens when they plug it in and we can see that when it comes to visually seeing uh, what's going on we can see that there is indeed nothing happens but inside of the system inside of the system we can see that there is an issue Windows has stopped this device because it has reported uh, a problem and it's a code 43 now I know exactly what the problem is here and we can certainly fix it As a matter of fact I'm going to fix it as I am talking to you right now um, this is actually on my next computer so what I'm going to do is actually a plug in and I want you to pay attention to what happens here I'm going to plug in because the USB thing stick that's actually plugged in over there is one of those that allows you to use different kinds of uh, storage uh, SD cards or s storage devices so you can put in like a SD card of certain size like a micro SD or whatnot so I'm gonna take one of those and plug it in over here as I am talking and I hope you guys can hear me and I'm going to plug it in hopefully and I should something should be happening right now and there it is you see how it switched over I actually plugged in a storage device into this USB stick and um, now it came up as you can see here as a USB drive right there so 
Yeah, I mean, you basically go through the troubleshooting, and if I had to, yeah, I could have just gone in and just like updated this, you know, the uh, whatever needs to be updated, the the uh, device um, uh, driver, if needed be, and you know, just go basic through the basic troubleshooting of fixing the USB. But chances are really high that it's simply disabled by the computer, by the computer's uh, local security policy by the company's policy so keep that in mind all right so as you can see guys i am actually trying my best to uh, recreate the problem as much as i can it's not easy uh, because i have to literally recreate the problem for each thing that we talk about here but it's my pleasure this is i i really want to make sure that you guys can learn as much as possible when it comes to dealing with these actual issues that happen all right so I'm going to add internal note and I'm going to say notified. I'm going to say notified user of company security policy in regards in regards to USB ports. They are disabled by default. We're going to say that. It's not by default on the computer, but by default when it comes to security policy for this company. And I'm going to close it like that. And of course, if you just ended up fixing the USB drive, then that's what you're going to have to do, whether it's fixing it to show up like that or whether you need to go inside of the uh, disk management and create a partition on it format it to fat 32 this and that you guys know how to do this that's one of those things that uh, uh, should be self-explanatory but the biggest issue here is whether it's allowed uh, to use a usb external storage because when you think about it guys imagine if you worked for some company and there's some sensitive data on the computer and you take your own personal usb stick you plug it in and you just copy everything over of course, it's going to be um, a big no-no. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> we got four more to work. Remember, this one in the middle here is something that we're waiting on uh, when it comes to uh, to see what's going on. And the next one is ISD23. I'm going to click on this here. It says, I can't hear people on my headset. And... It says here specifically, people can hear me in meetings, but I can't hear them. So this is issue not with the microphone, but with their speaker on their headset specifically. So again, typical thing that, we're, that we kept doing, that we are doing so far. This is Irvin with help desk. I can help you with headset issue. May I take control of your computer to fix it or to resolve the issue or whatever you want to, um, however you want to say it. If so, please send me your PC name or IP address. Now, something, something that I haven't mentioned before. Customer may need help with finding what their PC name is or IP address. Uh, I'm going to mention that real quickly here as I go and... Uh, as we go into the computer, into user's computer and check the settings for their headset. But we're going to do this. User's PC name is Kobuman1. We're going to stick to that. Okay, so here we are inside of the user's computer. We know that he can't hear them. They can hear him. So it's not a mic issue, it's just a speaker issue. So it's very simple. You go in here and 
if you click on the icon here of the audio icon next to the clock you can simply make sure that it, that it is selected in this case we can see that speakers is selected plantronics 610 which is good if we right click it we can go to sound settings inside of sound settings we have to make sure that the output is selected as speakers plantronics 610 uh, six, in this case, six, uh, C610, I'm sorry, and then that the input is indeed selected for the same headset. We can definitely double check that with the user to see if that's the correct one because they may have multiple things. What I like to do is go to actual sound control panel, which is right here, open it here, make sure there's nothing else installed. The way I check that is by right clicking in the blank space and click show disabled devices. There are no other devices on this computer enabled so that's good if there are uh, consider right clicking and disabling it like this so that way it doesn't conflict with the other one but of course make sure that the headset is enabled like this make sure that the microphone is enabled you see how there is another thing here we can ignore that because it's disabled check the microphone levels just to be sure if that's if everything else checks out here and you obviously saw that something else was selected as the output which is the speakers then you switch it to the headset and then it should work fine if still not working you may have to go inside of the app that they're using for uh, for their uh, for uh, for their meetings so whether it's zoom meeting webex meeting google meeting or skype or whatever it is go inside of that and check to make sure that the proper audio equipment is selected in this case plantronic c160 so whatever their headset is we're going to make sure that that's selected for input and output microphone and speakers very very self-explanatory if you want to see a more detailed with an example with a different example of actual software going inside a software and changing it recently i made one about zoom and I have one about WebEx as well. If you want to check that out, I do have that on my channel. But I don't want to go into that too much in this part of it because we are just working on the ticketing systems. So what we're going to do here, we're going to add internal note and say, I have configured the headset and tested. Make sure it's tested before you let the customer go. That's it. This is a very simple one, but very common one. We're going to close the ticket. Okay. Very simple one. Oldie but goodie. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't know why I said that. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, ISD 24. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Uh oh. We all know what that means. We all know what that means. Let me know if you know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> so, here we go. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Computer stops working randomly and shows me a blue screen with a smiley face. Blue screen with a smiley face. Let's see what that is, guys. Blue screen with smiley face. I'm just stalling here to give you guys uh, with with sad, smiley face, sad face, I guess. I'm stalling to give you guys a chance to tell me in the comments if you're watching this as a premiere of the, what the issue is. So, all right, I'm just going to put This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. This is a blue screen of death blue screen of death so we're going to go back and we're just going to make sure uh, we're going to talk to the customer what i would do is actually try to reach out to them um, kind of more uh, more personally in the sense that i would what well, would either probably call them and and uh, talk to them and to make sure that it is indeed a blue screen of death and i'm going to add internal note i'm going to say talked to user and to confirm 
that the issue is blue screen of death. And then I'm going to recommend to user to recommend it to user. Sorry, guys, I'm getting tired. <laughs> so I'm misspelling quite a bit to user to take computer for hardware diagnostic um, to her local PC support. So, again, similar to what we had earlier, where computer just shuts down randomly, nothing happens, and where we talked about sending user to local PC support that will check on their, on their hardware. They're going to do hardware diagnostic because that's what it is. A blue screen of death, I found that 90% of the time is hardware related. And a lot of times it's RAM or hard drive. It, it can be other things as well, but it, nonetheless, it's hardware. We're going to want to test the hardware. As help desk, we really can't do a really good job when it comes to you know handling this type of stuff because help desk is just like go 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 let's resolve these issues you know as quickly as possible if we can't resolve it um, quickly and in this case we don't we can't necessarily test your hardware properly unless we have specific tools given to us uh, there's nothing else we can do but to tell them that uh, somebody at their local office will have to take it their her local pc support is going to have to handle it or if the computer is under warranty uh, their technician hp technician dell technician lenovo technician will have to test it she may have to take it to their store or whatever it is it depends on how it is set up for the business that you're working for it's 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 as simple as that and then i'm going to say routed ticket to local PC support may not be the case maybe it you know if, if, if we referred her to the vendor then we we want to specify that whatever the case might whatever the case might be it's definitely um, hardware issue and we need to do a hardware diagnostic on it okay moving on I'm going to close this ticket <clears throat> and go back we got a couple of more to do next one is my email is not working by mr mike moser again oh okay this is an interesting one you will get this quite a bit and um if you guys want to guess i'll pause briefly by talking about it and you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets. But but first, uh, email's not working. I gotta assign it, assign it to myself, so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid when my boss looks at looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is my email is not working, and then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in my premiere video, why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PCA Support. And by, you know, chances are uh, the Mike, Mike Moser here uh, already knows us, knows who we are, so maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case but you know if you don't know them keep doing it it's part of the job 
I have your sorry guys ticket about email not working did you by chance change your password recently so guys this is exactly what I'm suspecting here is that either his his password Mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the Windows some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can for which you can change the password on just a website like one of the websites will use that single sign-on that single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login so when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on also known as SSO it's going to ask for your domain login if your domain login's password expired that day it's going to ask you to change that password when you change your password on the website your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away what do I mean by that your computer that you're logged in you're still logged in with your old password so what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs if you don't you get this pop-up this is what happens and maybe also maybe he locked himself out out of the computer so we're going to concentrate on that and with the reply I suspect it's going to be 99 percent chance that this is the issue what we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password because maybe they forgot the password typed it in 10 times and then now they're locked out and their outlook doesn't have their current password you know but this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't again replicated on their local computer the websites that use the password are fine but the system itself hasn't received the new password and that's the issue here most likely so we're going to go inside of Active Directory and this is my virtual server here and I'm just gonna log in real quick here I'm going to open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing Help Desk may have a web, just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as I'm doing right now. It may not give you direct access to Active Directory at all, which is normal, which is unfortunate, but it's normal. So you may have different means, but you are basically doing exactly what I'm doing, and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case. So what I like to do is, you see the uh, users folder on the right hand. So instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users. We don't know. So what I'm going to do is right-click the folder. I'm going to click Find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right-click him, right-click him, and then we're going to click Reset Password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like, what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away. 
and hopefully to something way more secure. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you. Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he is locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your computer like this. Lock your computer, Mike, and then do control alt delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system. It will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. What I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way, it's going to ensure that everything in the background running whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office. If you may keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell him, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add an external node here and say, resolve issue by password reset I'm going to keep it simple like this and this will resolve this issue I guarantee it I'm going to close the ticket as completed all right excellent <clears throat> by the way if you're still with me thank you so much I appreciate you guys so much one more ticket guys it's this one here it says I need help installing a printer very common one very good one we're going to work on this one I need help installing printer <laughs> sorry guys I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired uh, but we're gonna you know I'm, I'm gonna fight through we're almost almost done here I'm trying to install a printer but it's not working we're going to reply to the customer say hello my name is Irvin with help desk what kind of printer are you trying to add local printer or network printer Now, this can be confusing to, to the user, to the customer. Because what I'm actually trying to figure out, it's actually, are they at home? Are they working from home? Are they trying to add, add a local printer? Or are they trying to add a network printer, which is actually in an, in an office? But to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know. You know but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say, also, can you please send me your PC name with, and you know what, let's, let's, let's hold off on this part of it. Because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial. So if they first reply and say, and usually I, I like to be more proactive, but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't 
and this is not their fault necessarily. This is just how human mind works. They can't multitask. If I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they, some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are. But chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a, a, there, there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins. Chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff. Companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues. So we got to be careful about this. We got to find this out. Um, if possible, I would call them and talk to them. Uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? Let's do this. I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're going to do this so let's kind of go over it again okay i can add the printer for you however i need your pc name to take control or control remotely and can you please send me the ip address of the printer you're trying to add so of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name and I didn't want to say can you send me your PC name or IP address because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer and I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part. I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer. IP address of the printer trying to add. You see what I'm saying? Keep it as simple as possible, but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner. Once we get this information, we're going to go to their computer. And here we are at their computer again. Uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson. And the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed, we're going to go to the search bar. And you, you can get to this through the control panel as well. But I'm going to say devices and printers. Here we go. Printers and scanners, devices and printers. We want to get to here, guys. This is, this is where you can see device number and i'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what i call mickey mouse version of windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer, uh, here I'm looking for 
the pl the printer that I want isn't listed. Other way of going to this here is control panel, devices and printers here, and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before. This is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here. It's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers. So every device, you know, whether it's a USB or, or whatnot, or monitor or, you know, the headset that we talked about earlier. And of course, if there are any printers, they will be listed here. But of course, there is a button. Guess where we need to go? We're going to click on the add printer. And this is the same thing we looked at earlier, but this is just how it looks like. That's how it used to look like before, before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing, which doesn't make sense to me. Why not just keep it the way it is, where it's just one place for one thing, you know. Anyways, that's a different video. Okay, so it's not going to find anything. What I'm going to do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed. So same thing we did earlier. And then here you can add the printer multiple ways. Where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer, blah, blah, blah. Select anything that you want. But in this case, we're going to select a network printer, which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer. And here we're just going to type it in, for example, 168. Dot two dot one whatever it's whatever the static IP address is for that printer it's gonna have to be a static IP address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we gotta have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're gonna leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use what that does it pings the printer and says hey I'm trying to add you but do you have a driver and then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer, it's going to have that driver. It's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it. You know, same thing when you're adding a local printer, you may have to download the driver, install the driver. But then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer. You know, once you click next, it may, if it doesn't find, if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to, uh, nothing's going to happen here, so I can't really show you this at this time. But what happens, it's it's going to say, okay, I found this IP address. I know it's a printer there, but which one is it? And then you go through a list that's available there, and you select which model, like, for example, Xerox, blah, 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is, that, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect. So if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically, you're going to have to ask the user, can you tell me the name and model of that printer? So that way you can get those drivers and install them properly. Once you do that, it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default, kind of like this. So if you see one like that, just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants, he or she wants, and then make sure it's set as default. See if you have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle. Okay, and now we're going to add an external or internal note, I should say, added printer as requested. Urban. And I'm going to close the ticket. And the last one we have there, remember, is the one that we're waiting to see if anything else is going on with that. So remember, this is the one we worked on earlier about, and there were there are no issues at the moment. And I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours um, in case it goes down again. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm suspecting about two hours. I appreciate you stopping by, watching, and I appreciate your nice comments. I appreciate your uh, support, clicking the like button, sharing the video, telling your friends about me and all that. I, I, I can't express how much I appreciate that and how much I enjoy making these videos. 
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, it's all about help desk. We're going to learn how to use an example ticketing system. And I'm going to also show you four different examples of a phone call that you might get as a help desk employee. These phone calls will show you how to handle the calls and also how to troubleshoot the call. It's a very good video for those trying to get into help desk as a starting point in their IT career. Guys, Please take a one second to click the like button. This way I'm not going to play ad at this point at all, but you clicking the like button really makes a difference for my video. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. All right, let's get into it. This video is designed for new people to help desk tier one or tier two. What we will learn in this video is how to create a ticket and how to work a ticket in a ticketing system. Keep in mind there are many, many different ticketing systems out there available and a lot of them are proprietary, meaning the company that you work for will have their own ticketing system, but lately or most recently they've all been web-based, just like this third-party ticketing system that I'm about to show you. And when it comes to navigation, working the tickets and this and that, it should be very uh, very much the same as you would do when you work for somebody else. So this is going to be very educational for people who are about to start working on a help desk or just tech support where they use a ticketing system. So let's get back to the first thing we need to do. We're going to create a ticket in this ticketing system, but we have to familiarize ourselves. Keep in mind, you are new at the company and you've never experienced this before, chances are. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to uh, look for. Well, this is typically what it looks like. You have a system that's open like this, uh, typically web-based, and then on the left-hand side, you got a few different tabs that you can select. First one is the main queue. What you're looking at here, and when I click on all open, and what shows in the middle is all tickets that are open currently. These are tickets that come through. And then next one is assigned to me. And if we click on, you can see that you haven't been assigned any tickets whatsoever. And then if we click on unassigned issues, you can also see there. However, if you keep if you go back to the all open that means that are all there that means that there haven't been worked yet even if it's been assigned so and then of course we have incidents down here and this is going to be based off a of topic ticket and then we got service requests changes and problems so these are all different categories for these tickets that are there now not to confuse you or to lose you, let's go ahead and create a ticket because this will show you what the ticketing system is about. So let's say uh, this reporter here, which is Kobuman1, he is the user that reported all three of these issues. These are all issues that he has. So let's see how he did that. So he went to a system and he's got a probably similar system uh, that, he, that we see here. And then he clicked on create a ticket or submit a new ticket. And the first thing that they're going to do is select an issue type, which is right here. Don't ignore this part where it says project. This is just because I'm an admin to this, so ignore this. What they're going to look at first is issue type. This is what's going to ask you. And they're going to either have a drop down here or they're going to be able to type in the type of issue that they have. So they can just type in report an incident. And if they select that, for example, that's what was going to be selected. So whatever it is that they have, chances are there's either a an article on how to fix it themselves if it's like some kind of a minor software issue. But they, in general, they will have a way to search for their problem. And once they do, they will come across that problem. They would select it. So, for example, if they would just type in get see help it's going to show up and then they can select that at the same time if they type in like for example name of the website or a program it's going to find that as well and then they can select that and that way it's going to be routed to the support team for that specific application website system or software see that it's very self-explanatory so and the next thing once they figure out what the problem is i select the correct issue type here they can type in the title of it. And it's kind of confusing here that where it says summary, but it's actually just uh, a title. So let's go ahead and pretend that this is a test ticket and we're just gonna type in test so that way we have 
uh, a good so we can track it so we can see how it shows up in the system and then we're going to type in test again because we're just learning how to create a ticket right here and it's going to be very simple if we scroll down there will be other uh, things you can put in there for example a user can attach a screenshot and if they click here they can just add it you know browse it this and that typical they would upload a screenshot of the error if they have and then they can select the component and then if they're savvy enough they'll be able to figure out okay well what is the issue about and they would select that so let's say they you know some kind of actor director issue they can just select that and then assignment here you can see that it's automatic we can leave that this is some of those one of those admin uh, issues and this is not uh, what uh, a user would see and then you can also uh, create a ticket on behalf of somebody else so I'm going to create a ticket on behalf of Kobuman1 which is the same person that reported the previous issues that way um, if uh, if a user is not able to create a ticket for themselves you can do it on their behalf as well another reason to create a ticket is to also keep track of internal things that you do and you need a record of it so you know, doing tickets just as an internal part of uh, what you do is a good way to uh, uh, just have a record of uh, some kind of change that you've done on a computer or PC or whatever. And then next thing we have is priority. Um, uh, well, actually, we do have approvers, but this is related to whether somebody needs to be approved, for example, to have an access to a specific server, uh, whether they're approved to have email or instant messenger, or even if they're approved to uh, get new software or if they're approved to get new hardware right so and then we have priority here and priority is kind of self-explanatory if a big website is down chances are they're going to select the highest priority or you know it's if it's affecting a lot of people they can just select highest priority but if it's nothing big they can just select lowest priority or whatever you know and then of course urgency is uh, also kind of similar to that which would I don't know why they have it twice but you know if it's a website down it's going to be of course critical and then it's going to impact a lot of people impact very uh, important if it's a lot of uh, people it's critical and it's the highest priority it's going to be expensive widespread if it's just one user requesting something it's going to be minor so and then pending reason this is um, if you're working on a ticket and then you need a pending reason why it needs to be approved this and that like for example somebody's requesting something um, uh, that they would deal with that product cat categorization and this and that this is usually automatically populated by uh, the system itself users wouldn't typically deal with any of this they would just put in a basics you know ticket and then you would have to figure this out if it needs to be uh, you know if it needs to be um, uh, dealt with or categorized uh, there is a category here optional categorization we can just select connectivity in case we are working with you know a big system downage and then of course there are labels and you can create your own labels you know okay and then we're going to click create ticket now we can see on the right side that there's a notification that came up that's typical in a ticketing system. If you're working the system, if you have it open, you would get a notification that the ticket came through. So if we refresh this, if I click on all open, it's going to refresh it. It may take a second here, but it's going to populate with the new ticket we just uh, submitted. It depends on how fast the cloud is or the storage. Uh, where the uh, the ticketing system is at it may take a moment to come up uh, let me let me hit the refresh button here and uh, there it is there's our test email and at the same time you and your group including the user as well will get an email notification that a ticket came through and uh, and that would look some that would look something uh, like this here's our three other tickets that are already in the system the other one just came through as you saw so you can see that there is a new ticket that came so you get a, a desktop notification and then you get email notification all right now we learn how to create a ticket that's very simple now let's go ahead and uh, work a ticket here's a really good one we can uh, pick so once you're in the main uh, queue is what they call here uh, you can just pick any of the tickets and assign it to yourself if you're allowed to do so typically that's what happens you can pick up tickets work them or sometimes a manager assigns a ticket to you but this time we have the permission to assign tickets to ourselves so we're going ahead and do that
we're going to select this middle one and then we're going to assign it to ourselves this is going to be slightly different uh, you know depending on the type of software you use but typically what you want to look for is something like this where it says assignee I want to click on that and then I'm going to assign it to me I'm going to click on that and sometimes there's a save button or this and that this particular system doesn't and it's just going to assign it automatically so let's go ahead and go back to our queue which is click on all open here and we can see now that it's assigned to me and uh, I'm going to go back to it and then we're going to now work it so how would you do this there are a few ways of, of working a ticket uh, this is going to depend on uh, preferred contact method that the user has if we look at this ticket uh, it's not very detailed, right? And if we click on here, view request in portal, uh, you know, a lot of times it would open it up and there will be more information here, but it kind of looks the same as the other one. So we're just going to go back here. The thing is, though, a lot of systems would specify what type of preferred contact method they would have. For example, I prefer to be contacted with email or uh, there would be their email address there or something like that. I prefer to be contacted with IM or, or do I prefer to be contacted via the phone. So user would typically specify that and you know there would be more stuff, uh, detailed information about them. This system unfortunately doesn't have that information. The only thing we have is ability to reply to customer directly here. So this is what we're going to do. It says here the issue is I have two monitors both have the same picture so that means that it's a configuration issue and we can help them deal with that uh, if if they are outside of your company let's say you're doing tech support you know for somebody else in a different state you're not on site you're not there to help them you can simply say if you've never worked with this uh, person before you can say hello my name is Irvin with tech support tech support at STL Missouri so you know you want to tell them hey my name is Irvin uh, I'm with tech support or whatever your name may be and I am at this location so that way they know that you are uh, you know that person it's an introduction it's a sample introduction and then you can say I have your ticket about a monitor right? and it's simple you tell them who you are where you at and that you have their ticket about a monitor this is what you typically do if you're contacting them first time through email or through like for example instant messenger or even if you call them this is something you, you have to let them know who you are and why you're calling them or why you're contacting them since this is a message through the system through the ticketing system you don't necessarily have to introduce yourself because they know that the system that they submitted a ticket through uh, somebody's reaching out to them because of that right and then you know if you can help them, i mean this is a remote type of thing if you can take control of their uh, PC and resolve this issue for them that would be ideal but if you don't well, I mean what can you do um, well you can just at least suggest uh, have you tried you know what is it expanding your desktop onto second monitor that's usually the problem when it comes to this right and this is one of those things that you can ask the customer if you can take control of their computer that would be ideal however if you happen to be on site if you happen to be on site that would be even better so um, you can say may I stop by to take take a look when would be good for you so that way you can go there directly and just resolve the issue and then now we're going to just click save this should send an email to the customer and uh, you know that should reach out to the customer in some way whether it's they having to have the system up and they get a notification or they would get an email uh, from the system saying hey uh, this tech guy Kobo man is trying to reach out to you this guy named Irvin actually is trying to reach out to you or both usually it would be both so they would get a communication from you so the next thing you would do is add an internal note means uh, that's a, a note for you and the people that work for you 
or not the work for you or with you if they want to know what's going on with that ticket they can look up your ticket and see that you have reached out to user and awaiting feedback right so you can be more detailed about this this is just the basic navigation and notage of a ticket so what we have done here is reached out to the customer we have created an internal note so that everybody can see that what you've worked on and what kind of work you've done when it comes to this ticket so let's say your manager is like hey uh, what's going on with this ticket they can look it up and see what you've done you know and um, if it's if it's uh, something you can resolve on site you can say uh, configured dual monitor and then click save and now since you've resolved the issue we have configured the dual monitor at this point it's resolved now we can close the ticket right we can go ahead and close it and in this case we have to go over here on the right hand side where it says waiting for support if we click on that it gives you a bunch of different options for the status of the ticket you know you can see that whether you escalated a ticket uh, you know waiting for support canceled or completed we're gonna set it to completed sometimes it would say resolved or this and that and now the ticket is completed and closed and by the way notice this little eyeball here that's a watch option that means how many people are actually viewing and watching this ticket we can see that both of these guys are watching this ticket so that means how many people are viewing it and working on it which is kind of useful actually so that way you can be like hey you know ping them or you know send them a message hey are you working on this too you know this and that and uh, all right let's move on to uh, another ticket that we can look at and then if we click on all open tickets here it's going to bring us back to the the queue and we can see now that the other ticket is gone it's it's simply gone it's closed and you'll no longer see it in the queue uh, but we do have other tickets we can work on so let's do one more which is a bit different and this is a website down uh, ticket so this is kind of important our website is down we can't access our main website and then we can see that the urgency is critical so of course we're going to have to prioritize these critical tickets now let me see does this system actually say in the queue anywhere that it's a critical it doesn't so the only indicator you have here is on the left hand side it's kind of these icons and you know this is kind of unfortunate uh, that I couldn't show you that that you know um, there there might be some other indicator that it's a critical issue all you got to do is all the only thing you can do is go by whatever the summary is or whatever the title of the ticket is so you kind of have to use your own judgment in our case I wouldn't have worked the first ticket first at all I would have worked this one first so you got to prioritize that it's very important but once we click on it now we can see that it's critical so of course we're going to um, contact them again but before we do that since this is a critical we may want to um, do something else real quick and this is going to depend on, on your business whether you're the only one working there or whether you actually want other people involved so there are options for that as well and if you look on the right hand side here we can add participants if we click here and add participants if your manager for example is Joe uh, Joe Joe Schmo <laughs> Schmo did I spell that Joe Schmo let's do that Joe Schmo we're going to add him and then he can watch or even if we have Bob it's a boy uh, you know as a co-worker and he's working with you as well we can add them as participants so they can follow what's going on right so that's pretty cool here as well and then we can have um, let's go ahead and work this ticket real quick I'm going to reply and again there are no other way to contact them so I have to contact them through the system otherwise I would have called them uh, message them and this and that and then what I would do here in this case and this is just an example so we can work the ticket but there are many things that you might want to ask when it's a big issue like this uh, the first thing usually I would say is uh, how many I would say people are impacted you don't want to say users usually that's something that IT would use within itself you would want to say how many people are 
impacted. And then uh, when was the last time it worked? Are you using the correct link? You know, stuff like that that would help you resolve this a big of an issue, right? And then later on, uh, you know, if you do realize that it really is a big issue like this uh, support team um, for this specific website that they may be uh, talking about uh, may need more information. For example, host names, IP addresses, this and that. So I'm going to start with this. Uh, typically, you would want more, but you would have to know what the website is and this and that. And this is just going to be depending on the work environment that you're at. Here we are learning how to use the system, not necessarily resolve issues uh, because we don't have enough information, right? So we're here learning how to use a ticketing system and that's that. And then of course you add an internal note right away and says contacted user with uh, requesting, I'm sorry, requesting more information. Now this is an internal note and this means that only you and the people that work the system can only see it. So you can say user this time because we are talking to IT people who might read this. This is for your own note, work note, uh, internal note, and for the people that are IT, user cannot see this at all. So it's okay to say user. Okay, now that we're waiting on that, of course, is a priority. This is something you would actively work on, but we're just going to leave it like it is for now. Now, let's see. Uh, the, the, there are different issues. There are different options here for the this ticket right now, and that's because the issue is literally selected as a problem. Now we have different things, and this is going to you know depend on the type of work environment that you're working at, and then uh, you can see that now we have an option just just to close it. But that's only if it's resolved and then there's cancel and then there's under review. I'm not sure why it would be under review. That's kind of a weird option to have in a ticketing system. But I guess it could be related to some kind of an access request uh, for something. But the fact that it's just reported as a problem is kind of confusing. Anyways, now we know how to create tickets, how to work tickets, and how to assign them, which by the way we haven't done here. So we haven't assigned it to ourselves. Maybe that's why the option there was a bit different. Well, maybe not. Anyways, again, there are many, many different uh, ticketing systems, many third-party systems, and you just have to kind of adjust to them accordingly. So let's go back and see what else is open. We can see that this one here is assigned to me, that I'm uh, working on it. Let's see on the next tab. Assigned to me, it says zero now, but now it shows up as one because it took a little bit to refresh and then we got other tabs that you can get into, but these are the basics. These are the basics of working and working a ticketing system that you must know before going to work for a help desk of any sort. And of course, you can look at your own statistics here, and that option is not here. But I think if I click here, uh, let me see if I can find it real quick for you guys. Cues, back to projects. Usually managers can only see a report but then maybe we can view some reports here. Reports, workload, and yeah, so if you're a manager or, or sometimes even as just a TR1 help desk, you may be able to see your own uh, progress. And here it is. You can see that I have one issue uh, that I've resolved. Any more detailed? So yeah, that, that just allows you to you know look up other people's tickets. Uh, satisfactions. These are all statistics that managers only look at. Of course, you want to SLA is also, you know, those metrics of how fast you resolve issues, this and that. But what I taught you so far are the basics you need to work the system as an IT help desk tier one. So let's go ahead and look at what happened during this phone call and then we're going to stop it in real time and then I'm going to show you what happens on the back end so meaning that what is going on with the person working help desk while they're talking to the user thank you for calling tech support my name is Irvin uh, what can I assist you with today hi I, uh, I, I for some reason I can't log in 
to Outlook. Outlook keeps asking me for a password. I don't know why. I uh, I'm not sure what's going on here. Sure. Does it um, does it uh, give you an issue whenever you try to log in anything else, or is this just this specific system? Uh, let me let me try. I I think it's just Outlook, but I'm not sure. I don't even know why Outlook keeps asking me for the password, but I think it's just Outlook. Let me try something else. Oh yeah, yeah. This um. Oh uh, yeah, this other system is also giving me problems. It keeps asking for the password. I don't know why. I did have a little trouble. Uh, like I may have like mistyped the password this morning. Okay. Well, no problem. Let times. me uh, let me look up your account. Uh, what is your login ID for this? My login ID is Irvin underscore uh, C A N. Okay. All right. I got it pulled up here. All right, let's pause that for a minute. Now we know the name of this user. So let's go ahead and look it up in Active Directory to see what's going on with his account. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. I really appreciate that. That way I don't have to play any ads for you here. And that way you are supporting my channel. It only takes one second. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user. And he said, Irvin underscore c a n so let's go ahead and click find now and here it is we found the user we can simply select it double click it and it should pull up user's account so let's see what's going on with that he said he can't log in so the next thing we're going to look up is the password so we're going to click on the account if we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account select apply or okay and this will unlock the user's account now we can get back to them and let them know to try again it wouldn't take my password I, I, I recently changed it I think I changed it like a couple of days ago so I may have mistyped it a couple of times. Is that why? Oh, yeah, the, that makes sense. So uh, if, if you mistype password once, you don't want to keep trying it. Usually it locks out after you try more than three times. Uh, but it's not a problem. I can unlock you. Uh, would you like me to reset the password as well? Or do you just uh, want to give it a shot without me resetting if you it? Can, uh, if you can unlock me, that would be great. I'd like to see if I can. Because uh, I don't feel like changing the password again. You know how it is. It's like you, you try to like come up with a new password and then it, it's like you're just sitting there trying to figure out well which one do i want to use this time like you know so uh, yeah if you can just unlock me that would be great okay no problem i uh i have it unlocked right now i want to want to give it a shot and see if it works all right hold on let me uh let me try this here okay I I think I'm good now. Outlook came up now, and it's uh, okay. It looks yeah, okay. My new <laughs> emails are coming through. So okay, great. Uh, that's good. I I thank you so much. I appreciate. That. All right, no problem, no problem. I'm I'm glad to help. I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No, that is all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, it is something what I would... Um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to 
what I said earlier that, you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user. Here, since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the Active Directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then, again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. Today's video, we take a look at a call handling for Help Desk Tier 1, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it this way. I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the backhand in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video, guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling Help Desk Tier 1 Support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something you can help me with this? For some reason, it's just so slow today that I can't do anything. No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday. And then today, for some reason, it's just very very sluggish i can't do anything i really need this uh, to be fixed so i can do my job all right no problem i can have a look uh, to see what's going on can you give me your pc name my pc name uh yeah it should be if it should be under your pc information or even there might be a, a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that that it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters if you can give me that please i'd appreciate it Sure, I think I see it here. Um, it says TMC3565830. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, sir, do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment? I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you. Sure, go ahead. All right, let's pause the phone call just for a second here. So the user is talking about a slow computer. So it's a slow computer situation. So what is the major reason for a slow computer? In a business environment, most of the time when a computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update, or the computer itself tries to update overnight, but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used, meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used. But chances are, if the computer was turned off, shut down, asleep, or any of those reasons, it probably couldn't install these updates. So now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue. Of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company specific, so you would have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that. That that's not usually what happens in a business. That's something that home computers may have issues with. For a business type of computer, they're going to be up to spec, and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates. Of course, there is another reason, you know, being a virus, but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely, it's unbelievable. So, updates, main thing 
let's get back to the customer and tell them about that. All right, sir. So what I found is that uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates.